Hey guys welcome back to the channel this is a story about what if Deku was the ultimate villain part 1. If you guys enjoy this what if and want to see part 2 comment down below and let me know before I start please do support for more awesome content. And leave a like and don't forget to subscribe to my channel and also share this video with your friends and check out the description in my playlist. The author of the story The Mysterious Banana from Fanfiction.net. So let's start the video. When you are destined to make it big. There are often signs along the way, hinting to your eventual rise to whatever top you strive for. Whether that be an abnormally huge ick, a unique personality, or a special ability no one else possesses. I'm sorry ma'am, but according to our diagnostics, it would appear as though your child is. Well how do I sugarcoat this? Power deficient, non-special, press skip in the character creation screen. Quirkless, your son and quirkless, or in this case, a lack thereof. And mom, I can still be a hero, right? Asked a young, teary-eyed Izuku. Oh of course Izuku, I'm sure you can. You'll be a great hero, just like your dad. His mother replied. Izuku never met his father, but his mother always brings the hero subject back to him. Apparently, he was one of the world's first quirkless heroes. Sure, he was just a late bloomer and developed fire breath later on, but she still emphasizes on how much of a great man he is. Will I ever G get to meet him one day? Asked Izuku, wiping off his tears, is he still working overseas? Of course Izuku, you'll get to meet him soon enough. And Ko replied, smiling through her own tears. Yet despite all her words of reassurement, Izuku always felt as though she was hiding something. Still, it gave him hope, and that's all he needed. Years later, Boy Deku, whatcha doing? A grown-up Bakugu stared down at him. Oh, uh, Kakin, hi, I was just, uh. Izuku mumbled, clutching his notebook. It was her mother's birthday gift to him. It even came with two built-in bookmarks that were shaped like All Might's signature hair. Gimme that. Bakugu snatched his notebook right out of his palm. Hey, give that back. Izuku cried. Why? Bakugu said in a sadistic fashion. Aren't we friends? I know what you're gonna do. Give that back before I before you what? Bakugu cut him off. Two other guys showed up. His friends probably. Well look at that. This kid wants to be a hero. Bakugu yelled out loud as everyone in the classroom laughed in unison. Isn't he that quirkless pipsqueak? Someone in the crowd laughed. And won't you look at that? He actually sketched a hero costume in here. Laughed another. Does his lack of quirk also explain his lack of originality? Mighty, what kind of stupid hero name is that? Laughed another. I mean, my mouth's a literal megaphone and I can come up with a more original hero name for myself. This is normally where Izuku would fight back, thrashing. But he has been laughed at and beat up so many times that he was used to it at this point. Instead, he just raised his arms helplessly as the crowd pelted him with erasers and crumbled up candy bar wrappers. Listen Deku, Katsuki called out, grabbing Izuku by shoulder, his fists sizzling with fire and Izuku's uniform started to emit black smoke. Don't bother with this hero business and just go find a hole to die in, okay, he said, with a menacing smile and in an eerily calm tone. And Izuku nearly pissed himself at Katsuki's aggressiveness. The blonde student took his notebook, blasting it to smithereens in front of him and tossing the remains out the window. Izuku, letting out an exasperated gasp, ran out to the window in hopes that the notebook was still intact. While this happened, the rest of the classroom left, as class was soon dismissed to the sound of the bell. Boy, don't you think you're being a little hard on him Katsuki? Asked one of the students, like anyone would care what happens to that insignificant piece of crap. Katsuki laughed back, besides, if we're actually smart. Izuku turned around, overhearing Katsuki. Then he could just take a dive off the building and be born with a quirk in his next life. Katsuki laughed. Izuku, angered, lunged at him, only to freeze in fear as Katsuki ignited sparks in his hands. Yeah, were you gonna do something? Katsuki asked sadistically. My, my dad made it as a pro hero while he was still quirkless. So you're wrong, Izuku yelled out, despite his mom telling him to keep that a secret for reasons beyond him. Oh, your old man, a quirkless hero, don't make me laugh, Katsuki replied, where is he anyways? You always use him as an excuse yet we never hear about him. T that's because he works overseas. I may not met him before but he is a miserable failure that your old hag refused to admit. Katsuki cut off, grabbing him by the neck and picking him up. Listen here Deku. The only two reasons why a man stays away from his own family for so long is either because he's actually having an affair behind your mom's back or that he's dead. Let me G go Kakan. Izuku uttered, as Katsuki dragged him towards the open window. Hey, Bakugo, what are you doing? Asked some of his classmates. Katsuki ignored said classmates, instead slamming Izuku against the wall, knocking the wind of him. And honestly, I wouldn't be surprised if it were the latter, because nowadays, someone quirkless. Said Katsuki, opening the window. Somebody help me. Izuku cried, looking at the teacher, who was on his phone, not even acknowledging what was going on. Is better off dead. Katsuki yelled out, throwing Izuku out the window. Back you go. What have you done? 
You could have killed him. The other classmates yelled out. So, Katsuki retorted. Nonchalantly, one less worthless piece of shit in the world, big deal. This is too messed up, even for you. They added. Well then, what are you gonna do about it? Katsuki asked, giving them a killer glare, as shivers ran down their spines. Huh, something happened? Asked the teacher. The other students looked at the teacher, then back at Katsuki, who was giving them the dead stare. And nothing sir. They muttered, too scared to tell him what happened as Katsuki passed them. That's what I thought. Izuku struggled to get back up. Miraculously, he landed in the dumpster, the trash breaking his fall, but also soaking him in a cold, dark green sludge whose mere smell made him wish the fall had dealt some kind of damage his olfactory cortex. Trying to get up, he found his notebook, or what's left of it, in his right hand. Charred and burned up, he clenched onto it, trying not to cry. He failed. On his way back, the words of Katsuki resonated within him, as he felt his insecurities swelling and weighing him down like a ball and chain. However, his period of moping was interrupted, as a greenish sludge attacked him out of the blue, encasing him in its goopy body and attempting to enter every orifice of his body. Oi kid, you wouldn't have seen my wallet by any chance, have you? You tiny burglar. The sludge man yelled out in rage. Can't a homeless sewer waste guy enjoy his dumpster nap without kids landing on them and snatching their wallets? Looking to what he initially thought were the charred remains of his notebook, Izuku quickly realized that what he was holding was in fact, a very old and moldy wallet. My eyes saw Detroit. Suddenly, both parties heard a third voice nearby. Just then, for a brief moment, Izuku saw a glimpse of his very idol before a giant fist covered his field of view. Smash! A massive gust of wind followed suit. When Izuku came back to the realm of conscience, he saw that the sludge man was defeated and trapped in an empty soda bottle and that the one responsible for said feat was none other than the living legend of the hero world, the symbol of peace himself. Uh, all might! Izuku uttered in awe. Ha ha ha! Never fear kid, for I am here. All Might called out in booming laughter, in case you're in need of an autograph. I couldn't seem to find any notebooks on you, but your wallet did just fine. My wallet? Izuku asked, noticing that the sludge man's wallet was still in his hand, and that All Might had signed the front of it. Well, I'd love to stick around, but I've got places to be. You're quite lucky. Not many kids have the bragging rights of being saved by me. In fact, some rich kids even pay other people to attack them just so I can save them. So cherish this moment said All Might, as he walked off, seemingly in a hurry, goodbye. Little fan, wait, Izuku yelled out, grabbing onto his ankle, blblbl blies wa ha hats he was. Kid, let go, you're gonna make me. All Might called out, before coughing out a handful of blood, damn. While Izuku's encounter with All Might was still underway, Katsuki and a few of his goons left the convenience store below where All Might leaped off from. Katsuki, don't you think you went a little overboard there? Asked one of his classmates, smoking a cigar. Hey, it's his fault for being born quirkless, replied Katsuki, kicking over a can, which flew into a little kid's face, knocking him over. Oh, the little kid cried, as his nose bleed. You're in my way. Fuck off, Katsuki hissed, as he proceeded to kick the kid out of his path. Geez, what's with you today, Katsuki? You're a lot more of an asshole than usual, said his classmate, blowing smoke into the face of said kid. Kid just reminded me of Deku, replied the blonde-haired teen, with his beady eyes. Full of stupid dreams. It pisses me off. He ranted, before turning around, and quit smoking. If we get caught, it's going on my record too. However, his two other classmates froze in fear. Not because of Katsuki, rather, because of something behind him. Wallet. I'm sorry kid, said the shriveled up shell that once was the top hero. I know you mean well, but people like you really aren't cut out for this kind of job. Izuku froze at the revelation. It was shocking enough to find All Might in his true form. But now, it seemed as though his entire world was crumbling down on him. Tear ran down his face, as he tried to find the right words, trying to say anything. Whether it would be in denial, despair, desperation. But all that could come out was soundless gasps. He didn't want to admit it, but it seemed as though Katsuki, whether he liked it or not, was right about him. Hey, if it makes you feel any better, I heard that you accept Quirkless into their general education department. Maybe you could find work as a police officer or something. But please, don't tell anyone about what you saw, okay? said All Might, heading towards the roof exit. Wait, Izuku cried out. I I I have a friend, well, not friend, more like, person I knew since childhood who told me quirkless people are completely worthless at this day and age. Is that true? Am I really that worthless? Asked Izuku, trying his best not to burst into tears for the fifth time today. A shadow loomed over All Might's eyes. I really can't answer that. Please say it ain't so All Might. Izuku begged, even more desperate than before. Please just shut up and leave me be. All Might replied, his fists clenched and shaking. I don't want to be a useless person. I want to change this world for the better. Izuku called out. 
then you shouldn't have been born quirkless. All Might snapped at him, reverting to his muscular form. Only this time, he wasn't smiling. Know your place, kid. Look around you. Do you really think you ever had a chance to make it big in this world? Be a little realistic and give up, will you? Never had Izuku seen All Might in such an imposing form. The aggression emanating off of him, making his legs shake in fear. That sight, it was just like Katsuki's. He's the same. Izuku thought, he's no different from the rest of them. Suddenly, All Might reverted back to his previous form. Only this time, his face seemed a lot more racked with guilt. I am sorry if I'm being harsh, said All Might, in a scornful tone. But if it makes you feel any better, I was never that much of a hero myself to begin with. I hope to never see your face again. Goodbye, kid. As All Might left the stairs, Izuku turned the other way, heading towards the edge of the building. All of the emotions he was suppressing until then swelled up, ripping into the walls of his sanity. As minutes passed, he knew All Might was long gone. Just like that, he snapped. Damn it! <laughs> Izuku yelled for what felt like hours. His fists clenched so hard that blood came out as he collapsed, punching the ground until his fists were bloody. While this happened, All Might walked down the streets of the Yokohama shopping district, feeling guilty for what he did, what pushed him to act that way. I should really apologize to the kid. All Might muttered to himself, it's not his fault yet I snapped at him. Looking at his scar, a sudden flashback came to him. Take a good look, all of you, all for one, Destro, even the Shirogane family, all your years, shaping this world into what it is today shall be all for nothing. Witness this world's rebirth, an injured All Might. On the near verge of death watched the ominous figure looming over him, as a massive beam of light that pierced the clouds formed white cracks in the sky over a rather secluded island near Akinawa. Everything that happened after those events are a blur in All Might's memory, almost like a traumatic moment. All he could remember of that event were two things, that man was not all for one, and he was quirkless. As Izuku walked home over twenty minutes after his mental breakdown, he hoped for nothing more than to leap into the arms of his caring mother and having a lovely home-cooked meal. Then again, Katsuki might be right about what happened to his father, so he needed to ask her about him as well. But honestly, Izuku just wanted for the day to be over with, and for it to be nothing more than a distant nightmare tomorrow. Just then, screams rung out over the street he was passing by. Looking over, he noticed the sludge villain from earlier. A villain attack, yelled some of the civilians, as pro-heroes struggled to subdue the now rampaging villain. Wallet, yelled the sludge villain, neat. Wallet, you're far past the bargaining stage villain. The heroes yelled back. Now surrender quietly and this can all be resolved without violence. I'll snap all of your necks if I don't get my wallet back. I need it. What could be in this wallet that he needs so badly anyways? Thought Izuku. Taking the moldy wallet out of his pocket, all it has are a few bus tickets, expired condoms, 12 yen and this. Ruined business card. He took a good look at the business card. There was something written at the back. Some kind of address. Just then, loud explosions distracted him before he could fully react in time. Wait, explosions. But that would mean... Izuku thought, running to the front, Kaken. He saw him, Katsuki, writhing about in agony, struggling with the sludge villain. He looked so helpless and pathetic, it was almost cathartic to Izuku. In any normal cases, he would have tried something, anything to help him. But now, all he wanted to do, was laugh. He he he. Izuku chuckled. Hey, what's so funny about this? Asked some of the people in the crowd. And no it's just. He ha ha ha. Ha ha ha. It's ha 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 ha. Izuku tried to retort, but he couldn't contain his laughter. Suddenly, he felt a stinging pain, as one of the civilians dragged him far away from the crowd and into an alleyway, beating the crap out of him. You wanna laugh? Do it in a hospital? Yelled the group of men. Izuku laughed hysterically, as the group of men beat him to a pulp. They got tired and left, as the villain was later subdued thanks to the arrival of Endeavor, who was just passing by. Mad. Izuku muttered. What was that? The group of men asked, turning around, still pissed off. This world. So mad. Izuku uttered. Bloody and covered in dirt and bruises. It's hilarious. Ha <laughs> ha. Oh hilarious is it? Asked the man, grabbing a nearby by rusted crowbar. Then I bet your funeral will be a laughing stock. Hey, chill man. Said one of that guy compatriots. Shut it. Crazy kids piss me off. If they don't belong in an asylum, then they are better off dead. Izuku looked at the three of them. Once again, Katsuki and his goons came to mind. Deja vu. Izuku muttered. The man lifted his crowbar, ready to smash Izuku's head in like a watermelon. Suddenly, a shadow loomed in, and for a brief moment, Izuku saw a dash of silky, blonde hair. Just then, the three men were dead. Their throats slit with 28 stab wounds, each. Before Izuku could tell what happened, the figure, which he could deduce was a girl, walked up to him, revealing what seemed like a sailor uniform. You, you're cute, the girl said in a flirtish way. Who, hey, what's going on here? Asked a random cop. Who are you? 
Boo, you cops are no fun. The girl called back before disappearing into the shadows. As more cops arrived, they let out a gasp in horror. They immediately picked Izuku up, calling an ambulance as Izuku was transported to a nearby hospital. It was around 8 p.m. when the police pulled up to Inko's home. Having learned the news, the woman rushed to the hospital at so quickly. The police that were meant to escort her got to the hospital only 30 minutes after she did, despite the fact that she ran there on foot and they were in a police cruiser. Izuku, Inko cried out, My baby, where are you? Ma'am, I can take you there, so please be patient. A nurse ran in, holding two bucket below Inko to catch all the tears flooding from her, one for each eye. As Inko was finally allowed into Izuku's room, she saw that Izuku was covered in bandages and unconscious. Who did this? Inko was, still in tears. We are not quite sure yet, replied the nurse. There are reports of a certain serial killer roaming these parts. Some suspect it was her. I assure you, the police are working extra hard to catch this criminal. I don't care about the criminal, I only want Izuku to be okay. Inko cried back, shaking the nurse. His injuries are not as severe as you might think. It's all superficial. In fact, he will be dispatched tomorrow if all goes well, said the nurse. Hearing this, Inko let out a sigh of relief as she sat next to Izuku's bed, singing a soothing melody, one he hasn't sung for years. All you need is love. Love, love, love is all you need. Memories of the first time her husband sang this song to her flooded her mind. Suddenly, a fear loomed over her as she suddenly remembered what happened all those years ago. Holding the hand of his only son, she whispered to him, You will always be my baby. I love you Izuku. The next day, most of Izuku's injuries have already mostly healed. He was shortly discharged. While walking home, Inko remained silent for a while, feeling guilty for not being there for her only son when he needed it. Izuku, Inko said in a worried tone, If you're going through anything, please don't hide it from me. I can help you. Izuku, on the other hand, shook his head. I'm fine mom, I'm fine. I just need some time alone. Izuku replied. Alone? Asked Inko. It's, it's been a tough day. I really just need to go somewhere to clear my head. Izuku said, veering off course. Izuku, where are you going? Please don't get hurt again. Inko cried, latching onto him. I'm just going to the shopping center. It's a sad and I heard there's a sale going on. Said Izuku. I'm feeling in the mood for some katsudan anyways. Of course. Inko replied with energy. Let's go get some. Where do you want to go? No restaurant makes katsudan like how you make them mom. Izuku replied, let's go for homemade. Great, let's go, I'll buy the meat. You get yourself some veggies and maybe even some snacks too while you're on it. Inko replied, handing him a wad of cash. Thanks mom, race you there. Izuku replied, feeling a brief moment of happiness coming back to him as he raced his mom to the shopping district, something he hasn't done since childhood. At the shopping district, the crowd was bustling on a bright sunny day. The breeze of spring, sending crisp gusts of fresh air, ruffling the algae green hair of the young boy. Staring at the bustling crowd, making out each and every individual quirks and subconsciously laughing at the ones unfortunate enough to be born with alarm clocks as ears. Yet, in this bustling crowd, a sense of isolation started to dawn on him once more. He felt like an outcast within this giant crowd. Not special enough to be considered even as another brick in every abstract-looking wall. It wasn't easy to admit, but every word people said to put him down in the past, every insult and every pity are finally catching on to him. Goddamn wind, cried some passerby about his age, snapping him out of his trance, it's messing up my hair. I spent so much time brushing so wouldn't look like a porcupine. You should have used hairspray buddy, the strong kind, said the other. Oh trust me, it would take a whole kin to immobilize my long hair, replied the other. Izuku didn't much attention, as he was approaching his destination, the local farmhouse grocery store. He used to always go there as a kid for the capsule machines that dispensed hero collectibles when he was a kid. How naive he was, back then. And remember kids, said a new debuting hero, playing on TV, anyone can be a hero. Take it from me, Eloreal, and my new Elora vitamins, rich in vitamins and ass kicking. Despite it being a common and cheesy promo ad, its sight immediately made Izuku feel unwell. All Might immediately came back to mind, as he collapsed, hyperventilating. Not wanting to cause a scene, he rushed to the nearest washroom, vomiting into the sink as soon as the door closed, voices of his former aggressors, resonating in his head. You'll never be a hero Deku. Katsuki shut up. A hero. Is this some kind of joke, Mr. Midoriya? His teacher shut up. Sorry kid, be more realistic and give up. Will you? All Might shut up. Izuku yelled, punching the mirror hard enough to crack it, before tears poured out once again, along with blood from his fists. Suddenly, shrieks of excitement were heard outside the store, as the sound of movement caught Izuku's attention. Heading out the washroom, he noticed that the store he was in was deserted, as most of the shoppers ran out. Curious as to why, his query was soon answered as he found a huge group gathering at the mall's center square. There was a villain attack. It's Elorial, 
One girl cheered. Oh great, that twat is here. Thought Izuku as he nevertheless approached the scene of the crime to see yet another hero make his debut. However, this time, the villain was nothing huge. Though giant monster or living mass of toxic ooze. Just some dude who hardly even looked like a villain, more like an improvised thug. The villain struggled desperately to fight off the hero. Who seemed to have some sort of hair manipulation quirk. Only to be on the receiving end of a one-sided massacre. For a little bit, Izuku almost felt bad for the villain. Kick his ass El Oriol, shouted the crowd, completely insensitive to the battered and bruised up man standing before them, who had long stopped to fight back and was just trying to run away. All this for a stolen wallet. The man weakly coughed, seriously, break his legs. The fans cried, grab his dick and twist it. Yelled one guy, give him the all dick twist. With every cheer of the crowd, Izuku became more and more disgusted. Looking back, he saw himself, lying on the blood-dampened asphalt as Katsuki beat him mercilessly as groups of students just stood, watched and laughed. This entire scene, it was way too familiar for him, making him bite his bottom lips, flinching at the thought of what must be going through that man's head as he is being both attacked and humiliated while knowing that the very people that were meant to protect him are beating him down for everyone to see. Not wanting to see how everything ends, Izuku decided to leave the scene early. Just then, the man was able to land a lucky hit, staggering the hero before running into the crowd. Look out, he's coming right for us. Some of the people yelled in fear as they made way for him, too afraid to approach as the thug ran approximately five feet before collapsing at the foot of Izuku. Looking at the man, Izuku froze. He looked so helpless, so afraid, almost like himself. Looking back to the hero, he could have sworn he saw Katsuki for a brief moment. He's the same, Izuku thought, tears running down his face. That so-called hero, All Might, Kaken. They're all the same. I don't want to steal anymore, uttered the man, desperately trying to crawl away. I'll find a job, even if it's a bad one. I just need money for my sick brother. Please, I don't want to die. This world is better off without villains like you, said El Oriel. Honestly, I don't care what the capture protocol says anymore. Your kind disgust me for merely existing. He scoffed, as he used his hair to pick up a massive slab of stone, vanish for the sake of justice. Suddenly, almost an instinct. Izuku grabbed the man and, using some unknown amount of strength, lifted him over his shoulder and made a beeline for anywhere that wasn't within a mile from El Oriel. So you had an accomplice, El Oriel said to himself. Big deal, I'll just… Kaya, you were so cool El Oriel. Give us an autograph please. A huge amount of fans came rushing in. Buffered by the crowd, El Oriel used his hair to lift himself off the ground. Seeing Izuku around a dozen meters away, the hero deduced he can stroke his ego for at least a little while for how slow the kid was, and came back down to sign some autographs and pose for photos. Meanwhile, the man Izuku saved came back to the realm of conscience, looking at the kid, who was struggling to lift him up. Just then, he stopped himself, dragging Izuku by surprise into a closed down and empty storeroom that seemed to be an old barbershop. All right kid, what the hell, why did you save me? Asked the man. Izuku looked at him in shock, as he struggled to get the words out. Be because. I I I. You were. Well, he stuttered. After about five seconds of incomprehensive gibberish, the man gave up, putting his hand to Izuku's mouth to shut him up. Listen kid, I don't know why you jumped in to save me. Fact is, now the hero is after both of us and none of us are in fighting condition, unless you have some super overpowered quirk, so like it or not. But we must escape this mall before more reinforcements show up, said the man. What's your name, kid? I Izuku the kid stuttered. Izuku Midoriya. Well named Sachai Tsukiyama, replied the man. Now help me pull down this door shutter before that hair guy comes back. Suddenly, hair came out of the cracks from the floor, grabbing Sachai by the neck as the El Oriol came into the store. Did you really think you can run from me? Asked El Oriel. As he started to strangle Sachai, now tell me, is this kid with you? Izuku fell back in fear, as he knew that Sachai would sell him out so that he could maybe escape. He knew this tactic, as so many kids used it in the past on him. Like when a few of Katsuki's goons shoplifted and pinned the blame on Izuku, so that he got all the blame. Fearing what's to come next, Izuku looked behind him for an exit, but found none. Instead, he armed himself with a pair of rusty barber scissors, slowing backing up. However, what happened next came right out of the blue. No he isn't, Sachai replied. He's just some kid I tried to take hostage, now so leave him alone. Is that so? Asked the hero. Izuku however, felt so moved, as he struggled to hold onto his improvised weapon. How could that man be a villain? He didn't try to sell him out, he didn't threaten him nor did he harm him, he felt like the textbook definition of innocent. So why was he the one being strangled, by a pro hero no less? Why was he witnessing such injustice? Well, I guess I'll just leave him for the police to handle. Assisting a villain in escaping is a serious offense, El Oriel replied, suddenly strangling Sachai even harder, but you, you're not gonna end up in jail. Today's world has no need for useless people like you, if you can't even be a decent villain. 
he said, while flashing a sinister smile as Sachai started to cough out blood. Then you might as well not exist at all. Let him go. Izuku yelled out in rage, projecting all of his hatred onto this hero. No, this monster, as he plunged a pair of rusty barber scissors straight into El Oriel's stomach. Jaya, I've been stabbed. El Oriel yelled out in pain, as he released Sachai. Great shot kid, I can't believe you had it in you. Now let's get out of here. Sachai exclaimed in awe and excitement as he ran for the exit, only for the door shutters to close, causing him to run face first into said metal door. You're not going anywhere. El Oriel hissed, as he used part of his hair to pull the door shutters down and enclose the two inside the abandoned barber shop. The automatic lights flickered on, as the two frantically ran away from the hero in panic. Loaded with adrenaline, Izuku tore out of the scissors from El Oriel's stomach, causing blood to gush out before flailing the bloody weapon at him. This is what you get you hear me. You fiend. You don't deserve the title hero. Izuku yelled in rage, slashing away at El Oriel who turned to him in anger. Just then, El Oriel hair wrapped around Izuku's arm, tearing away the scissors and using them against him, holding them up to his throat. I'm not a hero, huh? El Oriel sneered, using his hair to stitch up the stab wound. Then what does that make you? A better person than you. Izuku spat back at him, giving him a mocking smile. Why you little suddenly? What sounded like a gunshot was heard, as a hole formed in the wad of hair that entangled Izuku, dropping him to floor. Turning around, Sachai was seen, his pointer finger aiming at El Oriel, the tip smoking like a gun barrel. I'll have you know that my finger is loaded, boasted Sachai. And this next shot is going right for your head. Sachai Tsukiyama, quirk, psychic bullet. The user can fire bullets of pure kinetic energy from their fingertips. The bullets are stronger than your typical revolver, but much slower. As Izuku ran back, keeping his distance from El Oriel, Sachai fired three more times, sending bolts of red energy flying at the hero. To counter the upcoming attack, El Oriel used his hair to pick up and uproot nearly stools and chairs, throwing them in the way of the bullet as said furniture were distorted and deformed by the blast of Sachai's attack. Then, using them as weapons, he swung the damaged chairs like bludgeoning weapons, smashing Sachai into a wall. He swung again, hoping to continue his onslaught of attacks. But Sachai was able to parry said attacks by grabbing a nearby chair of his own, holding back his attacker's weapons. Hey, Izuku, could use a hand here, said Sachai. Now would be a good time to use your quirk. Izuku froze upon hearing those words however. He had no quirks. His uncertainty started to come back to him. Could he really do it? Without a quirk, one was basically useless in this world. If he really did come from behind, El Oriel would just grab him too. It was no use. No matter how he looked at it, there was no way he could save Sachai. So he decided to tell the truth. At least then, he could justify why he was so useless. I'm sorry Sachai. I forgot to tell you earlier. Izuku said in an apologetic tone, I'm quirkless. Sachai's eyes widened. You're quirkless, he uttered, as El Oriel was able to overpower him, grabbing him by the neck and smashing him through a wall, making him cough out blood. Well, that certainly doesn't come out as a surprise, laughed El Oriel, from one useless person to another. But hey, at least you have a quirk. He said to Sachai, you on the other hand, kid, are so much worse. How does your kind even get up in the morning without your poor fragile spines giving away? Does it hurt when you breathe? I swear, it's almost like whoever made this world really hated 20% of its people and made them as worthless and as pathetic as possible. Those words dug deep into Izuku, as he, who was so full of energy and fighting spirit before, collapsed, his eyes hollow and hopeless. Just then, Sachai shot a bullet at El Oriel, grazing his cheek and causing enough pain for the man to drop him. Cut the crap bore Al Sachai jabbed. No one's useless in this world. Especially not you, Izuku. Izuku looked up, as Sachai ran in, grabbing Izuku by the head and looking directly into his eyes with a fierce and stern glare. Listen to me Izuku. Don't listen to what everyone else says about you. The only one whose words truly matter come from those who care about you. And seeing how I dragged you into this mess, I guess it's my responsibility to tell you this as a person who genuinely cares about you but, you are not useless. You are Izuku Midoriya. The kid who, when no one else would, stepped in to save a man you didn't even know. The kid who, despite having no quirk, managed to wound a pro hero. Somewhere in you, you have a talent. So don't let anyone put you down and find it so we don't get killed by this crazy ass shampoo fanatic, exclaimed Sachai, as he El Oriel's hair wrapped around him and pulled him back away. Sometimes, the biggest problems in one's life have the simplest solution. After getting ridiculed for his entire life, hearing those words sparked a fire in Izuku's heart, one that was long put out. Tears once more came streaming down Izuku's face, but this time, they were not of sadness. After those words were said, Izuku realized, this man truly believes in him, and now, all he can feel in his heart, beyond his fears and his insecurities, was gratitude. Just then, his left hand bumped onto a cylindrical object. He picked it up, looking at the label. 
Just then, he remembered a conversation he overheard just half an hour ago. I'm gonna enjoy tearing you limb from limb. El Oriol spat at Sachai. Suddenly, a white king came flying at them as El Oriol catched at midair. Why do you ever bother any more Sachai? Shoot the can. Izuku yelled. As if by instinct, Sachai immediately obeyed. Firing at the can as a massive cloud erupted from it, blinding El Oriol. L-O-H-H-H. What is this? The hero cried in pain as he tried to move his hair, but to no avail. Why? Why can't I move my hair? What have you done to my hair? Izuku, don't tell me. Hairspray, the extra strong type. Izuku replied, smiling with pride. He won't be able to move that hair for at least an hour. Damn you. Damn you all. El Oriol yelled out. So, what was that about us being useless again? Asked Izuku, walking up to the hero, who could barely open his still burning eyes. Ew, you bastards. The hero yelled out in anger, pointing to Sachai you're no better than that villain, kid. You hear me? You're a villain, just like that scumbag. That scumbag also happens to have a lighter, said Sachai, walking in with a lit lighter. And if I remember correctly, hairspray is very flammable. You, you wouldn't dare. Al Oriel uttered in fear. You're pathetic. Izuku scoffed, acting all high and mighty, flaunting your power and using it to abuse the weak. You're far worse than any of us. Picking on people who have already surrendered for personal gains, you're no hero. Hearing this, El Oriel laughed. And you think you're any better? A quirkless loser who has just destroyed any chance he could have had at whatever decent future a quirkless piece of shit can get in this world. Face it kid, you're just shooting yourself in the foot by doing this. You're no more than a villain, waiting to be put down. Izuku twitched in anger as he tore the lighter from Sachai's hand. Well if I'm a villain, Izuku yelled, then you shouldn't be surprised when I do this. Kid wait. Before Sachai could stop him, the lighter was thrown as the hero lit ablaze. The barely functioning lights finally wore out, as the burning body of El Oriel soon became the only source of light in the dark room. Amidst the screams of pain and agony coming from El Oriel, Izuku stared silently at the scene unfolding before him, with Sachai backing up in horror. In normal circumstances, he would be terrified, but now, he felt it again, that impulse back when he saw Katsuki being attacked by the sludge villain. All he wanted to do was laugh. Hehe, <laughs> and laugh he did. The howls of police sirens were heard in the distance, as the fire from El Oriel's body started to spread. As this happened, Sachai tore open the door shutters, as he saw police entering the building. Hey kid, the police are coming, we have to go. Sachai yelled, kid. As he turned around, he saw Izuku, on his knees, hyperventilating as reality started to catch up to him. He just burned someone alive, and laughed. What was wrong with him? Was he even sane anymore? Suddenly, he felt a strong pull as Sachai's arms wrapped around him, lifting him up and carrying him away. When the police arrived on scene, the duo was long gone, leaving the place trashed and burning. As the fire department came rushing in, the police asked the nearby witnesses. Some kid ran in and attacked the hero you say. Asked the police. Yeah, I don't know who he was. Just some weirdo I guess. But El Oriel was so awesome. You should have seen him. Said the civilian. El Oriel? Asked the policeman. Before whispering to his partner officer. Wasn't he charged with tax fraud and adultery and had his hero license suspended? Apparently he paid off the media to erase all that from the news. Replied the officer. Signing autographs and dressing up isn't illegal per se. But if he really did fight a villain, it goes against the law. Then find him. That man needs some serious scolding. Ordered the police officer. Sir, we found him. Well, what's left of him? Yelled a policeman, running in, on the second floor. Running up to the second floor, they gazed in horror, as the paramedics who arrived with the fire department lead the two to the charred remains of the former hero. Are we sure this is El Oriel? Asked the police officer. My quirk allows me to instantly recognize a person's name and identity by merely touching anything with their genetic code. This is indeed him said the paramedics. Hearing this, the officer pulled out a cigar from his pocket, lighting it and slowly released a cloud of smoke. Get the detective on the line, said the officer. We might have a new villain to add to the database. Izuku found himself in an alleyway, not the most welcoming place to wake up in, but he was too emotionally drained to feel fear, or any emotion at all for that matter. All he wanted to do was fall back asleep and hope it was all just a bad dream. That man, it wasn't him, it couldn't be. He would never have enjoyed the suffering of others so thoroughly. Was it the satisfaction of finally fighting back that gave him such enjoyment? Was it the bloodlust? Him just getting too into his role as a savior of who he believed was the real victim. He didn't want to think much. All he knew was whoever that was. He would prefer just keeping him locked deep within his subconscious. So you're finally awake, said a familiar voice. It was Sachai, who was sitting on a pile of boxes right across him. You're still here, asked Izuku. I've been here, waiting for you to wake up, said Sachai. How long was I out? Asked Izuku. Two hours, I wouldn't say from fatigue, rather, emotional shock. 
responded Sachai, before springing upwards and rushing to Izuku. Now how about explaining to me what all that stuff was about? Izuku felt embarrassed for a bit, not knowing what to reply. He wasn't even sure what Sachai was referring to. I mean, those moves there. That much quick thinking. I mean, are you sure you're quirkless? Cause all that was way too crazy for a quirkless kid to pull off, exclaimed Sachai, bursting with excitement. Well, yeah, I don't even know why you're so impressed. I just threw hairspray at him then set him on fire, replied Izuku. He was a pro hero, and you totally whooped his ass. Man I admire you, replied Sachai. Admire. He who was bullied since youth, laughed at for his ambitions, having his dreams crushed and grounded by those he cared about and admired. The only living human being, possibly, to have no quirks was admired by someone. Do you actually mean that? Asked Izuku. Of course I do, replied Sachai. I mean, look at you. You're a quirkless, stuttering, seemingly pathetic runt, facing off against someone trained in taking down threats to the general public at a regular basis. Yet you still had it in you to save the man everyone labeled as the bad guy while putting not only your reputation, but your own life on the life, just to save a good-for-nothing thug who in all likelihood you'll never meet again and would in normal circumstances mug someone in the near future. I honestly can't thank you enough. Sachai's ecstatic tone slowly dropped, as his voice becomes more and more shaky. Izuku then noticed, tears were forming in his eyes as he dropped down crying. I just can't believe someone would actually save a lost cause like me. Sachai cried out in tears of gratitude. For a brief moment, Izuku almost saw his exact reflection in Sachai. He can't describe how it felt, to be able to relate this much to how he was feeling. But what he said was something he simply couldn't let slide. Don't say that Sachai, said Izuku. I appreciate the compliment, but that doesn't change the fact that I'm quirkless. There's really nothing in this world for me. Your admiration is at least something though, I admit. Nothing, Sachai exclaimed. Grabbing Izuku by the shoulder, you managed to do all of that without the use of a quirk. I don't care what others say, because the fact that you managed to beat a pro hero with a handicap is something no one else can brag about. Quirks don't make you special Izuku, it's you that make yourself special. Once again, Izuku was overwhelmed. His mother encouraged him so many times, saying that he can be anything in the past. Yet this was so different, it felt genuine, it felt honest, like this man really did believe in him. Although, something about all this just didn't feel right to Izuku. How could this be a villain? He was so cheerful, so encouraging, and he did what an actual hero, nay, the number one pro hero and the man he admired all of his life couldn't do, he believed in him. How? Izuku asked, clenching his fists, how can they call you a villain? Kid, no one's ever believed in me. Not even my own mother, as well as she hides it, yet the only person I met who actually shows this much compassion towards me is someone that would be behind bars. This isn't fair. Izuku cried out. Why is it that people like that bastard El Oriel can be called a hero yet people like you a villain, Sachai? It's not fair. Life's not fair kid. I've been through enough of it to know that your fate is decided nowadays with the flip of a coin said Sachai, sitting back down on a broken down TV, and sadly, it seems as though you and I are the ones that called it wrong. Sachai, Izuku asked, how much of the villains we boo at and shun are like you? A lot more than you think kid, replied Sachai. While we may look merciless on the outside, many of us are still human on the inside. Of course, there are hundreds of exceptions, but for the most part, we were just born under the wrong star. Whether it was abusive parents, a poor family or having a family member that holds a criminal record, the sad part is, due to these circumstances, we were never able to live a normal life, so we rob and sometimes even kill just to get by on life. We are the ones heroes should be helping. Yet they prey on us like we were never welcome in the first place. So, people like us are just fated to become villains? Asked Izuku, in disbelief, sounding more and more distressed. Honestly, with how things are today, the truth may be even uglier than the answer yes, replied Sachai, punching the wall. This isn't right, you're an amazing kid. Uh, Izuku, Izuku Midoriya. Yeah, Izuku. Man, I never thought of things like this. Laughed Sachai. This world is really messed up, isn't it? I mean, you're brilliant, Izuku. Not to mention brave and, to be honest, kinder reckless and head-headed. I admire that. Yet this world seems to be heavily against your success. But honestly, don't lose hope, okay kid? Just because the odds are against you doesn't mean that there aren't people out there that will be on your side. I mean, I exist, don't I? Just remember kid, you're the master of your own destiny, so don't you ever get put down by anyone but yourself. As he said that, he got up, slowly walking away. Wait, where are you going? Asked Izuku. If the cops catch you and I talking, they'll take you for an accomplice and arrest you. I can't let that happen, so just forget about be okay. I'm just a burden to you. Go out there and achieve your dreams, I believe in you. Said Sachai, giving him a thumbs up and a smile that, for that one moment, was shining even brighter than all might's, take care. But, what's gonna happen to you? Asked Izuku, I dunno, maybe I get caught and thrown in jail, maybe I escape to fight another day. 
replied Sachai in a jockish tone, or who knows, maybe a truck will kill me and send me into another world where I get a harem and slay the demon king. No, Izuku uttered out, no, you don't deserve this. You're a better person than anyone I've ever met. You deserve better than to be just another villain of the week. Please, let me help you. Help me, asked Sachai. Then make that your goal if that's what you want. Turn this world on its head, is you bro. Soon, Sachai disappeared from sight. After that, he heard gunshots, then sirens, then running. While this happened, Izuku stood in place, before dropping to the ground. All this repressed sorrow and anger flooding out at once, as he cried. He cried for the injustice he suffered, the terrible and nigh inescapable fate he was cursed with, the world that seemed to hate him so, and for a man that deserved more than to just be called a villain and tossed aside. So that's all we're worth to you heroes, Izuku said to himself, to be preyed upon and used to fuel your fame, to create conflict and to endanger lives so that you may prosper. I can't believe in you anymore. I can't believe in any heroes anymore. No, if it's a villain you want. Izuku yelled to the top of his lungs, cursing the world. Then it's a villain you'll all fucking get. Izuku, where have you been? I was so worried. And Ko cried out, lunging into Izuku the second he came into sight. The worried mother had been searching for Izuku for the past two hours, unable to find him. She contacted to police, who sent out a search team when a sudden villain attack hit. For her son to show up after all this time was the most relief she's ever felt. Sorry mom, I went shopping and got a little distracted. Izuku lied. Let me guess, a rare All Might merch? Asked Inko. Yeah, that's right. Izuku choked out. Well, I bought the meat. Get ready for the best meal only a loving mother can cook. Inko said, pumping her fists. Let's go then. Said Izuku, excited, I'm starving. Once home, Inko started to cook immediately. While this happened, Izuku went to his room, looking at all the All Might merchandise. All he felt was disgust. It's time for change. Izuku said to himself, not only to my room, but to this world. As he tore away the posters and action figures, he started to write down new ideas for his future. He couldn't just go out and start attacking heroes right away, so he needed to start small. Luckily, unlike most hero fans, he spent his entire life making notes about heroes, along with their strengths, weaknesses and classifying them in categories to know how to optimally use them and how to counter them. While it was just a hobby, he unintentionally became more knowledgeable about quirks than any average person in Japan. But just knowing won't be enough, hence why he knew he can't engage the heroes directly. He was gonna have to have other villains do his dirty work, knowing that, he needed his own identity. After several pages of crumbled up paper, he finally found one. Mightless was finally born. Another day, another villain attack and another hero debut. This time around, several heroes have arrived on scene, as a man with devil horns came running out of a burning office holding a gun and a bloody suitcase, being chased down by several heroes. Listen here villain, we have the entire perimeter surrounded. Just give up and our job will be a whole lot easier, ordered the cops. Screw you guys, replied the villain. You have no idea what it was like working in that company. The boss exploited the hell out of me, forcing me to work overtime even though I had a 39 degree fever and docking my pay for showing up only two minutes late. It was a black company through and through. As the heroes were closing in, the placed his palm on the floor, as spires of flames erupted from below, slowing the heroes down long enough for the villain to escape through an alleyway. Damn it, he's getting away. Cursed one of the heroes. After him, as devil horned villain ran, however, he came face to face with some kid, wearing what seemed like an All Might hoodie, but spray painted black and red and wearing a surgical mask. You look like you could use some help, said the kid. Who the hell are you? Asked the devil horned man, pointing his gun at him. W-O there, I'm trying to help you here. The kid exclaimed, listen, I know the heroes you're fighting. They are part of the fearless hero Brave's hero agency. However, their main hero, Brave, has an irrational fear of bugs. Okay, thanks for the trivia kid. Now move over before. Found you, villain. A voice came from behind. Looks like you got yourself an accomplice too. Oh crud. The kid said out loud. The villain tried to grab the kid as hostage. Until he saw him holding something up to him. Here, use this, said the kid, revealing a jar full of cockroaches. You are finished. The pro hero yelled out, ignoring the two's interaction, as he charged at them while striking a cheesy pose. Have a taste of my hero kick. Suddenly, a jar came flying at him. Unfazed, he shattered it with a karate chop. However, upon breaking it, the creepy crawlers inside the jar were set free and flew all over him, crawling down his arm, chest and even underneath his sleeves. Suddenly, the hero stopped dead in his tracks, as his face contorted into a look of horror. His mouth opened, yelled out soundless cries and his eyes went white, before the devil villain came running in, nailing him in the face, knocking him unconscious. Thanks for the help kid, said the devil villain. No problem, now, the payment, said the kid. Payment? Did you really think I'd do this for free? 
asked the kid. I'll be taking about 5,000 yen for the assistance fee and an additional 1,000 for before he could finish. The kid was grabbed by the neck and thrown against a wall. You won't get shit from me, said the devil villain, pissed off. Do you want to know what I did to the last person who forced a favor onto me? H. Hey now, calm down. We can talk about this. The kid jittered out. No need to get violent here, I said. The devil villain yelled out, winding up his fist. Don't order me around. Suddenly, a cracking sound was heard, as the devil villain dropped to the floor, unconscious, as someone stood behind him, holding a pipe smeared with fresh blood. As the kid got up, he came face to face with a familiar figure. Sachai, Izuku, what the hell are you doing here? And what's with the getup? Asked Sachai. Suddenly, another hero came out, running towards them. Hey, you two, stay where you are, yelled out the hero. What the heroes? Sachai exclaimed. Let's run. Izuku yelled out as the two bolted from the scene. As the two heroes bent down, seeing the unconscious villain, they decided to call for backup to apprehend their initial target before chasing after their new suspects. However, before they could get their phones out, they heard footsteps coming from behind them. His outfit was kinda cute, said a young girl's voice, reminds me of a bunny, I love bunnies. Hey, who the hell are you? Identify your before the hero could finish, he found himself with a knife in his stomach. As he fell back in shock, he got a closer look at the girl. Wait, I recognize you, you're that serial killer uttered out the hero, before his life was ended too. Meanwhile, nearly two miles away from where the initial villain attack took place, Izuku and Sachai found themselves lying down in the garbage dumps that was Dagaba Beach, covered in sweat from all the running. All right, kid, mind telling me what that was all about? Asked Sachai. I was just helping someone who was treated unfairly. That's all, like how I saved you. Izuku uttered out. And you thought he would just give you money for saving him? Asked Sachai, this ain't Pokemon, dude, you can't just expect everyone to be nice to you. I needed to start up somehow, explained Izuku. No place wants to hire me because I'm quirkless and I needed the money. Money for what? Asked Sachai, I thought you had it fine. You don't get it Sachai, I'm done trying to be a hero. This world's far too unfair for me to just sit down and do nothing. Something needs to be done to change the world for the better and I can't do it with just allowance and crude gears, exclaimed Izuku. Don't tell me you're serious Izuku. Sachai exclaimed, do you know how dangerous being a villain is? This isn't your everyday profession, you can actually die. Then I'd rather die fighting for what I want than to live an unfair life at the bottom of the social hierarchy. Izuku yelled back. Sachai clenched his fists in anger. Do you know how ashamed I was when I realized my actions put your life in danger? Yelled Sachai, I was just a thug. I bottom feeder caught in a net. You could have just walked away but you chose to put your own life on the line. I wanted to make sure that wouldn't happen again by giving you hope and support. Now look at you, nearly dying again because of what I said. This isn't about you Sachai. Becoming a villain is my choice. You said it, didn't you? That I was the master of my own destiny. Well as the master, I command my destiny to become the villain that will make this world a better place, where the quirkless and quirked have an equal chance to become what they want to become. Izuku yelled back. Stop acting so hasty. No one can just change the world overnight. And doing it in such a dishonest way will never work if you're gonna run face first into danger constantly. Sachai yelled back. Can't you tell that I'm worried about your safety? Can't you tell that I'm trying to help you? It's like you said. Don't let other tell you what you can't do, right Sachai? Izuku asked back. So why are you going back on those words? I chose this. I'll try my best to carry this through and what happens happens. End of story. Hearing this, Sachai turned around and stomped off. Fine. Go ahead and get yourself killed. See if I care. Sachai yelled out, walking off. As that happened, Izuku pulled up his hood again as he started to walk the other way. However, as that happened, Sanchai turned around for a bit, looking back at Izuku. He saw him shaking, as he tried to pull his hood down, as if he thinks no one could tell that he was crying that way. Feeling guilty, he turned around and walked towards the boy. Hey, sorry if I was a little harsh, apologized Sanchai. It's just that I already have a sick brother I need to care for, and I didn't want to have another life I needed to protect. But I guess I was just being selfish. After all, you saved my life, so it's only fair that I repay the favor. Izuku turned around, as he saw Sachai, reaching his hand out, patting him in the back. So just tell me which villain you're gonna help next partner, I'll be there to protect you. Said Sachai with a smile. Sachai, Izuku uttered out, before bursting into tears. Jeez, you can be such a crybaby, you know that. Chuckled Sachai, hugging him tightly. A few hours later, the duo approached a seemingly abandoned warehouse. Alright Izuku, if you want to grow as a villain, you need to learn the basics of trading in the criminal underworld, said Sachai. This warehouse is a hangout stop of a small-time gang of criminals I used to run errands for, so we might be able to get a bit of learning experience from them. Alright, I'll see what I can do. 
Izuku replied, shaking nervously underneath his hoodie. Now, remember, it's a lot easier to trade with people you have connections with, so take this as the first tip, explained Sachai. Build connections. As they entered, he saw a group of around 12 people, some of which looked rather young. One was almost his age. Their leader was a man built like a bull. With the face of a bull, a bull-shaped belt buckle and was named Bull Horns, surely his quirk must be goat. Hey, Bull Horns, buddy, long time no see. So, uh, how's it been? Asked Sachai. Suddenly, the leader grabbed Sachai by his shirt's collar, picking him up with one hoof. Sachai, I thought I told you that if we met again, I'd skewer you like the rat you are. The criminal leader yelled out. Whoa there, I thought that bank robbery was behind us now. Sachai uttered out in fear. Behind us, you're the one who sold us out and ran with the money. I got two of my best men sent behind bars and one killed because of you. Yelled Bullhorns, you're dead meat. Hearing this, Sachai turned around to Izuku, whom the gang didn't even bother noticing. Now you see, Izuku, when you're in a situation like this, all you do is take your trusty finger gun, aim right at the dumb bull's eye, said Sachai casually, trying to hide his panic, then shoot and run like hell. Suddenly, Sachai fired a bullet into the bull's eye as the crime boss dropped him while writhing in pain. As that happened, the two made a beeline out of the warehouse, being chased by the rest of the gang. After nearly half an hour of chasing, the two were able to lose the gang as they got themselves back on track. Tip number two, pull a tough guy act. Sachai explained, as he and Izuku were on their way to meet another potential client, when you take the upper hand, your buyer will be too intimidated to oppose you or say no, making them easy money. As they walked up to their next client, a crook who's been trying to rob a comic store that scammed him with bootleg collector's item merchandise. As they came up to them, Izuku stomped in, trying his next to act intimidating. Oi fuckface, heard you needed help busting into this store, said Izuku, stiffening his face to the point where it almost looked like All Might while trying to do his next Katsuki impression, but failing miserably at both. What did you say about my face? The crook replied, revealing a scaly lizard face with long, pinkish hair. No no no, act tough but don't offend them. Sachai whispered out, hiding behind a trash can. I'll have you know that I take pride in being a lizard. The crook kept on yelling, my dad was a salamander, my mom was a bearded dragon, and I will not tolerate anyone who dares to diss me. As Izuku was backing up, he turned his head to look at Sachai, sending him help me signals. Don't drop the act, he whispered, apologize, but don't act like you were intimidated, sorry about that. Izuku replied, now sounding like All Might, anyways, you needed help breaking into that comic store. Yeah. They've been scamming people with their limited edition golden fries off figurine. A Frieza figurine whose face is a pack of fries, which is worth over 60 zero yen. But when I bought it, it was just a cheaply spray-painted 1000 yen common Frieza figurine with the head removed and replaced with a French fry keychain. Their entire store is producing bootlegs and scamming collectors such as myself and I will prove it, explained the crook. Here, Izuku said bluntly, pulling out a map. These are the schematics of the building, along with every exit, where the wires for the alarms are located in every room. Now we're talking. Gimme, said the crook. Tsk tsk tsk. Wait a minute. You gotta for it first, said Izuku. 30 zero yen. Excuse me, asked the crook. Did I stutter? Asked Izuku, flashing a menacing glare. Suddenly, the crook pulled out a giant sword made up of a bunch of strapped together knives. Did you? He yelled out. Pull out. Pull out. Sancha yelled from behind the trash can. Get the hell out of there. And once again, the duo ran off with no progress made. Later still, they tried once again. I have a collection of glass eyes I could offer, Izuku said, trying out Sanchai's third tactic. Act sympathetic towards the clients to get on their good side. That tip went well. For the first three minutes that was, run away, Sanchai yelled out. As he and Izuku dashed away as their client's muscle tissues expanded, as he tried to chase them down and mush them to paste. On their fourth attempt, they tried to meet someone who seemed more docile. Stain, I presume. I heard you like to get informed before facing off against heroes. Well, I have the information of several heroes that... Fuck off. Understood. That attempt was short-lived. Still, they tried again. Hi there, buddy. I heard you were down on luck. Trouble with heroes. I can leak their personal info online for you for a small payment. I got samples right here. And again, not interested. Boy, that son of a bitch behind you scammed 100 zero yen off me. What did you say about my hair? And again, run as a coup. They're onto us. Run, Nidrandeo. Izuku. And again. After a while, the sun was starting to set as it was already the afternoon. Even Inko called, asking where he was, as he lied to her, telling her he was just going out for a run. All right. So maybe Outlast's seven runs didn't go according to plan. But I am certain that our next client will be happy to do business with you, said Sachai. You said the exact same thing the last six times. Izuku muttered, exhausted as well. Well, you know what they say, seven times a charm, but eight could do no harm. 
Sachai replied. Literally no one says that. Izuku added. As they were reaching their destination, let's just get this over with. However, just then, Sachai stopped and gestured Izuku to do the same. Wait, did you hear that? Asked Sachai. Hear what? Asked Izuku. Sachai formed a gun with his hand, like a pistol. Izuku, stay here. He ordered, as he peeked into the corner of the alley. While he wasn't sure what it was, if it was anything and not just the adrenaline from running the entire day putting him on edge, but he was sure that they were being followed. Peeking into the corner, he jumped out, pointing his finger at the first thing he saw, a raccoon. Damn, worried over nothing, said Sachai. Never mind Izuku, it was just a raccoon. No response. Izuku, he was missing. Aw shit. Izuku woke up in a dark room of what seemed to be an abandoned apartment. He tried to move, but realized he was tied down to a chair, attempting to call for help. The dryness of his throat only allowed him to let out a pathetic yell. Oh, you woke up Izuku said a voice. From the side of the room, a girl around his age emerged from the shadows. She had blonde, silky hair that were tied in two buns and was wearing a high school sailor uniform. Her eyes were baggy, contrasting her energetic behaviors. I've been watching you for so long, Izuku kun she said lustfully. Ever since I saw you that day, beaten up by those crude men and covered in blood, I was obsessed. I want to re-experience that so badly. She pulled out a knife, waving it in front of Izuku, who was practically pissing himself in fear. You came so close from getting beat up and covered in wounds when trying to sell your stuff. Yet you never did, you tease. She continued, and with your big brother watching you like a hawk, I couldn't even get close to you. He's not my guh, Izuku uttered out, before getting a shallow cut in the leg. Oh yes, the girl exclaimed, the redness, the thickness, so beautiful. Bending down, she started to lick the blood from the wound, freaking Izuku out. While trying to get himself untied however, he noticed just how banged up her place looked. It looked like no one's been living here for years. All of a sudden, he remembered the advice that Sachai gave him. Tip number one, connect with your clients do you. Live here, asked Izuku. Suddenly, the girl stopped licking as she got up to look him in the eyes. Why do you want to know that? Asked the girl. I was just wondering, said Izuku, trying to keep his composure. I mean, I've seen animes where spoiled rich girls would try to kidnap or outright buy the boys they have a crush on, but you don't seem spoiled nor rich. Hi. I don't understand what you're trying to get at here, Izuku. The girl answered. Fine, if that question is too avant-garde, how about your name? Asked Izuku. My name? Yeah, I mean, it's just a name. What's so hard about telling me your name? The girl hesitated for a second. Toga. Himiko Toga. SC. Now we're getting somewhere. Yeah. The girl paused for a brief moment, before she looking at Izuku's wound. A brief moment of silence followed. You're not gonna continue. Asked Izuku. Well, it'll be awkward. Wouldn't it? Asked Toga. To introduce yourself then resuming to suck blood. It doesn't feel right. While well, sucking out someone's blood isn't right to begin with you know. Asked Izuku. However, saying this caused Toga to stiffen up, before pushing him over. I know. She yelled, losing composure for a bit. In doing so, the ropes that tied Izuku down came loose, as he was able to break free. Seeing this, Toga ran in, trying to once again subdue him. But Izuku wasn't gonna go down easy, as kicked Toga in the stomach as soon as she ran in, knocking her over. Seeing how she lost composure, Izuku knew it was now or never to apply Sachai's next tip. Tip number two, act tough. Then why do you do it if you know it's clearly not right? Izuku continued to ask, walking up to her. Shut up. You know nothing about me. So do me a favor and stay down you blood back. Toga yelled out, grabbing her knife, lunging at him once again. Seeing this, Izuku needed to defend himself with something. Luckily, his hand found his way to a nearby broom, which he used to block her blow, before pushing her against the wall. Then tell me more about you so that I can know you better. Izuku yelled back. No, you're just gonna turn your back on me like everyone else did. Toga yelled back, overpowering him and pushing him into an empty shelf, knocking the whole thing over. Well from the looks of it, I can see why. Getting turned on by people's blood is enough to creep anyone out. Izuku yelled back, tackling her and pinning her to the floor but only those who know you thoroughly can truly understand why. No, you will never understand me. Toga yelled out, punching him in the sides before flipping him through the front door, breaking it, and I don't need your understanding. Your blood works just fine. As Izuku tried to get up however, Toga came running in, kicking him in the stomach, making him cough out blood. Seeing this was a huge turn on for Toga, as she blushed madly at the sight of Izuku being injured. That same smile again. Izuku uttered out, doesn't your face hurt from smiling so much? Toga grabbed Izuku by the hair, pulling him up. You gave me quite a workout there. Izukun said Toga in her usual tone, as if the mere sight of blood allowed her to regain composure, looks like I'll have to teach you to behave. Putting her knife to his neck, she sunk the blade, digging it into his skin. Is this normal to you? Izuku uttered out. Toga stopped for a moment. Looks like I guessed right. He uttered out. Toga's hands shook for a moment. Fine, 
You got me. I think it's normal. I perceive drinking the blood of those I love the same as kissing those I love. This is how I think. This is me. You got a problem with that. No, Izuku uttered out. In fact, I find it kinda cute. Toga dropped her knife upon hearing that. Huh, it's like your own thing. What separates you from the crowd? I bet your quirk has something to do with blood. Correct, asked Izuku. Why yeah, Toga replied. I turn into anyone whose blood I drink. That sounds like such a cool quirk, said Izuku. I mean, I could write a whole book's worth of uses your quirk can apply to the world. Well the world sure didn't see it that way, said Toga. Quirk counseling, right, asked Izuku. A correctional program that's meant to readjust one's behavior so that they could suit today's society. From what I heard, they belittle quirk users, try to convince them that their quirks are evil and that they were better off quirkless. In fact, one of the many ways they correct their patients is by labeling them as quirkless. They did far worse to me. When they labeled me as quirkless, it was as if a mask was put on me. My friends, my parents, they only wanted to see the me with a mask, because the real me was unfit for society right? Asked Izuku. Yeah, how did you know? Because I know to know that feeling of not belonging. I know it all too well. Replied Izuku, to be compared to everyone else, persecuted if you differ too much and to be forced to be someone you're not, not for the sake of bettering yourself, but to fulfill the expectation of someone who won't even give a crap once those expectations are fulfilled. Looking at Toga, he could see her, fully invested in what he was saying. You're a lucky girl, Toga, because at least you have the ability to create the illusion of being loved. Izuku continued, rarely anyone I know likes quirkless people or geeks. And I am both. I can fake not being a geek, but I can't fake having a quirk. Thus, I fear becoming someone I hate for the sake of being loved, only to never receive that love. Turning to her, he noticed that tears were forming at the corner of her eyes. It wasn't worth it, was it? To fake your interests, to create a mask just so others would like you. Somewhere, down beneath this persona you put up must have been a thought repeating no one loves the real you, forcing you to keep that mask glued onto your face forever. Izuku continued, So, how was it, when you finally took it off? How did it feel to let your real colors shine? Toga lunged in. Only this time, it wasn't to attack him. He felt his left shoulder getting wetter. Toga was crying into it. It was horrible. Everyone called me a monster. I had to run away from home. I haven't slept in a warm bed for nearly five years. I hate it. I hate it. I hate. I hate it. She cried. And yet, I'll do anything but put on that damn fake smile again. I just want to be me. I just want to have someone love the real me. Izuku hugged her tightly, similar to how Sachai hugged him, and all he did afterwards was thank the man in spirit. Tip number three, sympathize with the client suddenly. A loud banging was heard from the door. Clear. Suddenly, the door was broken down. At the, they found me. How? Toga exclaimed as they heard rapid footsteps. Suddenly, a police officer came up the stairs of the broken down apartment. Freeze. Don't move, yelled the officer, and let your hostage go. Suddenly, Izuku took a piece of wood nearby throwing it into the cop's eye as the man crashed down the stairs. Toga, let's move, Izuku exclaimed. Wait, you're helping me, asked Toga. Of course, said Izuku. Without a single hint of lies drawn on his face, I wouldn't die. For once in her life, Toga felt something she hadn't felt in a long time. Deep down, her instincts, thoughts and subconscious all came to agreement, telling her at the same time. This boy is trying to help you, trust him. Getting up, she ran under the bed, pulling Izuku's backpack from under there. You stored some crazy shit in here, Izuku, said Toga. Well, now it's time to put some of this crazy shit to use. Suddenly, another batch of cops came out the stairs, aiming their guns at Toga. Freeze. Don't ga. My eyes. As soon as those cops came, Izuku pulled a high-powered flashlight from his backpack, shining it in the face of the cops. This moment of vulnerability allowed Toga to close in and secure the kill. They will just keep coming. We have to make our way up to the roof, said Izuku. Right, then let's go exclaimed Toga. As the two ran up the stairs, the cops followed closely behind. One of them pulled out his handgun, aiming at the two. However, Izuku shone his flashlight behind him, throwing off his aim as the bullets missed them by a hair. Reaching the roof however, a police chopper stood waiting for them. Shit, all this for one girl. What's with the priorities of the authorities these days? Asked Toga as Izuku frantically turned around to lock the door behind them. A dozen men dropped from the chopper. Stay close, Izuku, looks like we're fighting after all said Toga. As the police went to subdue the two, Izuku and Toga ran around him, one to the right, the other to the left. Luckily, Izuku still had his hoodie and face mask on so none of the cops could tell who he was. Instead, they prioritized Toga. After the girl, the cops yelled, running after her. However, one of the cops ended up getting knocked out by Izuku, taking advantage of the distraction to pull out a can of spray paint and a lighter. As one of the cops approached him, he retaliated by lighting him up on fire forcing him to tuck and roll around in pain. 
Meanwhile, two of the cops rushed at Toga, swinging at her with batons. However, they both missed, as Toga strafed past both of them, slitting their necks. However, a third one came after her with a taser, lunging at her. However, before making the full lunge, he was taken out from behind by Izuku, who took the taser from one of the fallen cops to knock him out. Thanks for the assist, said Toga. No problem, replied Izuku. As the two looked onward at the remaining cops, damn, there's still so many. Suddenly, what sounded like gunshots were heard, as one by one, the cops were shot down. The two looked around, trying to identify the new threat. Just then, Izuku heard a voice. Hey I see you bro, over here. Looking behind them, they saw Sachai, standing on the roof on the building across from them. Sachai, is that you? Asked Izuku. Darn straight. I came to save you. Boo what I got the wrong building, said Sachai. Hey wait, what's that girl doing there? Don't tell me you scored when I wasn't looking. I'll give you the details later. Now, we have to get the hell away from this place, replied Izuku, running towards him. However, once they reached the edge of the building, Izuku's legs turned to jelly. What's wrong Izuku? Just get over here, said Sachai. Easier said than done Sachai. Izuku uttered in fear. Well you better hurry, the cops are breaking through the roof door, said Sachai, pointing to the door as it was being bashed down. Ik, Toga, do you know any other exit in this build before Izuku could finish? Toga jumped to the other side with ease. Looking at her in a flabbergasted way, Izuku dropped to his knees. Come on Izuku, if I can do it so can you, exclaimed Toga. We believe in you Izuku. Sachai yelled out. Looking back, the cops have broken through. Just then, Izuku's mind raced at 100 miles per hour. What could he do? Maybe he could just turn himself in and feign innocence. Or perhaps he could play dead. No, there were no other options. It was either get caught by the cops or a leap of faith. Then he remembered everything that led up to this moment. What Sachai said. You might die if you go down the villain path. He finally understood why Sachai was so worried about him. It was kinda obvious, but he let his own hubris get the better of him. Now, he finally realized how terrifying death was. Terrifying, since when was death terrifying to him? Certainly not when Katsuki threw him out the window. Heck, he nearly did swan dive off a building when All Might turned him down. So why? Why was death terrifying again? Izuku, Toga and Sachai cheered at once. Suddenly, it made sense. Death is only as scary as one would value his life. Before, no one but his mother even bothered if he breathed or not. But now, there are others who care for him now. Why did he become a villain? Because that is where he regained his will to live. And he wasn't gonna let a mere 7 meter gap stop him. So, he took two steps back, and then took a leap of faith. Time felt so much slower in the air. For a brief moment, he felt like he could fly. And just like that, reality came crashing down as he was off by half a meter as he fell off the building. Or so he thought. Got you. Looking back up, he saw both Sachai and Toga, grabbing him by both of his wrists, before pulling him back up. T thank guys. Izuku thanked the two, shooken, I thought I was gonna die. Suddenly, the two hugged him tightly. Thank god you're safe, said Sachai. Don't ever scare me like that again, okay, said Toga. Okay, thanks guys, said Izuku. Uh hey, we're not out of the frying pan just yet said Toga, pointing at the cops, who were still after them. Seeing this, the three ran off, as Sachai pointed them to the ladder he took to get to the roof. Using this, they reached ground floor in no time, finding themselves in an alleyway. The train station is just a couple minutes away. If we make it on the train, we can lose the cops, said Sachai. All right, then let's go, exclaimed Toga. Not so fast. As the three turned around, they found themselves surrounded by a bunch of cops. This is the end of the road. Villains, said one of the cops, we've called the pro-hero agencies. Once they arrive, there will be nowhere to run. Crap, we're surrounded, said Izuku. Anyone got any ideas? Well, said Sachai, there is still one way. Really, the two others said in unison. Allow me to explain. My quirk allows me to fire compressed kinetic energy from the tip of my fingers. But there's a limit to the amount of power each one of my fingers can output. Explained Sachai, I usually shoot with one finger, but if I fired two at once, my power output doubles, and if I use three, it triples. Fire all five of my fingers at once and I can create a blast strong enough to propel all three of us several dozens of meters in seconds. Really? Then do it, said Toga. Here's the catch. My hands aren't built to handle this much power, so firing all five fingers at once will break my hand in doing so. Explained Sachai, thus, we only have two shots before I become completely useless. So what are you saying? Asked Izuku. Suddenly, Sachai grabbed both him and Toga, pulling them extremely close to him. So I'm telling you to hold on tight, yelled Sachai as he fired a massive blast out of his hand, creating an explosion that propelled them halfway across the street. Hell yeah, we lost them, said Toga. Why yeah yeah? Sachai winced in pain, as his hand was now in seven different shades of purple. Now let's run before the cops catch up, yelled Izuku, as the three got the hell out of Dodge before more cops could show up. 
After all of that mess, the three finally made it onto the train, heading back to Yokohama. Luckily, it was a Saturday, so the train cart they were in was empty. As Sachai was using the first aid kit from Izuku backpack to fix his broken hand, he accessed the situation. Well, we nearly died eight times today, sold nothing, nearly got caught by the cops and my hand looks like it's made of grape jelly, thought Sachai, and yet, despite all of this, looking in front of him, he saw Toga and Izuku, both asleep, one leaning on the other. I think this day was a major success. Four days have passed since Izuku started to get into the info broker business. Luckily, they had a month's worth of time with spring break around the corner. However, even with hyper hard to find leaked information, there were not many buyers. While Izuku did obtain a new party member, the crazed Yander Toga, their daily haul came barely at 5,000 yen. Another dead end weekend. Izuku was so exhausted that he just wanted to flop into bed, until the ringing of his doorbell caught his attention. Huh, who could it be at this time? Asked Izuku to himself. His mom just left doing groceries, meaning it couldn't have been her. Seeing no other possibilities, Izuku became weary that maybe the police have traced him down. Picking up a rolling pin from the kitchen, he cautiously approached the door. Looking at the peephole, he saw a very blurry outside. Curse you FedEx Izuku muttered, reminiscing back to a few months ago when their delivery guy slipped, his package scrapping against the door and ruining the peephole. Not wanting to take any chances, he opened the door slowly, his hand shaking as he was about to raise the rolling pin and attack the first person that came into view. However, that person lunged at him instead. Izuku, a voice yelled out. Gah, no, I didn't do it, I swear. Izuku cried out like a sissy. Do what silly, pirating animes online, asked a mocking voice at the doorstep. Sachai, Izuku asked, seeing him standing by the door, then you must be. Looking down, he saw Toga hugging his chest. His brain shut off for a sec, as it took him five whole seconds to realize he wasn't properly dressed and didn't even have his pants on. Nice underwear undies, by the way. Joked Sachai, staring at his underwear, which have the Japanese kanji for underwear written all over them, they go great with your t-shirt shirt. They're the only ones I had left after I threw out my All Might undies. Izuku retorted, with an embarrassed face. All Might undies, laughed Sachai, what are you, for? I think he'd look cute in them, muttered Toga, taking her time to gawk at Izuku in a loose shirt, something she always imagined in her sleep. So cute you w you so anyways, why are you two here? Asked Izuku, listen, while well you spent your mornings at school. We found a client that seems to be interested in you and what you do, said Sachai. Really? Asked Izuku. Yeah, he was really enthusiastic when I told him that you held tabs on the private info several different heroes. In fact, I was able to score you a meeting with him, said Sachai. Well, what are we waiting for? Let's get to it, said Izuku. Whoa whoa whoa, get dressed first jeez, said Sachai. All right right, get dressed, Izuku exclaimed, realizing that he still didn't have pants on, and that Toga was staring at him like a kid in a petting zoo. No no no, stay like this a little longer, Toga said as she pinched his cheeks. Her face tomato red, so soft. UWU Izuku let out a sigh, as he got up and walked towards his room. Give me a bit, my outfits just came out of the laundry, so it might take a while, but make yourselves at home in the meantime, said Izuku. Alright, give us a heads up when you finish putting on your pants pants and your coat coat, joked Sachai, picking up his sneakers, and don't forget your shoes shoes. He isn't letting that go is he? thought Izuku as he started to get changed. As the two others waited, Toga flopped onto the living room couch. So soft. Izuku really has it made, doesn't he? Asked Toga. You said it? Toga sis, a nice warm home, regular heating, said Sachai, drinking a can of beer he took from the fridge as he looked at a family photo framed near the sink, and a loving. Sachai's voice cut off as he saw the woman holding Izuku in the picture. Damn, is that his mom? said Sachai, leaning in at the picture. I envy whoever knocked her up cause she's sssss mockin', he said, pulling a very poor Jim Carrey impression. Gross, muttered Toga, lying upside down on the couch while looking at him. Looking closer at the picture however, he noticed that the supposed husband in the picture had his face cropped out. Whoever took this picture should be fired as a photographer, said Sachai out loud. Still, something about Inko just seemed so familiar with him, like he's seen her somewhere before. However, before he could think up of what, Izuku came out, fully dressed in his villain outfit. We're going, said Izuku, in annoyed matter. Izu bro, asked Sachai. I was kidding when I said wear your coat coat you know. Looking at Izuku, he was wearing a grey and bland looking hoodie with hoodie written on it. Izuku, what happened to the rabbit one? Asked Toga, not realizing that Izuku's original costume was supposed to be a palette swapped All Might hoodie. Apparently, cheap spray paint can't stand multiple washes. Now the hoodie's just a faintly blue and red mess, said Izuku, embarrassed, let's just go. As the two got up from where they were, Sachai took one look back at the picture. Something about it just didn't sit right with him. 
The building that Sachai indicated seemed to be a crowded office building of sorts. Seeing this, Izuku became skeptical. After all, they were villains, so there was no way that people like them can just operate broad daylight. And was the man they were gonna meet really someone they could trust? I'm not really sure about this Sachai, said Izuku, as they entered the building. Don't worry about it. I'm certain that there is a perfectly logical explanation to all this replied Sachai with confidence. Walking up to the receptionist, excuse me ma'am, we have an appointment at room C205. The receptionist gave him an annoyed stare. Uh, it's for a, uh, Mr. Joe Mother. Sachai continued. Nothing, just dead silence. Um, can you just point us to his office? He kept asking. Sir, C205 is our supply closet. Now please leave before I call security, said the receptionist in a monotone yet stern way. As the three exited the building, Sachai with a confused stare followed by Izuku and Toga giving him a mean look. Care to explain? Asked Toga. That patchwork bastard lied to me, exclaimed Sachai. However, upon yelling that out loud, laughter can be heard from the alley in between two buildings across the street. As the three approached to get a better view, they ran face first into a tall, lanky man in a black coat, wearing a plain white shirt underwear. But what was striking about him was the multitude of what looked like burned scars on his body, which made him look like a Frankenstein's monster-esque creature. I can't believe you actually fell for that. Man, that was golden. The man continued laughing. All right, Dabai, explain yourself. I thought we were gonna meet somewhere discreet, exclaimed Sachai. Well, is this place not discreet enough? Asked Dabai. Why the office then? Sachai yelled back. I dunno, just wanted to screw with you I guess. Joked Dabai. Anyways, that kid's your info broker, right? Why yeah, name's Mightless, by the way, said Izuku, extending his hand for a handshake. Oh, an alias but no masks. That's bossy, replied Dabai. No ma oh shit, thought Izuku, realizing that he forgot to wear his face mask. Uh, yeah, let's just say I'm not afraid to show my face. Izuku improvised. Now, you said you wanted to meet me. Indeed, replied Dabai. I need some private information concerning the pro hero Endeavor. The three stiffened upon hearing its name. Was this guy serious? Endeavor, the number two hero that has arrested more criminals annually than All Might and this guy who looks like he can't even lift 25 seconds without his arms snapping like twigs was after him. Why you can't be serious? exclaimed Izuku. Do you have his info or not? asked Dabai, more aggressively. Well, of course, hold on. Let me just see here, muttered Izuku, digging through his back. While Izuku was searching, Toga approached the man, examining him from head to toe like a curious child. So, what's the deal with you and Flamebeard? Asked Toga. It's none of your business blondie. I came for information about the hero, that's all you need to know. Said Dabai. You know he's like super duper strong right? He used to be rivals with All Might back in his high school years. Added Toga. If I were you, I'd want to stay as far away as possible from someone like him. I appreciate your concern. Which I personally find weird you're even concerned about someone like me. But it's really not what you think. My connections with Endeavor runs much deeper than your average grudge-driven criminal. Said Dabai. Much. Deeper. Toga muttered. Before blushing. A secret lover. You have a real vivid imagination, Toga sis. Said Sachai. Deducing what Toga was thinking. Here you go. Said Izuku. Handing Dabai a yellow file. Everything you need to know about Endeavor is here. Including his address, schedules, close relatives and their whereabouts. Potential weaknesses I mapped out and recommended support gears to buy. Thanks kid. Just what I needed. Said Dabai. Taking the file and walking off. Before getting blocked by Sachai and Toga. Hey. What's the big deal? You're supposed to pay for that, Dabai, said Sachai. This kind of info doesn't come free you know. This is a top hero who chooses to keep most of his info private, so such information will cost you quite a fortune. We recommend you pay up, buddy, added Toga, pulling out her knife. 4,000 to 0 yen, cash only. However, Dabai smirked in response to their threats. I figured as much, said Dabai, pointing his hand at them. Suddenly, Toga's naturally honed instincts sensed the feeling of imminent death as she quickly grabbed and pulled Sachai down. Look out! She yelled as the two narrowly dodged a cloud of blue flames flying right at them. Having dodged the flames, Sachai tackled Dabai, knocking further back into the alley. Looks like we got ourselves a tough customer Izu bro, said Sachai. What should we do with him? Asked Toga, looking at Izuku, still bewildered at the size of the fire. Subdue him, and squeeze the money out of him or destroy the info I gave him. Ordered Izuku, having a little more experience in the fields after four days. Dabai chuckled at their comment however, extending both of him hands at the three of them. I'd love to see you try and dodge this in such a narrow alleyway, said Dabai, releasing another massive blast of flame, get cremated. Seeing the massive cloud of flame, the three quickly scrambled, hiding behind a nearby dumpster to avoid the flames. Hod hod hod, exclaimed Sanchai. As he barely dodged the flame blast, which set his butt on fire as he dipped it in a dirty water puddle, gross gross gross. 
Damn, he's tough. We have to think of something to make sure he doesn't get away. Any ideas Toga? Asked Izuku, only to realize Toga wasn't with them. Toga. Suddenly, ten feet above the cloud of blasted flames, Toga descended, dropkicking Dabai and making him do a full backflip before tumbling over, falling flat on his stomach. Pinning him down, she pulled out a knife, ready to stab him. I wonder what your blood's gonna taste like, she said, flashing her signature smile. However, Dabai's palms directed themselves at her, firing out a blast of flames which caught her off guard, setting her cardigan on fire. However, without dropping composure, she stripped herself from her flaming cardigan, leaving only her bra to cover up her top. As she tossed the flaming piece of cloth back at Dabai, hoping to set him on fire, only for the man to burn it to ashes as the fire then continued its journey towards her. Luckily, Izuku came lunging out of hiding, tackling her out of the way of the flames. Are you okay to GAH? Izuku asked, before realizing where he had groped Toga. Looking down at his hands on her slightly plump chest, Toga's face turned red for a bit before she grabbed him by the neck. Let go, she said sternly as Izuku quickly got off her, only to narrowly dodge another blast of flames coming their way. Just then, Sachai popped out of cover, using two fingers instead of one to fire a powerful charged shot at Dabai. However, the target simply waved his hand, creating a wall of flame, incinerating the energy bullet before it could touch him. These guys, muttered Dabai, they're not half bad. Izuku, you have a plan, asked Toga, getting up. Turning to Sachai, the man immediately got the message. Look, that was a one-time thing. Do you have any idea how long it took for me to recover last time I did it? Sachai immediately replied. The two didn't drop the stare, as Sachai cracked pretty much immediately from peer pressure. You owe me a bubble tea, said Sachai, as Dabai fired his strongest flame blast yet. Facing the fire blast, Sachai extended his left hand, as the tip of his five fingers started to emanate a red glow. Suddenly, a huge blast of energy came from all five fingers at once, once again breaking Sachai's entire hand as the attack punched a hole through Dabai's flames, even knocking him off balance in the process. My attack was overpowered. Dabai exclaimed, no matter, I'll just. Suddenly, two knife came flying through the flames before Dabai could fire again, stabbing into his hands, making him wince in pain. Just then, Izuku came charging through the hole Sachai made, pushing him down and pinning him to the ground. Just then, Sachai came in, pointing his right index finger at Dabai while Toga pulled out her knives launched in Dabai's hands. It's over, now pay up, exclaimed Izuku, as Toga went to check on Sachai's broken hand. That looks painful, she said nonchalantly. Actually, it feels great, you should try it sometimes, replied Sachai sarcastically. Dabai let out a small chuckle, as his one free arm reached into his pocket. Sorry, I never had any to begin with, replied Dabai, revealing his pocket was empty. In awe, Izuku turned to Toga. Take my files back. We got another wise guy who thought he could get away with stealing from us, replied Izuku. However, as Toga grabbed the file, a piece of paper fell out. Picking it up, she read it out of curiosity. Taoya Todoroki, missing since age 12, the eldest son of the Todoroki family. However, reading it out loud seemed to give Dabai a sudden boost in power, as he easily overpowered Izuku, before running to grab the files. The files, give them to me, Dabai exclaimed, firing a flame blast out of desperation. However, due to the stab wound in his hand, the aim of his flames were off, as it barely grazed Toga and burned the files instead. Seeing this, Dabai's face shifted into despair. N-O-O-O. He cried, as he tried to grasp onto the burning pages, as they slowly turned to ash. Despaired and broken, the man collapsed, as tears gushed out of his eyes, as he desperately scooped up the ashes of the former files together, trying to somehow assemble the ashes back into its original form, but in vain. Seeing this, Izuku and Toga decided it was best to just leave the man be, as whatever it was that he wanted to know from those files have long been lost to his own flames. However, as the two were about to leave, Sachai stepped up to him, as he helped the man pick up whatever scraps of paper that were sparred from the initial fire blast. Sachai, what are you doing? Let's go, said Toga. Toga, wait, look at what's doing, said Izuku, interested in what was happening. So, uh, how's your mom been? Taoya, asked Sachai. Suddenly, everyone else's eyes widened in shock at Sachai's comment. H how did you know it was me? Asked Dabai. I had a hunch, replied Sachai. Remember when we initially met? Flashback. It was at a night bar near the lesser populated parts of Yokohama. During the day, the place is a popular ramen shop that's often at max capacity. At night, the bars were often populated by escaped convicts or villains who were yet to be caught. Sachai came in, like any other day, as he was a regular at the bar. Two cans of Corona beer and some of your house's famous room raisin cake. 
ordered Sachai. Coming right up buddy, said the bartender, a broad, well-built, strong-looking fellow with a thick brown beard which reinforces his intimidating appearance and covered in scars, cakes on the house. Thanks Tom, replied Sachai, downing his beer. I heard your little bro's going through another surgery, said Tom. Are you sure you can afford the bills this time around? Maybe if you gave me the beers for free, joked Sachai. I gonna make a living somehow my friend, replied Tom, laughing you're not the only one that needs money. Says the man with a bank vault door as a wall ornament. Sachai retorted. My days of robbing banks and contract killing are far behind me, Sachai. Replied the bar owner. You must know, illegal money won't last you your entire life. Eventually, even the greatest villain have to have a retirement plan. But once you reach that point, no hero will be coming after you, so that's at least a plus. I'm not gonna do this forever Tom. Once my brother's finally fully recovered, we'll escape this country to prevent facing trial and maybe get a job outside of Japan replied Sachai. However, as he said that, a man, aged in his early twenty, with scars which could make Tom's look cute, came sitting next to him, overhearing their conversation. Having a brother sure is rough, isn't it? He asked. Huh? Asked Sachai. I mean, you have to look after him. He hogs up your parents' attention to the point where it's like you don't exist anymore and there's always this sense of obligation that forces you to take care of them, added the man. Well, I can see where you're coming from but, in the end of the day, no matter how annoying they might get, no matter how much attention they sponge up or how tiring they are to look after, you love them all the same, isn't that so? Finished the man. Sachai froze for a minute, before taking another gulp of his beer. Yeah, you're right, replied Sachai. And when they're no longer with you, despite everything they did to annoy, piss off or tire you, you feel an indescribable emptiness when they're gone. The man chuckled at his comment. My little brother's gonna start high school next year. Said the man, I heard he was going to you a super prestigious hero school. What? No way. That's awesome. I'll drink to that. Sachai exclaimed, finishing what was left of his first can. You must be filled to the brim with pride. Yeah, I just wish I could be there to cheer him on. Replied the man. Family issues? Asked Sachai. Oh, you have no idea. Replied Dabai. So, what's your little brother like? Suddenly, Sachai pulled out a massive photo album as his eyes shone brightly like the sun. So, first, here he we see him on his first day at elementary. Look at him. Isn't he just so, uh, so precious? Sachai quickly started to describe. Dear God he has a brother complex, thought Dabai, as a massive drop of sweat ran down his face. And here he is at the piano recital. He won second place. Second, among a crowd of 150 students and he won second. I still can't forget his face full of pride and happiness. I tell you, he used to smile so much before the Suddenly, Sachai stopped. Well, it's kinda hard to explain. You see, my mom and dad's quirk were so different that it affected their genetics to the point where they developed selective fertility, a disease which makes people unable to give birth to healthy offspring unless they have compatible quirks. As a result, my little brother was born with a tumor that was initially unnoticeable. However, that tumor just kept growing and growing and his story was however cut short by the sound of snoring, as it was revealed that Dabai fell asleep halfway through his presentation of his brother. Tom on the other hand, was on his last box of tissue paper. Wake up, Sachai yelled, pissed off. Huh, wah, geez, what year is it? Asked Dabai. Oh right, you were talking about your brother. Forget it, said Sachai. All you need to know is that I need money for my brother's surgery, that's all. And how do you plan on getting that money? Asked Dabai. Oh, I'm glad you asked. Believe it or not, I'm actually working with an info broker, said Sachai. Info broker, asked Dabai, as in those guys who sells private information about company secrets to other companies for profit. I thought Jern monopolized that business years ago. Well this kid sell private information about heroes, replied Sachai, so, there's that. Wait, heroes, asked Dabai. Yeah why, asked Sachai. Does he have any info about Endeavor, asked Dabai. Well, I think so, replied Sachai. Dabai took out a random card and wrote an address on it. Meet me tomorrow at one in this area, said Dabai. The name's Dabai, by the way. End of flashback. The missing brother, the younger one heading to UA, family issues, the clues add up, explained Sachai. Now tell me, am I correct? Dabai nodded sadly. I see. So I assume you just wanted revenge of your pops, asked Sachai. No, what I want has nothing to do with him, said Dabai. Then tell me what you came to us for, said Dabai. We'll help, for free. The Yokohama Psychiatric Ward received quite a curious visitor today. A man covered in scars. Despite his appearance however, the man seemed quite tame, as he asked the receptionist about a certain patient, Rei Todoroki. She's in room D225. Are you perhaps a relative? Asked the receptionist. Yeah, you could say. Replied Dabai. Name? Asked the receptionist. Taoya, Taoya Todoroki. Replied the man. However, as the receptionist typed the name in, her face furrowed. There's no one registered under that name. 
Are you sure you didn't mispronounce sir? Asked the receptionist. However, upon looking up, the man was gone. Worried, the woman pulled out her phone, security. As Dabai walked down the halls, he came to the door of his mom's room. There she was, staring blankly out the window, her tray of food still on her bed, untouched. Nervous feeling bubbled up, as he wanted to leap at her, arms out, and hug her with all of his love. But as she turned around, all that came out of her mouth was, who? A sense of dread washed over the man, as he security made its way onto the floor he was at. Unable to hold back his tears, Dabai ran, leaving a wet trail of droplets behind him. One of the security officers turned to Ray. Are you alright Miss Todoroki? Asked the officer. The women stood silently, until, for a brief moment, her eyes flashed with life. Two, yeah. So this entire time, Dabai just wanted to know where Endeavor hit his mother. Asked Toga. He never made the hospitalization of his wife public. With how many hospitals there were in Yokohama alone and with how often the Todoroki family tends to move, finding her would be like looking for a needle in a haystack. Replied Sachai. This is wrong, said Izuku. Saddened by what he heard no one should ever have hid their own mother from their child. I actually feel really horrible for him now. If only there was some way I could apologize to him. Apology accepted. Replied a fourth voice. Dabai, asked Sachai. I got what I came for. I can now visit my mom whenever I want now. Replied Dabai. Walking up to Izuku. Kid, you helped me find my mother and allowed me to know that she was in somewhere safe, away from my terrible dad and to visit her whenever I want. I cannot thank you enough. Well, all in a day's work, I guess. Replied Izuku, flattered. So, what's gonna happen to you now? Asked Toga, now that you got what you wanted. I want to free my little brother. Replied Dabai. Endeavor has been abusing him since childhood. I tried to save him once, and got myself killed for that. But now, I have you guys. What are you suggesting here? Asked Sachai. That whatever you guys are doing, I'm in. Replied Dabai. Yippee. Our party grows bigger. Replied Toga. Wait, you're serious? Asked Izuku. Why? Are you turning me down? Asked Dabai. No, of course not. Welcome aboard Dabai. Said Izuku. And with that, Dabai joined the party. I think this calls for a celebration. Replied Sachai, come. I know a great ramen place 20 minutes from here. You mean at Tom's? Asked Dabai. Tom, Toga and Izuku asked. Trust me, you'll love it. Replied Sachai, as the four walked off. And an extra large tonkatsu ramen for you. Said Tom in a deep, early voice. Thank you. Smiled Izuku, slightly intimidated by the chef, bartender's appearance. This is so good. Toga exclaimed, slurping down her rare beef ramen. Glad you like it little girl, replied Tom, passing her and Izuku in glass of milk, and this is on the house. Who do you take us for? The two growled, feeling insulted from the man's offer. So, that's a no, asked Tom, backing away slowly. Are you kidding me? Asked the two, gulping the milk down in unison, of course not. Who would pass off a free drink? While that happened, Dabai and talked to Sachai about their business practices. No support gear, asked Dabai. Well there's your problem. Info brokers have to sell alternative products buddy. Doesn't that kinda defeat the purpose? Asked Sachai. Yeah, but info brokers will never make it far from selling just information. You need weapons buddy, weapons. Replied Dabai. Well we're down on luck then. Replied Sachai. Picking up Izuku backpack and unloading it onto the counter, the only thing you'll find here is paper, pens, some makeshift weapons anything store-bought can replace and, suddenly, an old rag that looks like it was a former wallet fell out from the back. This, thing, asked Sachai. Oh that, asked Izuku. That's just the wallet from some sludge villain I grabbed by accident. You stole a wallet, asked Sachai, sorting through it. At least check it for valuables. I did, replied Izuku. And all there was in there are old coins, expired coupons and some weird business card. However, looking closer at the business card, Sachai noticed something on the back. Izu bro, there's an address on the back. Intrigued, Izuku took a look at the back. Indeed, there it was, an address. Where do you think it leads to? Asked Dabai. I dunno, replied Izuku. Let's go check it out. Ooh, this is exciting, said Toga. It's like a treasure hunt. As they left the ramen place, Tom looked at the four of them walking off, smiling. Haven't had such nice customers in years. Tom said to himself, usually, at this hour, that asshole would come in and... Oi fuckbeard, extra spicy judon, extra large. Gail Katsuki, another regular of the shop, who just barged in by kicking the door open. Here we go again, thought Tom, rolling his eyes. Right away, replied Tom. And may I interest you in today's specialty, the Prozac pot? Are we there yet, Izuku? We've been walking for hours, Toga exclaimed. Almost there, replied Izuku. All right, so according to Yugle Maps, poor destination should be coming up re- Here, kid, that's an abandoned clinic, said Dabai. The four's high hopes were immediately shot down. Then again, what were they expecting from an address coming from a homeless guy's wallet? For all they knew. It was the address for his crack den. 
Just then, Sachai went in. Sachai, where are you going? Asked Izuku. I came all the way out here. Results must be yielded damn it. Replied Sachai. Now come on. We got some exploring to do. Is he okay? Asked Toga. No, pretty sure he's dead. Replied Dabai. Welp, time to fish out the corpse then. Added Izuku. Heading in, followed by everybody else. Sachai. You there? Asked Izuku. Suddenly, laughter can be heard deep down in the abandoned clinic. Sachai, are you okay buddy? Did you hit your head somewhere? Asked Toga. Guys, come down here. You have to see this. Yelled Sachai's voice. As the three ran deeper into the clinic, finding a flight of stairs, they ran down it, only to find a dead end. Guys, I have a bad feeling about this. Said Izuku, scared. What's wrong? Afraid of the dark? Asked Toga, clutching tightly onto Izuku, cause I'm super afraid. This can't be right. Sachai's voice came from right here. Where is he? Asked Izuku. Suddenly, hands came out of the walls, slowly creeping towards Izuku. However, Dabai saw them just in time. Izuku, look out! Exclaimed Dabai, trying to punch one of the hands, only to lose balance and falls forward. However, instead of falling face first into the wall, he phased right through, finding himself face to face with Sachai, as well as falling on top of him. Sachai, asked Dabai. I am so glad you didn't set me on fire replied Sachai, in cold sweat. Izuku and Toga followed, only to see the two on top of each other. Uh, I'll leave the two of you alone, they said, slowly sinking back into the fake wall. Wait, guys, you have to see this first, said Sachai, getting up and heading to a light switch, pulling it, voila. Suddenly, the dark room became illuminated, revealing shelves after shelves of different gadgets, equipment, weapons and other support gear. What the hell? What is all this? exclaimed Izuku. I know right, we came across the jackpot exclaimed Sachai. This place, it has to be some sort of storage unit for support gears. But, why isn't it empty? And why a clinic? Asked Dabai. I dunno. But either way, it seems as though we've found our products to sell. Said Sachai. Come on, grab a crate. We'll pick this place dry. As everyone started to sort through the different support gears, as well as trying a few out, Izuku noticed that the boxes had a symbol on them. Looking closely, he was able to find the word Blue Jay written on each box. Blue Jay, Izuku muttered, looking through his phone. However, the search result shocked him to the core. A hero support gear company that closed its doors after then sudden death of its CEO and founder Hisashi Midori Adat. Two groups chattered under the light of a dark warehouse. On one end was a young boy whose face was hidden by a face mask with an upside-down smile while wearing a modified All Might hoodie who's been spray-painted into black and red, while on the other end was a group of hardened, seasoned thugs, ready to take on any heroes by any means necessary. As their business talk came to a close, the boy pulled out a briefcase, filled with high-grade weapons. Here, the vault breakers, like you asked, thou, the payment, said the boy. The leader, a man nearly 15 feet tall, picked up the gear, inspecting it. He smiled. I'm not gonna lie, these gears are impressive, said the villain, but here's the thing. You see, the whole reason why we're doing this robbery is because we're short on cash, so we won't be able to pay you just yet. However, there's only one of you and nine of us, so it's not like you have the say in the deal to begin with. Implying, asked the boy, that's we won't pay you a dime. Ahaha, <laughs> laughed the leader, as the rest of his goons laughed with him. I figured as much, said the boy, walking off, deal with them. Suddenly, two shadows zoomed by the group, as four of the nine villains collapsed with their necks slit. In shock, the rest banded together. What the heck was that? exclaimed the leader. Suddenly, what sounded like gunshots rang throughout the warehouse as one of the villain were riddled with holes. He had backup. That bastard. After him, yelled the leader as he and his last two partners charged at Izuku. Just then, a lanky man emerged from the shadows between the two group, extending his palms at the group. Suddenly, a blast of blue flames erupted from his palm. The villains tried to run, but found themselves stuck together from whatever reason. As the room lit up briefly, the last thing the villain leader saw were all the men who were seemingly working for that boy, casually sitting on nearby furniture and boxes, before the flames engulfed what was left of his group. As the flames cremated his flesh, he remembered one last warning that the man who recommended the vendor to him told him prior to these events. And whatever you do, never pick a fight with Mightless. He may look weak, but no one who's tried to double-cross him came out unscathed. While initially he brushed off the warning, Thinking that all the things he heard of the mysterious vendor were rumors, he now realized that in the end, he should have listened. Not that it would help him currently anyway, as his life shortly ended afterwards as his charred remains were approached by a masked gentleman-looking fellow, whom compressed the corpses into pearls and tossed them out the window and into the river. Twice, final tally of the day, said Izuku. Boss, we're rich, we earn jack shit exclaimed a man in gray spandex. I'm starting to wonder why I gave left you in charge, Izuku commented, as he took off his mask. 
In the following weeks of business, Izuku saw his group growing larger and larger over time, with his work finally yielding noticeable results. He managed to build a formidable reputation in the criminal underworld. Heroes started to lose more and more frequently, and more and more people are flocking to him to seek gear and information. As of the day Dabai joined, he was able to acquire four new members to the team. Well, with that mess out of the way, I think we should call it a day, said Spinner, a lizard man whom Izuku encountered before in the past. Now, I know this awesome new arcade down the street, if any of you wanna come hang out. I was actually kinda hoping to go to a bar, said Magni, a former woman who transitioned, charged with several cases of attempted murder and two cases of actual murder on paper, of which one was self-defense and the other she was framed. I mean, you two could go to your separate desired places. Once you're off duty, I don't care what happens to you said Izuku, before Dabai smacked him in the back of the head. Too soft. Izuku, you're being way too soft on your men, said Dabai. If you're gonna lead us, then act like a competent leader. You're being too hard on him Dabai, exclaimed Sachai, patting Izuku on the head. He's only 14 and still leading a double life as a normal middle schooler, give him a break. I think he's doing an excellent job. Oh boy, here we go again, commented Toga, as she leaned against the wall, watching the two argue. Are they always like that? asked Mr. Compress, their most recent member. Oh yeah they do, replied Toga. While anorexic Frankenstein monster over here wants Izuku to man up and stand up for himself more, Oni-chan Sachai over here acts like a doting big brother and just flat out wants to spoil him rotten. I keep telling you, he's not your little brother, exclaimed Dabai. He started this whole thing, so it's his responsibility to own up. He recruited us because he can't do this alone. It's our duty to support him, replied Sachai. And in turn, it's his duty to support us, yelled Dabai. Guys, well I think he's doing a pretty good job at it, retorted Sachai. Guys, if he was, he would have made his own decision. So what's it gonna be? Bar or arcade? exclaimed Dabai. Everyone's already gone for the arcade, said Izuku. What? exclaimed Dabai. Yeah, they discussed things amongst each other and decided that since we usually hang out at Tom's, who's pretty much a bar, we could try something new. Sachai flashed a smug smile at Dabai proving him that the group has enough self-autonomy and that he was wrong about how hard Izuku needed to get. Well for the record, I would have chosen the bar, exclaimed Dabai, stomping off. Like what most people imagined, the arcade was bustling with people. Luckily, no one in the group are very well known when it came to being villains, so no one really bothered with most of the group, besides Dabai that was. While Spinner and Izuku were having the time of their lives taking each other on at Street Fighter 20, while Toga watched while acting as Izuku's cheerleader, Magni met up with Mr. Compress, now without the ridiculous outfit, at the snack bar. Welcome to the team, buddy. She greeted, so, how's it been so far? Honestly, surprising, replied Mr. Compress. This Izuku kid really knows his stuff when it comes to heroes. Honestly, I'm amazed he's even a villain. Guess villains come in all shapes and sizes nowadays, said Magni. In fact, I've heard rumors going around about a kid with a toxic gas quirk who got back at his bullies by gassing his entire classroom and shooting up the knocked out corpses with his dad's revolver. And get this, he's only 12. No way, you're messing with me, laughed Mr. Compress. No really, it's true. The news covered the story and everything. There was also rumors about this German chick who's kidnapped 17 different people who's currently in this town continued Magni. According to analysts, she was a spoiled brat whom saw people like objects and kidnaps them to add to her collection. Apparently, when her parents disowned her, she made them disappear and inherited all their possessions and money, which she utilizes to kidnap more people. Also, I heard that she's secretly an alien and that she has 12 eyes and there she goes, bloating rumors again just to mess with people, said Dabai, joining in on the conversation. Hey, if you're gonna exaggerate stories, at least make them believable. Twelve-eyed aliens, who's gonna believe that? Aliens? No way. I knew Area 51 was hiding something. Those damn dirty amazing Americans, exclaimed twice, buying everything Magni just said. Well, besides complete meatheads, how did Dabai? How do you even know she's lying? I mean, the alien part. If she comes here illegally, she's technically an alien, and with quirks nowadays giving people waffle irons for eyelids, twelve eyes is plausible, exclaimed twice, pointing to a guy a few feet away with waffle irons for eyelids. Look, all I'm saying is unless that girl you speak of shows up behind me with her twelve eyes, I'm not gonna gah, said Dabai, only to come face to face with a twelve-eyed monster of sorts. Gyah, it was all true. Please don't lay eggs in me, twice screeched, falling off the chair. Just kidding, it's me guys, said Sachai, popping out behind the giant plushie. See, what did I tell ya? said Dabai, 
Oh, by the way, I want you to meet Irina. She's apparently a tourist from Germany, said Sachai, moving to the left a bit to reveal a woman in her early 20 seconds, with long silky black hair and chestnut brown eyes, who was pressing against him, her hands firmly gripped to the giant plush toy he was holding. Sachai, for the last time, give me that plushie. She exclaimed, I want it fair and square. Now, I specifically remember you dumping 50 of your coins into that claw machine and failing to win anything, replied Sachai. Then what happened? Oh right, I came in like need help, and got it first try. W well yeah, but I paid more than you, so I'm entitled to it, retorted Arena. Plus, I was the one who made the thing so big with my quirk. That's got to give me some rights to hold it. Well, here's the deal, you cuddle it on one end, and I'll cuddle it on the other, replied Sachai. How's that? No, I want all of it, said Arena. Her grip getting more and more firm, seeing her struggling, Sachai let out a small laugh. I'm just messing with you. Here you go, said Sachai, letting go. However, in doing so, Irina fell back, as all the resistance that forced her to pull back harder vanished all at once. Just then, Sachai dashed in, catching her before she hit the floor. Whoa there, close one, laughed Sachai awkwardly. Maybe I should have warned you that I was letting go. However, the two suddenly realized how close they were to each other, as they both saw the rest of the group watching them in awe. Suddenly, Irina's face turned bright red. Dummy, she muttered. Huh, asked Sachai. Dummy, she yelled, slapping Sachai in the face before stomping off with the giant plushie that she won, leaving the guy with a bright red hand-shaped mark on his face. Well, that went well, said Sachai optimistically, rubbing his newly formed bruise. Sachai, who is that girl and where'd you meet her? Asked Magni. Oh, I was at Tom's a week ago when I bumped into her. She looked new around so I decided to approach her. Apparently, she was a tourist and wanted me to show her around town. Of course, being the nice guy that I was, I accepted. Then she tried to kidnap you, said Dabai. How'd you know? Asked Sachai, surprised. Just a hunch, he replied. Well give your hunch a raise cause he was right on the money. Next thing I know, I was shrunk down to the size of an action figure and put into a bag. Apparently she was gonna add me to her collection. How terrible, said Dabai. So, how'd you escape? Unless you're dead and we're talking to your corporeal ghost. Well, let's just say the 1% are assholes, answered Sachai. What do you mean? Asked Magni. Turns out her whole life, everyone only valued her for her monetary value. Even her own parents didn't see her as a person, but as a vessel for their money. And apparently when you don't get treated like a human being, you don't know how to treat other like human beings. So, let's just say when I showed sympathy and compassion to her, through a jar, she just couldn't process things and just broke. Explained Sachai. She freed me, but I felt kinda bad knowing I was the first person to ever show kindness to her, so for the moment, we are kinda dating. So, does she know what you do? Asked Dabai. She knows everything. Replied Sachai. I kinda spilled had to spill the beans to connect to her more. You know, you're a criminal, I'm a criminal, birds of a feather kind of deal. Hearing this, Dabai rubbed his forehead in frustration. And what makes you think she won't tell anyone about this? Asked Dabai. Come on Dabai, don't be so paranoid. She has nothing to gain turning us in. Geez, I swear, you can be such a buzzkill sometimes. Said Sachai. We did our job for the day, now's the time to have fun. Anyways, I've had enough rest. I'm gonna go see if anyone's topped my dance dance guitar hero high score in the 10 minutes I was gone. I swear, I feel like the only professional around here at times. We're supposed to be a serious group of villains, yet we have no established leader, no base of operations and no group name. Dabai grunted. Meanwhile, with Sachai, as he approached a gathered crowd of people, he noticed a pink blur on the DDGH machine he topped, shuffling to the front of the crowd. His jaw was left agape as not only has his high score had been beaten, but it's been doubled over. Go Mina, you're on fire today. Some of the people cheered. Who is she? Asked Sachai. Just a regular at this arcade. She shows up every now and then, gets a new high score at every rhythm game, buys a drink and leaves. People call her Pinky, because when she plays, most people just see a pink blur, said a bystander. As the song finished, Mina took a drink out of her bottle, as a few of her friends clapped for her. That was awesome Ashido-san, exclaimed one of her friends. I think you just set a personal record. Aw, oh, stop it guys, you're flattering me, Mina sheepishly replied. I didn't even think a score of 9, 999, 999 was even possible, said Sachai, walking in, you're good. Thanks, it's a hobby of mine, replied Mina. Hey, aren't you the guy who had the previous high score? Asked one of the bystanders. Man, you must feel pretty bad getting beat by a middle schooler. Well, your score certainly looks hard to beat, said Sachai, taking off his coat, for an amateur. The crowd grew larger, as more and more commotion stirred. Is that a challenge? Asked Mina, grinning. If that's what you want. Replied Sachai, I'll play. All right then, said Mina, taking a 10-0 yen bill and placing it on the machine. You're on. 
Meanwhile, while Izuku was taking a leak at the bathroom, he noticed a dark figure approach him from the bathroom mirror. Quickly turning around, he noticed a cloud of black mist. Upon closer inspection, he realized that that mist was actually a person. I take it you must be mightless, said the mist. Who are you and how did you get here? Asked Izuku, quickly putting on his mask to hide his identity. My name is. Suddenly, the bathroom door opened, as the misty figure disappeared in an instant. Some dude came in, took a piss, then went to the sink next to Izuku, washing his hands. Nice mask, kid, said the guy. There's these two guys, squaring off at the DDGH machines. They've already played six rounds and are still at a stalemate. You should check it out. As he left, the misty figure returned. Let's take this somewhere more private, shall we? Asked the figure, as he wrapped himself around Izuku before he could protest. As the dark mist clouding his vision dissipated, Izuku found himself in a bar somewhat similar to Tom's, but a tad smaller. At the corner of the bar, he noticed a man with light blue hair covered in hands, which he almost chuckled at due to how ridiculous he thought the costume looked. Alright, if this is about that Kink Kingdom membership submission, I clicked the wrong accept button when pirating anime movies, okay. Laughed Izuku. No but really, what is all this? I hate this kid already, muttered the blue-haired hand man. Give him a chance Shigaraki, said the Black Mist. If we want to successfully kill All Might, we need more recruits. Upon hearing this however, Izuku laughed even harder. K kill All Might. PFF 2 TT. What, are you gonna choke him with your 16 different hands? I swear, I've heard some of the wildest claims from clients in my last few weeks of operation but this takes the cake. Shigaraki became more and more irritated, as the glass he was holding crumbled to sand. Allow us to introduce ourselves first, said the Black Mist. My name is Kurajiri, this is Shigaraki, and we are the League of Villains. League, unless the rest of you are all hiding underneath the bar counter, I'd call this more of a duo than anything. Izuku said, jokingly. That's exactly why we need you. A third voice came from the TV. Oh, and sorry for the late introduction, I am all for one, the leader of the League of Villains. My pleasure, replied Izuku. Anyways, please elaborate. How are you planning to kill All Might? I suggest looking behind you replied all for one. Behind me G.A.H. Izuku wondered, only to realize the 15 feet tall Goliath standing behind him. This is a Namu, a genetically engineered artificial human with multiple quirks. I made him specifically to combat All Might, explained all for one, and furthermore, we have intel of a very crucial weakness that All Might possesses. That last bit of information intrigued Izuku. For a good while, he was certain that he was the only one who knew about All Might's weakness. But after seeing that Namu and the reveal that these people might know the weakness, Izuku started to take these people a lot more seriously. So, this weakness, what exactly is it? Asked Izuku, playing dumb. We could tell you, if you consider joining us. Said All for One. A bluff, is this what it's all about? Asked Izuku. The three villains let out a noticeable gasp of shock. If you know about me, then you must know that I deal in business, explained Izuku, trying to squeeze the info out of the group, and from experience, I can tell when someone is trying to con others to join them. Anyone can just say they know of All Might's weakness. Heck, I've seen people use that sort of stuff as YouTube clickbait. If you're just trying to recruit thugs, I can definitely see Dimwits joining your ranks as disposable cannon fodder, but I'm smart enough to see that you want more than just another troop on the front line when you sent your goons to recruit me. That being said, I'm not convinced that you know All Might's weakness and thus, I see no reason why I should help you in your quest. Of course, we can still do business, I can never turn down a potential client after all. The three villains were at awe at the brilliance of Izuku, however, All for One let out a small chuckle. I understand, you're not convinced, said All for One, however, I also know that you're quirkless. I never hid that fact, so no surprise there, replied Izuku. What if I told you I can give you a quirk? Asked All for One, and not only that, but a powerful one, one that can help you finally get revenge on the ones that wronged you. Izuku froze. Why you're bluffing? There's no way that's possible. I have created that Namu, have I not? What makes giving a living human being a quirk impossible if even that was possible? Asked All for One. Upon hearing this, Izuku took a seat, now very interested in the whole situation. After all these years, discriminated for not having a quirk. The idea of finally getting one and using it for revenge got Izuku extremely excited. You know, I have a burning hatred towards All Might as well, said Izuku, and I just so happen to also know his weakness. You do, asked All for One, shocked. Indeed, replied Izuku, but there are also a handful of things I don't know about All Might, but a handful of things I do know that may help your cause. So, I suppose that means that you're joining, asked All for One. Yes, but on three conditions, replied Izuku. I'm listening, replied All for One. No civilian deaths, said Izuku. They are not part of anything. To me, only the guilty deserve death. A sense of justice, scoffed Shigaraki. How annoying. He sounds almost like that stained fellow we tried to recruit four days ago, 
Secondly, I get free reign over my own operations, and only take orders if they're from you. Added Izuku. Anything planned by Shigaraki goes by me first. Explained all for one, so technically, any of his orders are my orders too. Fine, said Izuku. And your third condition? Asked Izuku. I get to bring my own crew, said Izuku. A few moments later, the rest of Izuku's group showed up at the hideout. So this is the place, said Dabai. It's quaint. Yes, very. Very cool, said Sachai, his eyes cloudy and gray. What's up with Sachai? Asked Magni. He lost 10 zero yen to some girl at the arcade, replied Toga. Think he's really not taking that loss very well. By 10 points, Sachai muttered. Only 10 points. So, is Stain here? Asked Spinner. It's just these guys, explained Izuku. What? What kind of bullshit league is this then? False advertising. I'm accusing you of false advertising. As the group got settled in however, Kurajiri noticed Shigaraki feeling unwell. Is everything alright Shigaraki? Asked Kurajiri. No it's not, exclaimed Shigaraki, silencing the group. I told you to recruit the best of the best, yet what do I get? A gaggle of college co-eds who's just made this place their new Starbucks. With all due respect, Mightless's gang has taken out countless powerful villain groups and heroes alike. They will be a great asset to the team, said Kirajiri. Besides, they've already struck a deal with All for One, so their stay is inevitable. I get to decide that, exclaimed Shigaraki. Namu, kill them. Suddenly, the Namu got up, slowly stomping towards the group. Hey, what gives? I totally expected this. Asked twice. You may have fooled Sensei, but he's not here to save your ass this time, Mightless, exclaimed Shigaraki. I'm the boss here. And I say that if you want to join us, then defeat this Namu. Upon hearing this, Sachai walked up confidently. That doesn't sound too bad, said Sachai. I mean, with all this bulk, he's probably as slow as a before he got to finish. A lighting fast jab connected with Sachai's face. If it weren't for Magni and Mr. Compressed to intervene by pulling Sachai back, his head would have been sent flying off his body. Holy cow that was a punch, uttered Sachai, bleeding from the nose. Everyone, get him exclaimed Izuku, as the group attacked all at once. Dabai let out a burst of flame, but the Namu weaved aside, swinging at Dabai with a left hook. Just then, Magni used her quirk to pull Dabai back, allowing him to dodge the swing. Toga then jumped in, using the giant arm as foothold to leap onto the ceiling, tossing a barrage of throwing knives at the Namu's exposed brain. However, the Namu raised his right arm to block the upcoming knives, leaving his stomach exposed. This allowed Izuku to dash in, holding a metal pipe, hitting the Namu with all of his strength. However, despite becoming a lot strongest these past few weeks from constant running, the attack stopped firmly, not even flinching the beast. Having noticed Izuku, the Namu grabbed him, tossing him at the wall. He's gonna splatter onto the wall, yelled twice in fear and excitement at the same time. Luckily, Mr. Compress made a hole appear in the wall before Izuku hit, as he flew outside, pressing on one of his belt's compartments. An air cushion expanded from his back, breaking his fall. I sure am glad I kept a handful of support gear on me, Izuku said to himself, as he saw the Namu break through the wall, chasing him. Just then, spinner between the two, as he swung his amalgamation of swords and knives at the Namu. However, the creature shattered the weapon with a swing of his fists, not even slowing down. Luckily, Toga jumped in just in time, grabbing Izuku and tackling him out of the way. He's tough, said Spinner, getting back up. None of our attacks are having any effect on him. Just then, a barrage of bullets impacted the Namu, as Sachai stood by the doorway. However, aside from a few burn marks, the attack was useless. Bullets aren't working either, said Sachai. Izuku, can you deduce this thing's weakness? Asked Toga. Yeah, just give me a minute, said Izuku, getting back up, surround the thing. It's time we show this hand fetishist how we handle threats got it. Everyone said in unison, as they surrounded the Namu like a pack of wolves. Dabai, unleash a massive cloud of fire to hinder the Namu's vision. Twice, make a few clones to distract the Namu. Compress, follow up by compressing the Namu's limbs once the fire clears up. Toga, spinner, use bladed weapons to keep the pressure on. It seems that he's only resistant to blunt object attacks. And Sachai, provide cover fire. Ordered Izuku. Dabai quickly fired a blast of flames at the Namu. Just then, the creature charged through the flames, its flesh singed, shattering Dabai in a single punch. However, he melted upon contact with the fist, as the real Dabai hit him from behind with an even bigger flame wall. Just then, spherical holes appeared in the flames, as Mr. Compress created a path through the torrent of blue fire to reach the Namu, planning on compressing him. However, the Namu saw the attack coming, attempting to swing at Mr. Compress. Just then, the beast felt a strong pull, as he was pulled back off balance, whiffing the attack by a hair. So this thing was originally male, said Magni, using her quirk on the creature, how gross, but unbalanced. Compress was able to reach the Namu's head, attempting to compress it. However, the beast twisted himself midair, as the magician got its shoulder instead. 
and the rest of the arm hit him like a baseball bat, sending him flying several feet away. We got its left arm disabled. Keep it up, exclaimed Izuku. However, just then, muscles and ligaments started to emerge from the wound, quickly repairing the Namu's lost shoulder. I almost forgot to mention. These Namu all have hyper-regeneration, laughed Shigaraki. Watching while holding a bucket of popcorn, along with enhanced stamina, it's an indestructible beast that won't fall. Ooh, I can't wait to see it tear you apart. Damn it, muttered Izuku. It's no good Izuku, exclaimed Spinner. Bladed weapons only leave shallow wounds. His skin is too thick. Toga ducked under another one of the Namu's punches, this time stabbing it between the legs. This thing must not feel pain, because even attacking its man weakness doesn't seem to do anything, said Toga as the creature swiped at her, ripping off one of her sleeves. Hands off. Damn it, muttered Izuku. So even if we manage to hurt it, it will just regenerate. No, it must have a weakness somewhere. Come on Izuku, you're our strategist. Surely you can think of something, said Sachai, firing several ineffective shots at the beast. I'm trying, but, said Izuku. Flank left, steel aggro, medic, Spinner exclaimed, as he dodged to the left, slashed the Namu in the forearms, which caused the Namu to retaliate, sending him flying into a wall with a backhand. I can't concentrate with Spinner making so many goddamn callouts, exclaimed Izuku. Stop acting like we're in A. Suddenly, Izuku froze, video game. Suddenly, Izuku slapped himself in the face. I'm such an idiot, said Izuku. He literally has a video game weakness and somehow I didn't notice. Wait, you figured it out, said Sachai. Well what do you think we should attack? Asked Izuku, pointing at the Namu's head. Sachai thought for a bit. The giant exposed brain. The giant exposed brain, exclaimed Izuku. Oh dear god, why are we so dumb? Asked Sachai as he fired a round which hit the Namu right in the brain. Just then, the beast roared in pain, as its movements became more and more sluggish. It's working, exclaimed Izuku. Everyone, go for the brain. Roger, everyone else said in unison. Twice pulled out his ruler blade, slashing at the Namu's leg. This caused the beast to turn around, allowing Toga to leap in and plant a knife in the beast's brain. Once again, the monster started to thrash around in pain, flailing its arms in every direction to keep its enemies at bay. However, Magni, Dabai, and Spinner hugged each other tightly as Magni used her quirk on Spinner and Dabai. Since her magnetism is influenced by gender, two males would repel from each other if she used her quirk on both of them. This allowed Spinner to get launched several stories up into the air as he charged straight down like an arrow, plunging his sword into the Namos. I, you missed, exclaimed Dabai. How can you miss? He was right there. H. Hey, it's not my fault, exclaimed Spinner, embarrassed. There wasn't any quick time events. Just then, the Namu shook Spinner off, as it charged at Dabai and Magni, the latter jumping into Dabai's arms in fear while the two screamed in fear. Just then, several blue pearls dropped from above, as they popped, exploding into blue flames. Those pearls contained the flames I compressed, explained Mr. Compress, how I managed to grab fire without getting burned. One of a magician's many tricks. As the Namu was buffered by the blue flames, Sachai ran in, jumping on the Namu's back, climbing onto its shoulders and pointing at the Namu's exposed brain. Now it's my turn to shine, exclaimed Sachai, get some. He unloaded several rounds into the Namu's brain, as the beast wailed in pain. However, no matter how hard the Namu tried, it wouldn't shake Sachai off. I'll have you know a true champion of dance dance guitar hero never loses his balance, exclaimed Sachai. As his was building up a three-finger shot, this next attack will be so strong it will blow your entire head off. Take OOF. Just then, the Namu ran himself into a wall, as Sachai's face came in contact with hard concrete, knocking him off the Namu. Sachai, everyone yelled, running towards him. However, the Namu stood right in front of him, still standing, but its injuries were no longer healing, as its brain was too damaged for the regeneration quirk to function properly. As it raised its arm however, another figure closed in, touching a protruding rebar, as the bar grew in length, piercing the Namu's arm and stopping it in its tracks. This allowed the newcomer to grab Sachai and pull him to safety. You always get yourself in trouble like this, asked the woman. What would have become of you without me? Rina, Sachai uttered out, what are you doing here? I, I was just passing by okay. She replied, it's not like I wanted to save you or anything. Don't tell me, he said, that you followed me all the way here. Irina blushed. I was worried about you okay. She exclaimed, when you told me you sold weapons and info to villains, all I could think of was you getting ripped apart out there. I mean, look at you. There's no way someone like you would have survived against a villain. It's your fault for dragging me into this mess. So take responsibility. Rina, I appreciate the help, but that thing you impaled is still alive and kicking, said Sachai, pointing behind her. Relax, I impaled it in the ligaments. No human would want to fight when they're in such pain, said Arena with confidence. Thing is, that thing's not human said Sachai, as the beast ripped the rebar out of its arms and it doesn't actually feel pain. 
Couldn't you have told me that sooner? Irina cried out as the two frantically scrambled out of the way of the Namu's descending fist. However, the Namu seemed to be on its last leg, as it was moving much slower now. However, with its muscles bulging, it was preparing for a final charge. Izuku, look out, it's coming for you, exclaimed Sachai. Shit, Izuku uttered out, as he tried to jump to safety. However, it was too late, as the Namu put the last ounces of its strength to dash at extreme speeds towards Izuku. Just then, Irina placed her palm on the ground, as a piece of road that was protruding from the ground grew in size, tripping the Namu up. This allowed Toga and Spinner to dash in, and using the Namu's accumulated momentum, slicing up the beast's legs, causing it to start rolling. Then came Dabai, or two Dabis, both blasting an equally powerful flame blast, burning up the Namu as it was steadily slowing down. With Magna's help, using her magnetism quirk to pull the Namu the opposite direction from where it was charging, the monster lost even more speed. And with Mr. Compress making the road extremely bumpy with his compression quirk, the charging beast finally came to a halt right in front of Izuku. We, we won, exclaimed Izuku. We did it. His group cheered. Izuku looked at Shigaraki, expecting him to be fuming with rage. However, just then, the cheers turned into frantic cries. While initially hard to make out, he suddenly heard Sachai, yelling louder than anyone else. I see you bro, look out. Turning around, the Namu stood up, its legs, barely holding together, as it pulled its severely damaged arm back. No way, Izuku uttered. It can still move even after all that. Izuku tried to dodge, but his legs gave away, as the Namu's fist descended onto him. His eyes shut, Izuku expected the worst. However, the attack never came. Opening his eyes, he saw a portal that opened in front of him, warping away the Namu's attack. That's enough Namu, you can stop now, said Kirajiri. Kiro, what's the meaning of this? Things were just getting good, ranted Shigaraki. Don't you think you're being unfair, Shigaraki-san? Asked Kirajiri. This Namu was designed to kill All Might, and you're using it on a band of ragtag villains. Well, just goes to show these guys aren't anti-All Might material, said Shigaraki. They aren't supposed to be, said Kirajiri. Our purpose isn't solely to kill All Might and you know that. Besides, for that Namu to be damaged to this extent, I doubt even All Might himself could have done this much damage to it. I'm still not convinced. Give me one reason why I should accept these buffoons, exclaimed Shigaraki. And you give me a reason why I shouldn't punish you for your insolence. A third voice came in on TV. As sensei, you were here. I was always here, said all for one, and frankly, I am disappointed in you Shigaraki. Not only have you gone against an agreement I made, but you damaged our main weapon against All Might and risked us getting found out. As sorry sensei, Biba, no buts. Now leave, exclaimed All for One as a black sludge erupted from Shigaraki's mouth, engulfing him, I'll deal with you later. Namu, stand down. As the Namu stumbled back into the base, Kirajiri ran to Izuku, picking him back up. I apologize for Shigaraki's immaturity. Welcome to the League of Villains, Mightless, said Kirajiri. Izuku, pardon, my real name, it's Izuku Midoriya, said Izuku. Then welcome to the League of Villains, young Midoriya said Kirajiri. However, upon hearing that name, all for one immediately turned off his feed as he collapsed into his chair, panting uncontrollably. Midoriya, did he just say Midoriya? All for one uttered out, trembling. Quickly, he ran to a nearby wall panel, quickly typing in a code as the wall itself opened, turning into a board filled with old posters, newspaper pages, articles, red strings linking all of these papers together. Why is he here? He shouldn't be here. All for one uttered out, it can't be. Ripping out the nearest page of a newspaper, he stared down at it, as it surfaced haunting memories that even made him, the greatest villain known to man, tremble in fear. On the newspaper, it read Mysterious Explosion on Miyako Island. Investigations still underway. Have your plans still not been stopped? All for one asked to himself, Hisashi Midoriya. Three months, that is how long Izuku has lead his double life as a villain for. After narrowly dodging certain death countless times, befriending dozens of allies and backstabbing only one non-trustworthy member, that being a murderer known as Muscular, the young boy had finally started to make progress in his quest to tear apart the hero society and get revenge on All Might. And of all times, only now does he get sick. 41. 6. Asked Inko, staring at the thermometer. Your fever's only been getting worse Izuku. I am fine mom, really. Izuku replied weakly, trying to get out of bed. Sorry dear, but you're not getting out of bed until this fever of yours goes down, exclaimed Inko. Now stay put while I make you some rice porridge. As she leaves the room however, Izuku punches his bed in anger. Damn it, Izuku thought, his face, puffing red and sweaty, of all times to get sick and it had to be the day I get my first big mission in the league. Struggling to get up, he hears a jingle next to him. His phone was getting flooded with notifications. Probably the guys must get going, Izuku thought. Weakly extending his hand to reach the phone, I'll reply to them and move out. 
However, merely lifting his head required him to use every ounce of strength he had to accomplish. As he picked up the phone, it felt like a brick of pure lead. His vision getting fuzzy, he hazily opened his line app, attempting to reply to the flood of texts from his friends and partners, telling him he was running late. Sadly, it was all in vain, as his phone fell next to his semi-conscious body as he passed out. After what felt like hours, Izuku woke up to distant voices, familiar ones that he couldn't make out. However, as his eyes adjusted, his eyes averted to two blonde buns of what he deduced as hair, before realizing that his pillow felt a lot softer than before. Wakey wakey, sleepyhead, said a familiar voice. TT Toga, Izuku exclaimed, realizing that he was lying on her lap. What are you doing here? We came to check on you silly. Toga laughed, booping Izuku's nose. We, turning around, he saw the entire league of villains, barring Shigaraki, chilling in his room. I helped myself with your mom's rice porridge, sorry, said Sachai, still with his mouth full, it was really good if it makes you feel any better. 37. Mine said Dabai, getting better. Congratulation little boss, you're terminally ill, exclaimed twice. Wait, how did my mom let you guys in? Asked Izuku. Your mom's still home, asked Spinner, playing on Izuku's and Nintendo Switch. You didn't check. Everyone exclaimed, you had one job. Izuku, is everything alright? Inko's voice came from outside his room. Shit, hide everyone, yelled Arena. As everyone scrambled into the closet as soon as the door opened, as Inko entered, she saw Izuku, still on his bed, though a little flustered. I heard something coming from your room, is everything fine? Asked Inko. Yeah, replied Izuku. Say, can you maybe make some katsudan for dinner? Sorry dear, but we're out of noodles, replied Inko. Can you maybe go buy some? Asked Izuku, putting up his best begging face, please. Inko's face suddenly became 10x more detailed, as she suddenly grew 10 feet tall with defined muscle. Right away, she said in a deep pitch voice, fully motivated as she dashed out to the supermarket. As that happened, the closet door caved in, as everyone in the league came barreling out of the closet. Okay, we had two quirk users who could have shrunken us down to take up less space, yelled Dabai. So why did I have to spend two minutes with twice his ass pressed on me? I think I broke something. Grown spinner, knowing Sachai, there's gonna be a coming out the closet joke in 3, 2, 1, said Arena. So this is what being gay feels like, joked Sachai. Anticipation dampens the pain, but not enough. She replied, collapsing. Why this was happening? A portal suddenly appeared near the door as Kirajiri came out with a pink apron, towel and tub of warm water. Everyone turned around, looking at him with deadpan eyes. Am I late? He asked. A few moments later, the league started making themselves at home in Izuku's bedroom. While Kurajiri wiped Izuku's back with a wet towel, with Toga watching, drooling, the sick boy talked to Dabai and Sachai about the mission. So, how did the mission go? Asked Izuku. Oh, it went great. Irina started. Naturally, I did most of the hard work, while everyone admired my greatness. Translation, she stepped in dog turd, then spent half the mission looking for a stick to pick the crap off, then was hit in the head by a flying tire and knocked out of the rest of the mission. Sachai cut in. Hey, I helped you know. Who was it that shrunk the group so that they could fit through that gap and escape? Irina retorted. And besides, all you did was try to sneak past the guards with a trench coat and get dogpiled. Are we sure you guys didn't fail and the police are outside our door? Asked Izuku. Let's just say it could have went a lot better. The two said in unison, lowering their heads in shame. Geez, you guys are hopeless without me. Replied Izuku. What was the objective of the mission anyways? We were supposed to collect data on recent villains from the police headquarters. Explained Dabai. We had a strategy meeting before the heist. And of course, you, the only one in our group that had authority to disagree with that hand fetishist dumbass plans, didn't show up. I take it his plans weren't that good. Guessed Izuku. Well, I'm pretty sure every plan is a massive red flag when it is written in crayon. Said Dabai. And step 4 was just a drawing of him stabbing All Might with what looked like a dildo. Scissors, they were scissors, explained Kirajiri, as he set Izuku down on his bed, placing a towel over his head. Now, you get some rest while I remake another rice porridge. Oh, can you also make some pizza? Asked Spinner, who just finished beating the last game Izuku owned. How the hell did he beat Rainbow Devil first try? Izuku commented in the background, looking at Spinner beating all the hard levels he couldn't complete. Oh, and fix me some sushi, said twice, I hate sushi, and some beer if there is some. Said Dabai. Guys, do I look like a butler? Kurajiri exclaimed. Well, if you added a bow tie. Commented Arena. Forget it. Kurajiri sighed, continuing his journey to the kitchen. As this happened, Toga sat by Izuku bed, leaning on him slowly. So, Izuku, how's it been? Asked Toga. Izuku turned to Toga in shock. Wow, you have all people to ask me that. Excuse me. Toga asked. Sorry, it's just that. We didn't really start off on a strong note. Izuku laughed. You know, you kidnapped me, cut me, then tried to drink my blood. 
I know you're my friend, but the way you approached me never really screamed I care for you as a person, and somehow you assumed I didn't care for your well-being after I caught you when you nearly fell off a building. Asked Toga. Well, I dunno, maybe I'm just too used to the old you. Replied Izuku. I changed, Izuku. Sure, maybe not too much, but enough that I genuinely care for you when it really counts. Said Toga, you may not believe it, but it was me who suggested everyone that we should check on you when you didn't show up for the mission. You did. Asked Izuku. Yeah, and once we found out you were sick, I took the initiative of changing your clothes and bed sheets. Toga continued. Well, I had an ulterior motive that time, but you get the idea. Izuku looked in awe at Toga's comment. Maybe it was because of his time spent with Katsuki. But he now realized that he seemingly forgot that people could change over time, looking down at his body. He also begun to realize how much he changed over the mere three months he had been active. His scrawny figure had been replaced with a somewhat muscular and lean body, with decently built abs and a sick pack that was looking more and more defined despite doing nothing but running away from trouble, fighting for his life and having his close encounters with death the past three months. He had changed so much from his past self that all he had to do was take one good long look in the mirror. But it wasn't just him. Looking around, he saw so many people in his room. So many people he knew. So many people that cared for him enough to actually show up when he was at his weakest. Only now that he has so many friends, did he realize how lonely he had been up until now. Seeing this, he felt an indescribable warmth within him. Unable to hold it bad, tears started to form around his eyes. Izuku, everything alright? Asked Toga. Why yeah? Izuku replied, it's just. Suddenly, Izuku hugged Toga tightly, as everyone else noticed. Only now do I realize I have so many friends who care about me. Izuku cried, thank you all. Ah, Izuku, no need to thank us, you're making me blush. Sachai replied sheepishly, rubbing the back of his head. Suddenly, a giant portal opened up above Sachai, as an entire table full of food was dropped on him. Dinner's ready, said Kirajiri, coming through the door. Oh boy, finally, all this gaming's making me hungry, said Spinner, stepping over Sachai's body. As this happened, Toga grabbed the rice porridge Kirajiri prepared, topped with fried seaweed, sesame seeds and shredded dry pork, as she took a spoonful and extended it over to Izuku. Sayashi teased, Toga, I can do this myself. Izuku replied, embarrassed. I know you can, but I want to do it anyways, said Toga, seeing how she went through all this trouble merely getting here for him. Izuku let out a sigh, and out of kindness, opened his mouth, as letting in the airplane. However, as Izuku did so, Sachai, who just got back up pushed Toga aside with a piece of chicken cutlet. Say all you to Sachai. Izuku exclaimed, swallowing his mouthful of porridge. I used to do this all the time with my little brother back at the hospital, replied Sachai. It was the cutest thing ever. I'm not a goddamn bunny, Izuku yelled, trying to grab the chopsticks from Sachai, but found himself too weak to do so, damn fever. Don't get too worked up, little Midoriya, said Kirajiri, enjoying his dinner with the rest of the gang. Fevers go down faster when you rest. Unable to fight back, Izuku simply had to accept defeat, swallowing his pride, along with the chicken cutlet that Sachai fed him. However, that was not the end of it, as Spinner then butted in with a piece of sushi. Say ah Spinner, I see the giant chunk of wasabi you hid between the salmon and I see Mr. Compress with the camera. Just do it for the laws, Spinner replied, stuffing the sushi into Izuku's mouth as he was talking, as flames erupted from his nostrils as a result, as everyone at the table laughed. Just then, Magni came in, patting him gently in the head. Don't take it personally, we're laughing with you, not at you. We still love you deep down, she said, handing him some milk. Now open wide. Oh for the love of God. Izuku replied, gulping down another mouthful of milk. At least this time it wasn't shoved down his throat. Hey, you guys wanna join in? It's actually kind of fun, said Magni, like feeding a baby rabbit. One step ahead of you, sis, replied Dabai, handing Izuku a handful of roasted peanuts. With your hand, Izuku asked, you want me to eat off your hand? Why didn't I think of that? Toga said to herself, glaring at Dabai with jealousy. You're not actually gonna do it are you? Asked Arena. I bet you 5,000 yen he does. Sanchai replied. Izuku on the other hand gave a disconcerting look at Dabai, trying to see if he was actually serious, seeing how his hands weren't gonna leave his face anytime soon. And he didn't really have the energy to just take the peanuts out of his hand. Izuku actually started to lean forward. Oh dear god he's actually doing it, said Arena, blushing. I can hear the typing of a thousand fanfictions right now, said Sachai. However, as Izuku closed his eyes, he felt something wouldn't enter his mouth. Looking up, he saw Dabai, using his other hand to stuff a mouthful of rice via chopstick. I was just messing with ya. Dabai laughed. If Spinner hadn't done it already, I would've stuffed you with wasabi instead. It's a prank I used to pull on my little brother. 
Good damn it Dabai, just when it was getting good. Toga pouted. Now the rest of the scene can only play in my fantasy. Meanwhile, Kirajiri stared at his plate, as if he was in trance. Kirajiri, why are you staring at that fish? Asked Sachai, trying to teleport it into your stomach or something. Kirajiri on the other hand turned to Sachai. Ever feel like you're forgetting something? Asked Kirajiri. If you forgot about it, then it was never important to begin with. Replied Sachai. I guess you're right replied Kirajiri, as he took a bite out of his grilled mackerel. Meanwhile, heavy rain poured, as Shigaraki stood at the side of the road, near the spot where he always stops by whenever he was done with a mission assigned to him by All for One, waiting for Kirajiri to warp him back to the hideout as he was getting soaked from head to toe. Any minute now, he said, as passers avoided him, creeped out by his appearance, wonder what's taking him so long. Suddenly, a random bird swooped in, grabbing the hand on Shigaraki's face and flying off with it. God damn it, that's the fourth time today. Get back here you avian scumbag. However, as he chased the bird down, it dropped its hand in midair, as it became too heavy for the bird to carry, causing the accessory to drop into a woman's handbag. Seeing this, Shigaraki grabbed the handbag, trying to take back his hand mask while making sure to keep one finger away in order to not disintegrate it by accident. However, in doing so, the woman turned around, mistaking him for a mugger. Give me that bag. Shigaraki yelled out. Wait, no, stop. The woman exclaimed, there's no money in there, only Izuku's groceries. I said give it to me. Shigaraki yelled savagely, as he lunged at Inko, trying to kill her. As he did so, the bag tore open as his hand fell out. Seeing this, he pushed Inko aside, attempting to grab it. Suddenly, he stopped Midair, unable to even lift a finger. The woman let out a light green glow, as her hair raised up, her eyes glowing green and crackling with electricity. Forgive me for this, she said, as the villain was suddenly thrown against the wall. Then on the pavement, before flying face first into a trash can, geez, now the meat and noodles got all wet. I'm gonna have to go back and buy more. W what the hell was she? Shigaraki uttered, as he lost consciousness. Back with Izuku and Ko, as they finished dining. The TV spinner left open suddenly let out static, drawing everyone's attention. I was wondering why you didn't show up, young Midoriya, said a familiar voice. I wish you best of luck on your recovery. Oh, it's Potato Head, said Irina, nonchalantly with her mouth full. Hirajiri, you were supposed to report back an hour ago, what happened? Asked all for one. My apologies, master, but young Izuku was ill. As an important member and strategist of the League of Villains, his well-being is of a higher priority, explained Kirajiri. Liar, you just wanted to pamper me because I was sick, thought Izuku, thinking back to how enthusiastic Kirajiri sounded when he was taking care of him. I see, said all for one, however, I came for for a much bigger reason. According to outside sources, as of next year, All Might will be teaching at you the whole room went silent. Excuse me, Izuku exclaimed. Wait, why is that a bad thing? Asked twice. He used to be extremely easy to locate and lure out. Explained Dabai. If he starts teaching at UA, then a huge chunk of his day will be spent protected behind the walls of one of the most secured locations on the planet, making our mission to kill him nigh impossible. Deduced Sachai. Then we have to kill him before the end of this year. Exclaimed Izuku. We can't it's impossible. Said all for one. We don't have nearly enough men nor firepower to deal with him in such a narrow time window. Then, what can we do? Asked Mr. Compress. There's one option I thought of. Said all for one, Izuku. Toga, you two are around the appropriate age for high school. While Toga is actually a well-known serial killer, it's nothing a fake name and hairdo can't solve. What are you implying here? Asked Izuku. That you two infiltrate Yue in order to keep a close eye on All Might. Izuku froze for a second to process his newly acquired info. What? Is something wrong? Asked all for one. I joined this league because I wanted to tear down hero society. Why must I, of all people, enter the one place where heroes are made? I can't do this. I have to refuse. Izuku exclaimed in anger. I understand your hatred, young Midoriya. But you must understand that you're playing a much bigger role than you think. If we have eyes on our target 24-7 without him realizing, it will bring us massive advantages for future endeavors. Explained all for one. Must I explain what All Might did to me for you to understand? Exclaimed Izuku. He rejected me. Called me worthless, took my broken heart and broke it into even smaller pieces. And now you're telling me I have to act like he's still my biggest hero. Upon hearing this, all for one let out a sigh of frustration. Of course you would, all might. He muttered to himself, you dumbass. Izuku, Toga butted in. Not now Toga, said Izuku, I still have some dirt I have to let out. You mustn't let your personal hatred get you, young Midoriya, said all for one. Perhaps it may not be clear to you, but he has the ability to transfer his quirk to another person. Upon hearing this, Izuku froze in shock, along with the other villains. Excuse me, the reason why he's teaching at Yue is probably so he can find himself a new successor, explained all for one. 
And if he does so, then he will no longer be the only threat to our organization. So you're saying that there could be another All Might-like hero emerging in the near future? Exclaimed Izuku. Indeed, unless you stop it. Replied All for One, of course, that is your choice, and I cannot enforce you anything. Whatever it you want to do, only you can truly stop yourself. However, I will let you know that if you do infiltrate Yue, not only do you have the highest chance of killing him personally, but potentially even convince him you are a worthy successor. Upon hearing this, Izuku became even more conflicted. Would he even want that? The quirk, belonging to the man who stabbed him in the back while he was at his lowest point in life. I will give you until tomorrow for you to make up your decision. Until next time, Izuku, said all for one. And just like that, his shadowy silhouette disappeared from the screen, leaving Izuku with the hardest choice he has ever had in life. 36, 2, and Ko exclaimed in awe, in just a day. How did you make that quick a recovery? Lots of rest, I guess, Izuku replied, smiling. Well, Inko muttered out, before hugging him. What a little champ you are, Izuku. Thanks mom, replied Izuku, but I better get going, or I'm gonna run late for school. Oh no you're not, replied Inko defensively. You could hardly lift your arm just yesterday. Fevers don't go down that easy. At least rest a day to be sure you're really better. Mom, it's nothing. I assure you I'm fine, Izuku protested, attempting to get out of bed. Izuku please, for your own well-being. Inko desperately tried to push him back in. Then at least let me go on a small walk. Izuku exclaimed, F fine, but not too far, okay. Inko agreed reluctantly. Thanks mom, Izuku replied, getting dressed as he went out. As she saw her son leave, Inko let out a light smile. Izuku's been out for longer and longer lately. She thought, maybe he finally found new friends. If that's the case, then I guess he could stay out a little longer. As Izuku stepped out the door however, he bumped into Kirajiri again, waiting for him by the sidewalk. Did the medicine work? Asked Kirajiri. What was in that stuff? Asked Izuku back. Classified information. Replied Kirajiri. Apparently, the boss got it from an old colleague that he doesn't work with anymore. I see. Replied Izuku. Anyways, you called me here because? All right. The mission. Kirajiri replied. The boss needs you to recruit more people for the league. The Yua entrance exams are coming up and apparently All Might will be present to cheer on the examinees. With all the untrained would-be heroes and would-be hostages, it would be a perfect opportunity to strike, as even if we failed to kill All Might, we could at least drastically slow the growth of new heroes. And he chose me to recruit new members because, you have a talent, young Midoriya, one to recruit anyone by pulling their strings. The boss believes in you, Midoriya, don't let him down, explained Kirajiri. All right, said Izuku, I'll assemble the squad, just tell me the targets. Back the Tom's Ramen Shop, Izuku gave his men the rundown of their first mission with the League. So let me get this straight, said Sachai. He wants us to convince the Ragens to join the League as the front line to assault Yue. Yeah, simple as that, replied Izuku. Are you nuts? You have heard of the things that villain group has done right, exclaimed Sachai. Which is exactly why they are gonna help us. All they want to do is destroy, correct? So why not of them destroy the Yue entrance exam for us? Asked the young villain. What's so bad about them anyways? I bet they're just a bunch of posers. Laughed Spinner. I wouldn't be so sure about that, said Dabai, taking a drink of beer. I've had my fair share of encounters with them and I can assure you, they are one of the last groups you want as an enemy. For a B-generation group, they are much more powerful than you think. B-generation? Asked Toga, what's that? Not sure. That's just what they call themselves replied Dabai. Point is, I'm only in if you're certain the negotiation won't end up in a brawl. It's the name of any and all villain groups that were formed after All Might's Silver Age, explained Tom, who eavesdropped in on their conversation. Suddenly, every turned their attention to the shop owner, as he resumed his plate-cleaning duties. How, do you know that? Asked Magni. It's common knowledge most a generation villains and villain groups know, replied Tom. You were a villain? Asked Izuku. He didn't know. Asked Sachai. No one here knew about the owner, Sachai, said Toga. Why do you expect us to assume that he's a villain? I thought the vault door that's clearly been ripped off its frame hanging on the wall behind the counter was an obvious indicator, said Sachai. That's a door. I thought it was a very big hubcap, said Mr. Compress, getting a closer look. Wait, hold on, there's generations of villain group, Izuku asked Tom. What? You thought the criminal underworld was just full of people who decided one day to do crime? Trust me, there's a very clear power structure that composes the criminal underworld and keeps it in order. Without it, there wouldn't be a need for heroes, explained Tom. After all, heroes have a clear hierarchy to their world. So what makes you think villains are any different? I never knew, Izuku replied. Typical, replied Tom, putting down his plate. Most B-generation villains don't know about the structure either, which is why so many get caught and defeated only days after their debut. 
To us veterans, they are akin to arrogant youngsters who think they know better than us, that we veterans are out of date and out of touch and that they are much better, not paying attention to the fact that there's a reason why we veterans have lasted so long. Now tell me, does that sound familiar? Looking back, Izuku began to notice a pattern. The heroes he had fought until now, the ones he had helped defeat all had two things in common. They have a history of shady conduct and they were all very young, some only recently having obtained their license. El Oriol in particular in fact had his license suspended only six months after obtaining it. Exactly. Heroes. You want to know why so many of us older villains hate All Might so much more than the others? Because he embodies that youthful arrogance. Anyone can be a hero he says, just do your best. He says, no, that's not what heroes are. Heroes are so much more than that. They are selfless, brave, and fight for justice, not sponsorship and brand recognition. They strive to make a better world, not one where they are praised. All Might may have brought hope to the hearts of many, not even I will deny that, but he also brought upon a generation blinded by prideful ignorance, ranted Tom, before realizing how much of a tangent he just went on. Looking at his customers, most of them were silenced. He put up a casual look on his face, but deep down, he was panicking. Did he sound a preaky? Did his rant get too personal? His palms were getting really sweaty as he was anticipating OK Boomer to be fired any minute now. However, that didn't happen. Instead, Izuku pulled out a notebook and looked at him with the eyes of a curious child. So tell me more about this power structure, he said, his eyes, hungry for knowledge. He was beaming with excitement, like a child talking to Santa Claus. The sight of this boy was so cathartic, that, in a mere second, Tom burst into tears. Aquotem finally appreciated. He cried out, Dear God Tom, calm down, Sachai exclaimed, as tears are flying into my ramen. Panicked arena, Dear God it's flooding the shop, yelled Spinner. I can't swim, but I won't drown said twice, standing on the counter as the water level steadily rose. Later that day, Izuku's group were sent to the supposed meeting spot, an abandoned warehouse by the docks. The group leader had a few support gear equipped with him to deal with whatever gets thrown at him. With everyone prepared, they entered the building, expecting the worst. Inside, they found it a group of about 50 or so men, all armed with knives and pipes, most of them mutant-type quirk users, as they were guided to the center of the room, meeting face-to-face -face with the group's leader, the Arank Villain Raid. He was a man in his mid-twenty seconds, spiky red hair with thick, hairy arms that failed to hide his well-defined muscle. A scar ran down the chiseled cheek, boosting his already intimidation stare which were akin to that of a Doberman. You must be the leader, said Izuku, extending his arm for a handshake it's an honor to meet you. However, the villain leader smacked his hand aside. You've got some nerves, you know that, asked the villain, talking to me as if we're equals. Izuku tilted his head in confusion, as Raid's goons laughed. Oh boy, this kid's a riot, laughed one of the goons, don't you know? You have to kneel and wait for the boss to talk first, then reply. Small fries like you are not worthy of addressing Raid Sama directly. Only reply when given permission. Are you kidding me? How much more egotistical can this guy get? Spinner yelled out, causing the whole room to go silent. A vein bulged in the villain leader's head. Excuse me, he asked. As sorry, I assure you, my subordinate didn't mean it. Izuku stuttered nervously, trying to stay on the guy's good side. But it was no use, as the man stood up from his chair, towering over Spinner, who was hardly even half his size. The villain bent down, casting a shadow over the lizard man, who started to tremble. You have a sharp tongue for a mere lizard. Oi, I'll have you know that I'm proud of my lizard heritage, so don't you ever go dissing it like it's an insult, Spinner yelled back. I but before Spinner can continue, with lightning fast speed, Spinner was lifted off the ground, grabbed by his own tongue. I wonder, can lizards grow their tongue back? He said, should be find out. Hey knock it off, Mr. Magni snapped, trying to separate the two. However, in her attempt to save Spinner, Raid turned around, hitting her in the stomach with a wicked jab as she dropped to her knees, coughing out blood. Pathetic, laughed Raid, and you came here to negotiate an alliance with us. As twice, Toga and Mr. Compress rushed to their two down comrades aid. Izuku stared at him in disgust, as he had to be restrained by Dabai to make sure nothing drastic happened. Please Izuku, bear it, whispered Dabai, I I know. Izuku grunted as Raid walked back towards him. So, this is the supposed League of Villains, laughed Raid in a domineering voice. The ones that suggested this alliance? Don't make me laugh. Raijin is the future of villainy, the group that will overthrow all for one, if he really exists, and become the real rulers of the criminal underworld. We have no place for weaklings like you. Meanwhile, the group could hear chattering going on in the room, as Raid's thugs laughed at Spinner and Magnus Payne. Did you see how pathetic they were? Laughed one of the thugs. I know right. And look at that fag's girly gestures. From which gay bar do you he got picked up from? Laughed another, pointing at Magni. However, just then, Toga got up, plunging a knife right into one of the thug's mouth. You'd better watch your tongue, otherwise you'd lose it. 
said Toga, his smile no longer present. Be boss hell meh, the thug pleaded, as the knife's blade slowly dug between his teeth. However, Raid just gave him a look of indifference. Just then, with the flip of her wrist, Toga cut the tongue right out of the thug's mouth. Jai oh ah, why hung? He hug a why ucking hung. He yelled in pain, collapsing and his blood spewed from his mouth. Disgusting, scorned Toga, your blood isn't even worth tasting. Toga, we're here to negotiate, not fight, Izuku exclaimed. He was sadly too late, as other nearby crooks saw this and surrounded her. Now you've done it you bitch. We'll break your arms and legs and keep you as a public fuck toy, yelled one of the crooks as they activated their quirks, charging at the girl. However, before any of them could lay a hand on her, she leaped into the air, flipping over the closest assailant, as she put him in a headlock, before dragging him into an upcoming punch from a rock skin user, breaking that man's ribcage. Then, she slipped away, dodging a claw attack that cut open the back of her former hostage, before slitting that attacker's wrist. That slippery brat, boss, help us out here, asked one of the thugs, turning around, expecting the boss to be pissed. However, Raid just laughed. I like this girl. At least someone in this group some backbone. He exclaimed, getting up and walking towards the thug who asked for help. Well, at least more backbone than you. Be boss, say. You do realize you just asked me to help take care of a little girl, despite you guys outnumbering her. Have more weapons than her and more quirks than her. He asked in a demeaning tone. Be but she's strong. Raid bent down again, caressing his subordinate's chin. No, she's not strong, he said with a smile. Just then, a visceral sound resonated throughout the warehouse, as Raid ripped off the thug's jaws, as blood erupted from the man's lower mouth, his mouth dangling in the air. You're just weak. Raid finished maliciously, before turning to his other subordinates. Remember, rage in his for the top dogs only. What should the weak do? Glorify and worship us. The rest roared in unison, completely numb to their colleague, who was brutally gored in front of them. I can't wait for them to die violent deaths. Dabai muttered under his breath. Izuku thought the very same. That smile of his, as he plucked off his subordinate's lower jaw like a Lego piece was all too familiar to him. Looking back, it was almost the exact same one as Katsuki's, the one he had as he threw him threw him out the window. Witnessing that first hand to him was like seeing his past self get bullet in a third-person view. It disgusted him. Now then, mightless was it. It seems I have wrongly judged you. I guess your group may have some worth after all, said Raid. Sitting back down on his chair, you wanted to talk, right? So start talking. Hey, Izuku, I've been wondering. Toga whispered, will Sachai and that German chick be fine? Don't worry about them. Izuku whispered back, focus on the now. They have a mission to fulfill. Let them fulfill it. Flashback. Remember Sachai, from what I've heard, the boss of the group, Raid, has an electricity absorption quirk. The most electricity he absorbs, the stronger he gets. His villain costume is actually a redesigned electric chair, which multiplies his strength drastically when activated and is his pride and source of power. If destroyed, it may hurt his pride enough to bring him down. With him out of the picture, the rest of his group should be relatively easy to convert, explained Izuku. So I want you in Arena to sneak into the warehouse, undetected, and destroy the suit. Understood, said Sachai. Hold on, why should I be taking orders from you? Asked Arena. You got a problem with me being the boss? Asked Izuku. Well sorry for not understanding Japanese culture, but where I'm from, it's children who listen to adults. Irina growled. Quit being so spoiled, sauerkraut. Toga butted in. You stay out of this. I only came for the ramen. I didn't agree to this, exclaimed Irina. Come on Rina, said Sachai, pretty please. Sachai, Irina hesitated for a moment. However, a moment was enough for Izuku to pull a knife near Irina's neck. I don't care what or how you're gonna do it, but you're gonna carry through your mission whether you like it or not. Are we clear? Asked Izuku. A drop of sweat fell down Irina's neck as she gulped. Oh okay, she stuttered out, you win this time. We'll do our part, Izu bro. Sachai cheered on why are you okay with this? Asked Arena. Cause he's my friend. Why else would I be doing this? Replied Sachai. End of flashback. Somewhere, near the back of the warehouse, the two other members from Izuku's group sneaked in, as Arena used her size manipulation quirk to shrink themselves down, allowing them to easily enter the ventilation shaft. Cause he's a friend. I don't think friends would go that far for each other, said Arena, still holding on to that comment. You'd be surprised at how far friends would go to help each other out, replied Sachai. As the two continued to advance in the ventilation shaft, well, does he ever do anything for you then? If not, then this friendship you have with the kid is very one-sided, said Arena. I mean, have you ever asked anything of him? What? Of course I have. Like that time I, uh, Sachai froze. Well, there was that time where, uh, well, you never asked anything of him, asked Arena. I just don't know what to ask of him. He's smart, but it's not like I have four pages of homework I need him to do for me. He works hard to keep up both of his lives, I just want to support him, replied Sachai. Irina froze for a moment. 
But has he ever supported you? Asked Sanchai. He shook his head. Has anyone ever supported you? She asked again. Well, there was my dad. Before he, Sanchai stopped again. Come on, let's not dwell on that. Mission first. No, you stop right now Sanchai. Irina exclaimed. You can't be go your entire life acting as everyone's crutch. That's not how you gain friends. That's how you gain leeches. People that will take advantage of your kindness. Sachai. I just want to however. Before she can finish, she froze abruptly. What the hell am I saying? She muttered to herself, her face steaming red. Why the hell do I care about him so much all of a sudden? Come on Irina, pull yourself together. Hey, Rina, is everything all you know? If you're gonna chat, do it where no one can hear you. A third voice cut in. Suddenly, a slash flew in between the two as the ventilation shaft was cut open, causing both of them to fall out. Luckily, Irina released her quirk, changing the two to normal size before impact. A little too big to be mice, aren't ya? The voice came continued. Who the hell are you? Asked Irina. Name's Butcher. He a rank villain. I'm Raid's right-hand man. Replied the villain. So, I guess you were looking for this. Pulling down an old curtain, the two stood in awe at the 15 feet tall battle armor that stood before them. Metal scraps composed the center, as Tesla coils were seen protruding from the back. A beauty isn't she? Thing can generate enough electricity to render power plants obsolete, laughed Butcher, and to think the boss found this thing in a junkyard. Upon closer inspection however, he noticed a logo engraved on the left bicep region of the armor. Blue Jay. Why was that name so familiar to him? However, he couldn't think for long, as the villain guarding it suddenly dashed in, lunging at him. Look out! Irina yelled, charging at him, attempting to shrink the assailant down. However, before her hands could reach him, the butcher jumped over her as pulled out his carving knives, trying to cleave her arm off. However, before he could bring the knife down, a red blast came flying at him as he raised one of his knives to block, knocking back a little. He's good, Sachai muttered, firing a barrage this time. However, a barrage was not enough to slow him down as he weaved through the streams of bullets, catching up to him. However, this time, it was Arena who came in with the save, enlarging a piece of rubble behind her to rocket her towards the man, trying to shrink him down once again. However, the villain twisted himself in midair, narrowly dodging Arena's hand, kicking her aside. However, this left him open for Sanchai to blast him with a three-finger shot. While he managed to block the hit with his knife, the force of the attack sent him flying back, as he hit the wall hard enough to knock the wind out of him. Had enough yet? Asked Sanchai, panting. Hey ha The butcher laughed. Not bad, I have to admit, for you two to take on a B-rank villain. However, don't get too cocky now, after all. Suddenly, the villain vanished in the blink of an eye, appearing right below Sachai. You never know whether your enemy's going all out or just holding back. He laughed, as he sunk his cleaver into Sachai's shoulder. Go. Sachai grunted in pain, collapsing. Sachai. Irina cried, only to get kicked in the stomach, collapsing. Did you really think that just because my name's Butcher that I'd have a blade or cutting-related quirk? He laughed, throwing his cleaver past Arena, before he suddenly appeared behind her, holding the cleaver up to her neck. It ain't so simple, buddy. Butcher Quirk, Fast Travel The user can teleport towards any object they previous held in their hand as long as they can remember fondly what said object looks like. Now then, what to do with you? Oh, an even better idea. Why not let the boss decide? He laughed. What? You want us to attack you, eh? Don't make me laugh, said Raid. Don't get me wrong, we would love to get our hands on that damn school, but not in your name. We do as we please. Having a set date plus a predetermined plan is too boring for our taste. Cause planning ahead totally never worked in the past, Izuku said in a sarcastic tone. Oh please, the fact that there needs to even be a plan just shows your group's weakness. Look at you, kid, wearing a mask to conceal your identity, working in the shadows, all signs of a coward. The Ragens need to be seen. They need to be heard. You're just chicken. Izuku fist tightened in rage. Jeez, how far up his own ass is this guy? I'm actually starting to miss all hand face, at least he looked funny. Thought Izuku, I'll tell you what, I'll make a deal with you, said Raid. The league joins us, then, we call all the shots during the UA attack, but you guys get to decide the day. And why is it that you decide at all? Asked Izuku, because I'm strong, and here, only the strongest can decide what to do. Izuku let out a sigh of resignation. It seems there's really no getting through with you, said Izuku. Oh boy, here we go. Dabai commented, what's this? You said it, didn't you? Only the strongest gets to decide who does what. So if I beat you, I control your group, said Izuku. A moment of silence followed, from both the league and the raging group. Suddenly, laughter erupted, as Raid stood up, eyeing him down. That's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. What the hell are you gonna? Blue Jay support gear number 12, impact knuckles. Suddenly, a loud crack was heard, as the villain boss was sent flying several feet back. The room went silent, 
flabbergasted by the sight of their boss, a six feet eight giant, getting punted like a sandbag by a kid nowhere near his size. You still wanna go? Asked Izuku, the support gear wrapping around his knuckles like a glove, as the rest of his members readied themselves for battle. As Raid got up with a bloody nose, his eyes went bloodshot red, as he walked back towards the kid, more pissed than ever. How dare you, men, tear them apart, he yelled, as everyone in the room charged at the league. Suddenly, a massive blast of blue flame erupted, frying dozens of thugs. Hey now, you really think a few thugs will be enough to take us on? Asked Izuku, everyone. Kick their asses, right? The rest of the league replied, as they went on the offensive. Dabai immediately fired another blast of flame, cremating two more thugs. Just then, one of the thugs retaliated with ice. I'll have you know that my ice quirk is the strongest there is. Prepare to become a human popsicle. He yelled, ah ha ha Before he was even done laughing, the flames overpowered his ice blast, vaporizing the thug. Tsk, my little brother can create stronger ice in his sleep. Scuffed Dabai. Seeing this, some of the thugs back off. No way. He just killed Flash Freeze, one of our executives. Uttered one of the thugs, I'm out of here. Another band of thugs huddled together behind him, charging up their multiple quirks. Heh. <sighs> so what? Flash Freeze was the weakest of the executives anyways. He probably just got cocky, said one of the thugs. But let's see how he fares against all of these attacks at once. Just then, Dabai felt something grab its leg. Looking down, he saw a thug with a mole quirk, holding him in place. Now you won't be able to dodge. Laughed the mole man, fire now. Die. The thugs yelled in unison, firing an assortment of sharpened stones, spikes, glass shards or such. In response, Dabai simply used both hands as his attack, while stopping briefly, burned through all of the attacks, not only wiping out the thugs who launched the blast, but also setting fire to the entire warehouse. Seeing this, the mole man quickly let go of him, digging himself deeper into the ground. I can't believe this. He's a monster. I'll leave him to the other executives, he said to himself. Suddenly, he felt a breeze behind him, as if he was suddenly moved to the surface. However, this breeze was followed by extreme pain, as he collapsed dead, his entire backside missing. Behind him, a massive hole was dug out, and a pearl rested at the center. Damn, I got someone with that. I see bits of human flesh in this pearl. Oh well said Mr. Compress, tossing the pearl at a group of thugs, as the contents of the pair was released, crushing several thugs to death. Meanwhile twice ran while screaming like a girl from a fatter thug, who was trying to strike him with a scimitar. Guys, guys, help me, I got this under control, exclaimed twice, ducking under another swing. Get back here you, yelled the thug, as one of his slashes managed to slice off a part of twice's mask. Nuo, I'm, splitting, twice uttered out, clutching his exposed face. Not yet, but soon you will be. The thug replied, lifting his scimitar, splitting in two that is. However, as swung down, twice was able to find a nearby piece of cloth to cover his exposed face, as his personality soon returned. Dodging the scimitar strike, twice pulled out his wrist ruler, slicing open the thug's neck. But now I'm well again, he said, striking a pose. Oh good, said Spinner, who watched the whole thing unfold. I was afraid I was gonna have to intervene. Die you lizard, yelled a few thugs charging him. Shut it, Spinner yelled back, slicing through them. Damn it, they're just six lowly crooks. Why can't we beat them? Yelled one of the thugs. Just then, five figure walked in. That's cause you're not trying hard enough, said one of them. You're. We still have around twenty men, plus the reinforcements outside. Then there's us, said another. The executives. Guys the executives are here, cheered the thug. Who the hell are these bozos? Asked Magni, who crushed another enemy with her magnet. The rank villain, Poison Blade, killed six people during a bank robbery. Four of them died instantly and the two others died in the hospital. Introduced one of them. The rank villain, Mad Bull. Former boxer who killed his three last opponents. First one on accident. The others, very intentionally. Followed another. The rank villain, Rapid Fire. Responsible for shooting up two schools and five shopping malls. My head count is well over 50. See rank villain, Wire. Name a fraud, I've committed it. F rank villain, Dumbass Mustache. Crime, having a big dumb mustache. Said the last one. Bear Killer. What the hell are you talking about? Asked Rapid Fire. Suddenly, the supposed bear killer turned to his colleagues with a haunting smile, slicing Wire's throat open with a knife before stabbing Mad Bull in the shoulder. Bear killer, what are you doing? Yelled Poison Blade. Guys, that's not me. Yelled a man that looked identical to the villain that emerged from behind a pile of boxes covered in stab wounds. This girl jumped me and nearly killed me ahhhh. Before he could finish, the supposed executive was lit up in a blast of blue flames. Just then, the imposter melted away, revealing Toga underneath. Damn it, have a taste of my poison knife. Poison blade, trying to stab Toga. However, before he could, he was pulled back by Magni, who used her quick slam his head into her magnet, 
causing blood to pour out, before she swung said magnet like a bat, smashing him through the wall. As Toga continued her assault on Mad Bull, rapid fire pulled up behind her. Not a smart move, allowing a gun wielder to get distance. I'll fill you with lead, he yelled. However, before he could do anything, his top half was compressed into a pearl from behind. And a dumb move on your part to turn your back on a magician, replied Mr. Compress. As Mad Bull was eventually taken out too by Toga, the league started to regroup, as the fire dab I started was really getting back. Did you really have to go this far with the flames? Coughed Toga, as it was becoming harder and harder to breathe. Well excuse me, I can't exactly tell my fire not to burn what I don't want to burn, replied Dabai. We failed this mission, didn't we? Asked Mr. Compress. I mean, look around, is anyone here still alive? We have a dozen or so thugs still, said Spinner, but I dunno, they look way too scared to listen to us. However, looking at the remaining thugs, something was off. They weren't scared of them, but what was behind them? Turning around, they saw Izuku, heavily injured and badly beat up, lying in a small crater. Izuku, Toga cried out, running for him. Just then, a cleaver flew in front of her, stopping her in her tracks. I would advise you stay where you are, a voice said, unless you want your friends to die. Turning around, they saw Sachai and Arena, don't badly injured as well and down on the ground. Sachai, Arena, yelled Spinner, only for the villain to bring his knife closer to their necks. Oh no you don't, said the villain, you wouldn't want my hand to slip, would you? But, if they are here, Magni uttered. Then that means, suddenly, the sound of mechanical whirs filled the room as Raid descended, fully juiced up in his armor. His body having absorbed so much electricity that he grew from 6 feet 8 to 8 feet 6, as electricity oozed out of his body. You've really done it now kid. He grunted, I'll kill both you and your league. Get away from him, exclaimed Toga, still charging, as Butcher decided to kill one of his hostages to get the message across. He was stopped by Raid. No, let this be a lesson to them, he said, pulling back his fist. T. Toga, get away. Izuku uttered. Gigavolt fist. Izuku. Toga cried. M. J. O. L. N. I. R. A massive punch followed. As the shockwave sent Toga flying, before tearing through the rest of the league, it didn't stop either, as it blew a massive hole through the warehouse, one at the size of nearly the entire wall. As the shockwave traveled through the entire warehouse, eating through the nearby abandoned building feet away, ripping fire hydrants out of the ground and knocking over street lamps before finally stopping after knocking over a tree nearly 200 feet away from the original point. As the dust settled, the flames got even stronger from the generated wind blast, as Raid fanned away nearby dust to see the damage he caused. As he expected, that punch took out most of the league, rendering almost all of them unable to fight and at the mercy of Damai's own flames. Ahaha, that ought to teach him, laughed Raid. I'll have you know, with this suit, my power is equal to that of All Might's. And you bunch thought you ever had a chance. Indeed, this is why Raid is the greatest, exclaimed Butcher, emerging from his cover. He is the strongest of them all. Now then, seeing how you did just take out over half of my old gang, I'm willing to make a deal with you, Izuku. Laughed the villain, picking up Izuku's limp body. You work for me, and I will spare your friends. Izuku remained silent. Hey, you listening kid, or are you too scared to talk after what you've witnessed? Izuku's fist clenched. This is how you recruited everyone else, right? Asked Izuku, now with words, but by force. Is that so? What do you think? That I pulled a Martin Luther King and talked them to joining me. Laughable. They joined me because I showed them that they were backing the right horse. With this power, you can make anyone do whatever they want. Hearing this, Izuku chuckled. Funny, you sound just like a friend of mine. One who uses brute force to get everything. One who thinks any problem can be solved by just blowing it up. Said Izuku, because deep down, he knew he had nothing else to his name. Because without power, he is nothing. Raid's smile disappeared. Oh, did I hit a nerve? Laughed Izuku. I knew it. Under all that muscle, you're just a scared little boy. An empty shell with absolutely zero redeemable quality. Shut up. Take away the power. And you're just as small and weak as me. Laughed Izuku. And that's saying something, considering that I'm quirkless. That last pass snapped him. Die. Yelled Raid, bringing down his fist. Izuku closed his eyes in anticipation. Like with Katsuki, having experienced this before, he already knew what to expect. First came the yelling, then came the pain. Smack. But the pain never came. Well said, kid. Spoke a familiar voice. What? Someone stopped by M. Jolnir. Exclaimed Raid. You did well, now leave the rest to me. Said the man. Sachai looked up, as his eyes widened at what he saw. That old bastard still got it. He laughed. Who the hell are you? Asked Raid. Suddenly, Raid felt a sharp pain, as he was punched in the stomach, sending him flying back. A real villain, Tom, Sachai cheered, his eyes in tears. The shopkeeper, Izuku uttered, knowing the villains these days, I was 99% sure you weren't gonna get through to him, replied Tom, so I came. Who the hell are you old man? Asked Raid, don't you know who I am? 
B. I'm just a 65-year-old geezer with a beer belly, plated blue shirt, a thick bushy black bear who runs a ramen shop, replied Tom, and from the looks of it, your childish brat who's taken too many vitamin gummies. Ew. Raid grunted, as letting out an explosion of electricity what shattered all the windows of the warehouse. I quote hell I'll kill you. Tom, please, run away, uttered Dabai, still barely conscious. Don't worry about him, Dabai, said Sachai, he'll be fine. As Raid charged him, his fist ready, Tom's arms suddenly bulged up, nearly tripling in volume, as he stopped the Raid's punch dead in its tracks, releasing a shockwave that instantly put out all of the fires, because in his prime, he was one of All Might's greatest enemies. Just then, Tom retaliated, punching Raid in the stomach so hard, it lifted the man off the ground. However, Raid fought back by hitting Tom in the face with a straight jab, followed by a hit to his ribs and to his chest. Tom powers through, punching Raid in the face, staggering him as the two began rapidly exchanging fists. So, you claim you can take on All Might in this suit, huh? Asked Tom, as he slowly started to overwhelm Raid, pushing him back in the exchange. Then you must be seriously out of touch with reality if you think All Might is that weak. The wind generated by the two fighters started to tear not only the entire warehouse apart, but the entire street surrounding it. The wind so intense, Izuku and the others were struggling to even get close. Whoa, unreal, uttered Spinner. They are, so fast, said Dabai in awe. Pulling back his fist, Tom went on the full offensive, pummeling Raid with punches so fast, each of them broke the sound barrier as the armor was slowly deteriorating. Raid, throwing a Hail Mary, managed to land one solid blow however in Tom's lower rib, allowing him to fly in a few good hits back. He's going all out even though he's past his prime. Satch I thought, those aren't just stray punches he's betting hit by either, they're targeted, and each and every one of them. He briefly remembered the result of Raid's attack earlier, is more than 100% of Raid's full power, letting out an even stronger punch than before. Raid heard a crack as he landed a punch square to Tom's ribs. To his shock however, it was his hand that broke, not the former, as Tom puffed his chest up knocking him off balance. What's wrong, you seem scared. Tom yelled, sending him flying back with a punch, but a real villain should always keep composure, even when things don't go their way. Dashing in after him, he grabbed Raid by the wrist, flinging him high into the air, smashing him through the ceiling, before jumping up to him and spiking him back down to the ground. Everyone stared in awe, including Izuku, who jolted back at the sight. Just then, Tom dropped back down before Raid could even recover. Now for a lesson, one you're probably disgusted by, said Tom, but I'll show you it applies to everyone. His arm bulged up even more, as steam was emanating from his body. Go beyond. Plus, the punch connects. Ultra. With that finishing blow, Raid's entire armor was shattered, as he was sent flying not only out of the warehouse, but out of sight altogether. The League of Villain, Izuku included, watched in awe, as Tom, still holding his pose, slowly deflated, his muscles retracting. Just so you know, Raid, All Might could have beaten you in five hits with that kind of power, he said, and if it were my prime, it would have only taken three. Unbelievable, uttered Butcher, dropping his cleaver, just who the hell is he? One of the most powerful rank villains of the former a generation, the bank breaker, Tom, replied Sachai. A rank. Then how powerful were the S ranks? Uttered Butcher. Well technically, his strength was worthy of S rank. He just didn't lead any villain groups and always worked alone. Thought Sachai. You see it, don't you Izuku? Asked Sachai, looking at Izuku. Just then, Butcher dropped his cleaver. I'm done, I guess villainy just isn't for me. He said, attempting to run. Hold up, said Izuku. Sitting back up, we defeated your boss, didn't we? Oh god, Butcher muttered. So, you want to join us? Asked Izuku. And no, of course not, said Butcher, before shriveling in fear. I mean of course. Yes, please don't hurt me. Well, too bad I guess. Come on guys, let's go, said Izuku. Wait, you're not forcing us to join you? Asked Butcher as some of the thugs got up, the surviving ones at least. Who do you think we are, your old boss? Izuku laughed as the group walked off. So, does that mean they are actual friends? Asked one of the thugs. As the rest of the thugs started to chatter, Butcher looked at the group in awe. Perhaps I should have joined them. Around two days or so passed after Raid's defeat, word of the League spread throughout the criminal underworld, despite the mainstream media covering up the involvement of the League and instead giving the credit to Endeavor, who apprehended Raid's unconscious body after he was defeated. Almost everyone who worked in the shadows knew about the real events that took place. As a result, many new thugs, crooks and cronies who wanted to make a name for themselves started to show up at the League of Villains' doorstep. As this happened, Izuku wanted into the bar, having given specific orders to wear his mask. He noticed a lot more people at the bar that day. Hey guys, what's going on here? I thought most of you would be hanging out at Tom's instead of here, asked Izuku, confused at the large gathering. That mission your team pulled off has attracted a massive crowd Izuku. Said all for one's voice, coming through the TV, I gotta say, I'm proud of you. 
Only one mission and you've already managed to secure a great amount of allies. Wow, I didn't know I did so much. Replied Izuku. Blushing, T thanks. That's our little boss for ya. Cheered Sachai. Raising his mug in the air. I think we all agree that a little celebration should be in order. Maybe even a promotion. Is that a thing here? Do you do promotions? What a much of bullshit. Muttered Shigaraki in a salty tone in the corner. I could have recruited twice as many people in half the time. Well someone sounds jealous. Teased Arena. Whatcha gonna do? Cry into your hands. Maybe if you water them enough you could get a hand tree. I'll rot your German face off you Nazi descendant. Yelled a ticked off Shigaraki. As the man was held back by Kirajiri, however. All for one turned his attention to Izuku. Young Midoriya, do you know why I asked you here? I was kinda hoping you'd tell me. Replied Izuku. As far as I'm concerned, you just called me for a party with the boys. You have your mask? Yes. Asked all for one. Correct. Replied Izuku. Well you better put it on. Said all for one. Because soon, you'll be meeting with over 100 new recruits in a secluded warehouse. The reveal shocked pretty much everyone in the room. Causing Izuku to stagger and almost fall over. Ida, excuse me. Exclaimed Izuku. You see, your meeting with Raid was originally supposed to be a small event, a blip in a much bigger plan. However, having failed to successfully recruit him, your battle with him and Raijin sent a much bigger ripple throughout the criminal underworld, putting the League of Villains on the map for other crime syndicates and revealing the League's existence too soon, explained all for one. And because you were main negotiator, many people throughout the criminal underworld assumed you are the true leader of the League of Villains. They can't be serious, Shigaraki yelled out, slamming his fist on the table. You come in for a week and already they think you're the leader. Ehahaha. <laughs> Congratulations Izu bro. We can officially call you the boss now. Laughed Sachai. I am not prepared for so much responsibility. Uttered Izuku nervously. I can barely handle my own group. Good job boss. I knew you can do. Teased Spinner. Yeah. Go get him boss. Followed Arena. We always believed in you, boss man. Teased Dabai in a laid back tone. Hiro. Please tell them this is all just a big misunderstanding, said Izuku to the bartender. Kirajiri looked at him in silence for a bit. I think you'll be a great boss, cheered Kirajiri, smiling. Goodbye free time, Izuku muttered, face planting on the counter. Come on now, young master, don't be so moody, it's only scary at first. Kirajiri cut in, you'll do great, young master, everyone else thought. Anyhow, resumed all for one, seeing all most of the people we recruited holds you in high regard. I think it is only fitting for the boss to meet his subordinates and deliver a speech to them to boost their morale for the upcoming attack on UA. Don't you agree, Midoriya? A speech? Asked Izuku. Indeed, to assert ourselves as a powerful organization, you shall deliver to your men a speech that outlines our goals, plans and benefits in order to sway them into helping us accomplish our goals. With their help, we will crush all might and rebuild the society hero created. Explained all for one, the speech will happen tomorrow night, which should give you plenty of time to think. Wait, sensei, please. Izuku begged, I can't do this in one day. This is way too much information for me to process. Good Luuk. All for one cut off, as the TV faded. With him gone, Izuku collapsed back on the counter. What am I going to do? I can't deliver speeches. Every time I stand in front of a crowd larger than 10 people I stiffen up so hard people think it's my quirk. I can't even talk without stuttering most of the time. Exclaimed Izuku in panic. You handled Raid pretty well. Sachai chimed in. What's the difference? The difference being that I was talking to someone one-on-one -on -one whom I was given background to and knew what to expect. Explained Izuku. So unless they give me the detailed background rundown of. Hey Kuro, how many people am I gonna be talking to? 128 128 people, I'm not gonna be able to make this work, exclaimed Izuku. Hey, Izuku, calm down, said Toga, walking up and wrapping her arm around him in a comforting tone. You managed to talk us into working for you didn't you? I'm sure you'll do great. Just give it your all. Yeah kid, you may not realize it but you have quite the way with words when things really count, said Dabai. You just need to know how to rub them the right way. To tug on the right strings, Spinner continued. To push the right buttons, added Magni. Isn't that how you managed to befriend us? Asked Sachai, thinking back on it all. Izuku realized how much he truly had done over the last few months. Not only was he able to make a small fortune selling support gear to assist villains, but he managed to gain so many friends, nay, followers by doing something he was never good at, talking. Even then, he still had no idea what was it he said that managed to get psychopathic killers and outcasts to show their soft sides to him. I need some time to think. Izuku said in a wobbly voice, there's a lot to unpack here. As the group watched him leave the bar, they started chattering among each other. So, you think the kid can do it? Asked Arena. Come on, you know the kid. He'll always figure out something, said Sachai. I mean, he's the smartest of the group, but he isn't all-knowing. Dabai cut in, truth be told, I'm actually kinda worried for him. 
He's going up against hard-boiled criminals who have seen the worst sides of society and lived through tragic lives. Most of them have either killed their own parents or nearly got killed by them. So how is he, who grew up in a somewhat fortunate home with a loving mother and a mostly safe life gonna sway and identify with those villains? The group thought in silence. With the thought of Izuku failing his speech becoming more and more real, a feeling of unease started to well up. Remember when he dropped in on him when he was sick? Asked Kirijiri Toga, trying to break the awkward silence. Yeah, that was so much fun, exclaimed Toga. I was so happy to finally feel the joy eating dinner with a loving family after so long. So you used to actually have a loving family, said Dabai, I envy you. My only experience in family dinners were eating alone in the shed because I botched my training and dad didn't allow failures to eat at the table. Ouch, that must really suck, said Sachai, patting him on the back. Don't worry, smiled Dabai, it's all the in the past now. But I do agree. That dinner with Izuku was amazing, especially considering it was the first time I ever experienced that kind of joy. A real eye-opener if you ask me. Wait, Toga thought, before slamming her palm with her fist, I got it. I know how we can help Izuku with his speech. You do. Everyone else called out, all piling up on Toga. Alright everyone, listen up, here's my idea. Izuku, Izuku, are you spacing out in class again? Asked the teacher for the fourth time that day. After all for one set him up as the leader of the League of Villains, Izuku felt the pressure on his shoulders get even heavier than before. Now, not only did he have to balance his normal life, but he also had to deal with a speech which is supposed to rile up over 100 villains to join in League and prepare for the big day, which is still half a year away. Ah, uh, sorry teach, exclaimed Izuku. Ah, uh, I'm not feeling too well. Can I head to the nurse's office real quick? Izuku, that's the third time you went there today. If you're not feeling too well, I can call your mother and tell her you're being sent you home early, would you like that? Asked the teacher. Yeah, I would, said Izuku, knowing he'd have an easier time to think of something at home. As he felt the classroom however, Katsuki eyed him down. Ever since that sludge event, the kid seemed to have calmed down, but still not enough to stay out of Izuku's hair forever, as he still pushed him around every now and then. However, until recently, he's been noticing a change in his behavioral pattern. He talked a lot more, was a lot more confident. It was as if he found friends. The mere idea of Izuku having friends angered the blonde teen for reasons beyond him. How dare he be so happy despite all of his shortcomings? How dare he smile more than him? Was it jealousy? Was it spite? Whatever the case, he knew something was up. However, to him, a Deku was still Deku. It wasn't worth his time to find out what he's been up to. To him, his behavioral change is just a mystery that one shouldn't bother with. As Izuku left the schoolyard however, he met with Dabai at the school gate. Dabai, what are you doing here? Asked Izuku. Ah, uh, hey, Izuku, said Dabai, can you come with me real quick? I have a place I want to show you. The, uh, sure, replied Izuku, still unsure of what was going on. Turning around, he noticed a portal opening, probably made by Kirijiri. Coming through the portal however, he came across what looked like the remains of a burnt-down forest. Dabai, what is this place? Asked Izuku. Dabai leaned down, picking up a sign with smiling might park written on it. My house is only a 20-minute drive from this place. It used to be a park dedicated to All Might. While it wasn't very popular, and the owner was getting old, it made my childhood. Back when my dad would impose brutal training on me, I would sneak off during training while he was on hero duty, and play in this park until the sun almost went down, then run back before my dad noticed. Explained Dabai. What happened to it? Asked Izuku. One day, Dad came home suspiciously late after his hero duties, claimed he had some business he wanted to take care of. The very next day, said Dabai, as his hands trembled for a moment, a wildfire burned the whole park down. Izuku's eyes widened in shock. I was devastated. The park owner, who was only a week away from retirement, received no compensation and was forced to sell the land, continued Dabai. He loved the park, took care of it every day, worked day and night, built all the infrastructures, and watched all of his years of hard work crumble in one night. Endeavor burned this park down, asked Izuku. That's what I accused him of doing, but he denied it, claiming I had no proof, said Dabai. In fact, because he never took me to that place, he then questioned me how I knew about the place and why I was so sad it was gone. He twisted my accusation and used it against me, proving that I was slacking off during training. In response, he bought these lands off just so no one could rebuild this place. Now this massive plot of charred dirt sits in the middle of a once flourishing neighborhood, who all moved away once their beloved park was destroyed. That monster, Izuku trembled with rage, I can't believe he would, cripple an entire community, ruining the lives of dozens just to keep me in line. Asked Dabai, I know, it's terrible, but looking at the other horrible things my dad has done just to make me obey him, this is tame in comparison. Walking towards a crater where a pond used to be, he sat by the edge of the crater, staring off at the distance, to perpetually live in my dad's shadow. 
forced into a life I never chose and lacking the power to fight back. That guilt you feel when so people get hurt by your dad because of you. The fear of making friends. Fearing they will suffer father's wrath. The anger when your dad would go to such extents just to make your life a living hell. Said Dabai, that is my pain. That is why I fight. Izuku stood there in silence, looking at him in awe. I, I never knew you went through this much. Uttered Izuku, but why tell me this? Dabai turned around, giving him a warm smile. Because you're my partner, he said, and I trust you. As he said that, Dabai got back up. Walking past him, exits that way, he said, pointing to his left, before walking off. Both amazed and confused, Izuku walked past what looked like a very old gate, running headfirst into Sachai. Sachai, what are you doing here? I came cause I wanted you to see something, said Sachai, leading him through another portal. Past that portal, he found himself in the hallway of a hospital. Looking to his right, he saw a young kid, aged around 5 minutes 7, lying in bed, with several life support machines near him. That is Daichai, my little brother, said Sachai. He's turning six in a week. What's wrong with him? Asked Izuku. A quirk-based malformation at birth, nearly invisible at first, but came crashing into him at the age of four, said Sachai. The doctors said that there was nothing to worry about, that treatments usually last a few months and that he'll be up in no time. That was nearly two years ago. Izuku's heart clenched, looking at him. My dad and I poured so much money in hopes of saving him. But back then, there was a massive increase in criminal activity due to a data leak that exposed Destro's manifesto, a banned document containing what the government considered extremist ideologies, to the public. Because of this, more and more injured heroes turned up, and the doctors were put on delay, explained Sachai. Every time we think we have an available doctor, another careless hero gets their left pinky toe stepped on or something and that doctor goes to cure them instead of suffering civilian, said Sachai. So they prioritized the lives of heroes over the lives of dying civilians, exclaimed Izuku. They risk their lives every day to keep us safe. Hence, if they aren't saved first, who will save us? Explained Sachai. That was their bullshit reasoning. Sachai pulled a can of beer out of his pocket, taking a drink. Now my dad's dead, and Daichai's the only bit of family I have left. For him, I'll rob, steal, heck, sell my left kidney if I have to, but I will keep him alive said Sachai. But one thing's for certain, the heroes will never listen to the words that come out the mouth of a villain. Then, like Dabai, he leaned against the wall, turning to Izuku, to be labeled the bad guy due to my wrongful actions, despite them being done it for a noble cause, to be ignored by the very people who promised me safety, and to have them take everything from me. That injustice you feel when people get away with destroying a building full of people to stop a villain, just because they wear fancy costumes and sport a license. But when you try to save a life, you are deemed evil for not having a permit to do so. Said Sachai, that is my pain. That is why I fight. Feeling a lot of deja vu here. Said Izuku, so why are you telling me this? Because you're my friend. Replied Sachai, and I believe in you. As Sachai walked off, Izuku ran into Spinner, whom took him through another portal to an alleyway. Okay, what the hell is going on here? Asked Izuku, first Dabai, then Sachai, now you, what are you gonna show me next? This is the alleyway where I met Stain, said Spinner, here we go again, said Izuku. Despite what I said in the past, I will admit that it isn't easy to live as a lizard, said Spinner. The amount of people that look down on you because you don't look human is surprisingly high. There is a reason why a majority of villains, especially low rank ones, are mutant quirk users. Spinner's hand brushed over a slash mark on the wall. I was mugged here, attacked by a group of thugs who target specifically non-human users, explained Spinner. I called for help, and luckily, I was able to attract a patrolling hero. However, looking at the exit of the alleyway, Spinner's teeth clenched. That hero just walked away, not even batting an eye, said Spinner. Only then, when all hope seemed lost, he came. In a flash of blood red and black, he disposed of my attackers and returned my wallet to me, saying don't rely on those fake heroes for help. If they can't view you mutant users as people, then they don't deserve to be called heroes, then left. Reaching into his pocket, Spinner revealed his makeshift mask. At that moment, I realized that heroes weren't the ones I should be praying safety to. Stain opened my eyes to this unfair world, and was leading a one-man crusade to fix it all. I was moved to my very core, to know that someone out there was willing to challenge the entire world of heroes, just to obtain the tomorrow he wishes to see, said Spinner, so why should he do this all alone? Turning to Izuku he smiled. To be belittled, the realization that there are people out there fighting on their own for something they might not even obtain. To strive for what you want, even if you might die in the process, just so you can live in a world where that hero did come and save me. Said Spinner, that is my pain. That is why I fight. Again, I feel like I'm being left out of something. Said Izuku, slowly seeing a pattern develop. Why are you showing me this? Because you're my buddy. Replied Spinner, and I admire you. Shortly after that, Spinner walked deep into the alleyway, once again disappearing via portal. 
Up next, twice. There's no real place I want to take you to. Said twice, I want to show you the whole world. I'm gonna go ahead and guess you actually meant the former. Said Izuku. Exactly not. Said twice in a frustrated tone. This condition of mine is just the best. Isn't it? I think it makes you pretty interesting. Said Izuku. I mean, when the last you ever met someone like you. See, this is why I had love. Why I love you guys, said twice. I joined you despite knowing deep down you'll find me too difficult a person to connect with and leave me, like the rest. I only have myself, my many, many selves. But you guys, you never lost your patience. Slowly, I felt like I fit right in, like this was how it was meant to be. For the first time, I felt I was appreciated. For the first time, I felt I want wanted. You're not contradicting yourself anymore, twice, said Izuku, realizing how fluent he became halfway through. I know, I'm surprised myself, said twice. It's as if liking this group is the one thing all of myself agree on. And as long as the mess within the melting pot of subconsciousness that is my brain can agree, I can feel whole. And after all these years of feeling like I'm in pieces, it's something I wish I can keep feeling forever. Twice looked over to Izuku, to keep myself whole, to make sure all of me obtains a happiness we can all agree on. And make other happy in the process. The fear of splitting again and this time not being able to pull myself back together. Said twice, that is my pain. That is why I fight. He then turned to Izuku. You're probably wondering why I'm telling you all this. Said twice. Well, actually, it's because you're my sworn enemy. Said twice, once again starting to contradict himself. And I hate you. Yup, sounds about right. Said Izuku. After walking for a bit, twice started to slow down. As Izuku saw Arena up ahead. Hey, said Arena, I didn't really want to do this, but Sachai convinced me after giving me two chocolate bars and 2,000 yen. I assume this is some sort of plan to guilt trip me into taking you all to Disneyland or something. Asked Izuku. What? No, said Arena, before we're thinking, I mean, will you? Hell no, replied Izuku. Figures, said Arena as another portal took them to a nearby dock. So, said Izuku, looking around, are we in Germany? I wish my powers had that range, yelled the voice of Kirijiri in the background. No, this is how I got to Japan, said Arena. You, swam, asked Izuku. What? Of course not you doof. And I thought you were supposed to be the smart one, said Arena. Well, my speech is gonna happen tonight and we're starting to lose daylight here, said Izuku. So my brain is not at its most active. Arena let out a sigh. Honestly, I always dread dockyards and airports, said Arena. It only serves to remind me of my crippling loneliness, looking out to sea. Arena secretly wished the sun would be setting to add to the dramatic effect. I was, never really a social kid back in the days. Not only was I spoiled rotten, but I had a powerful quirk that could make things and people shrink and grow. A shitty attitude and a powerful quirk. Name a worse combo, said Arena. How about a shitty attitude, a powerful quirk and spiky blonde hair, replied Izuku. Dolls and plush toys were all I had to fill the whole of my loneliness. But, in the end of the day... That's all they really are, dolls. Lifeless, inanimate objects that only say what you want them to say. Then, at the age of 14, young me had an idea. Make a doll who can talk, aka shrink people and keep them as pets. Said Arena. That plan backfired and I was kicked out of my home. I blame horrible parenting. Said Izuku. I've been on the run ever since. I was wanted in several different countries for the same old crimes. I guess because no one ever bothered to fix my attitude. I just couldn't handle it when someone said something or liked something I disliked. I guess I just came to the conclusion that maybe I was meant to be alone, said Arena. But truth be told, I just wished I could find someone willing to give me enough chances to grow and fix whatever problems I had with my attitude, which lead you here I assume, speculated Izuku, to lose all hope that you'd ever find someone who understands you. The frustration of never being able to better yourself because no one would ever give you a chance. The sadness that comes when you slowly come to terms that you'll forever be alone. Said Arena, that is my pain. That is why I fight. And you're telling me this because? Asked Izuku. Because you're my boss. Said Arena. And I respect you. As Arena walked off, Izuku ran into Magni next. Izuku, I know you're probably sick of hearing all of our backstories. Said Magni. Actually, I find all of your stories very intriguing and compelling. Replied Izuku, I just want to know, why? Why are you doing this? This is all going to make sense afterwards, explained Magni. But please, bear with us, there's not many of us left. It's alright, said Izuku. I'm with you, now, I assume you're gonna tell me a bit about yourself. Magni nodded, as she took him to an old room, filled with old books and a broken mirror. I was born with exceptional talents, my father said. Magni started, I was going to be a great pianist, my father said. Izuku looked around, the style of the glass windows. The elegance of the bed frame, they were in an old mansion. A violinist, a diplomat, an absolute beauty, my father said I was going to become all of that. I was going to be a lot of things according to father said Magni. 
everything except for his daughter. And deep down, I knew exactly why. Holding up an old picture, Izuku saw a young, beautiful girl standing by what appeared to be her father. Her mother, however, was not in the picture. There was only one thing father wanted me to become in actuality, said Magni, a way to replace his wife. Looking at the shattered mirror, Magni reflected upon her past. Father would praise me whenever I did good in arts or in math. Apparently, his wife was a physics major and dreamed of becoming an artist, said Magni. But one day, I scored exceptionally well in gymnastics. I was so happy to tell father because I always struggled in that course. However, how dare you? yelled Magna's father, slapping Magni across the face as his doting smile turned into one of demonic anger. With such gracefully limber arms and soft skin, how dare you exert them and run the possibility of callousing them? Apparently, his wife was horrendous at physical activities, so me being good at them wasn't staying true to the material, said Magni, taking out a pair of old rusted scissors. The past began to beat louder within Magni heart. In spite, I cut my hair short and bleached them a reddish magenta color, a complete contrast to my mother's black hair. If father wanted a new wife, then I was not gonna be it. I pulled a full transition into manhood, just to get back at my father. He tried to kill me in a fit of pure anger as a result. I killed him instead. The nightmare was finally over, explained Magni. But was I happy with what I had become? Was this truly what I wanted? What did I want? Putting the scissors back. To live a free life. One where I can do what I want and choose what I want to be. Said Magni, that is my pain. That is why I fight. Looking back at Izuku, she predicted what he was gonna say. You're my colleague, Izuku, said Magni, and I admire you. That is why I told you all this. As Izuku sat around, expecting Mr. Compress to be next, sure enough he showed up shortly after. Sorry if I'm late. This old mansion's a bona fide labyrinth, said Mr. Compress. I assume you two have something to share, asked Izuku. No, not quite, replied Mr. Compress. Not all of us have any complex backstories to tell you no. I just came in case you get yourself lost in this old mansion. Portals to the right, by the way. As Izuku left the room, he found the portal to his right, and after entering it, found himself face to face with Toga at the place where they first met. Nostalgic, isn't it? Asked Toga. Feels almost like yesterday when I kidnapped you. For you to say something like that so casually, replied Izuku. I recon you're the one behind this. I'm smarter than I look, huh? Asked Toga. But why? Asked Izuku. Why do all this? To help you with your speech, answered Toga. I figured that if you understood all of our pain and what pushed us to villainy, it would help broaden your understanding when you write that speech of yours for the new recruits. Maybe if you understood us more, it would help you write something that more villains can identify with. Well, Izuku uttered out. I never thought you guys would go this far just to help me. Of course we would, exclaimed Toga, leaning onto him. Never in our lives have we felt like we belonged anywhere until you showed up. You put this team together, made us as close as family, and showed us appreciation while the world was against us. As Toga's voice became wobbly, Izuku noticed tears falling down Toga's eyes. But all this pressure that's being put on you, it pains us. You made us happy, but at the cost of time, energy, all being expended while you still try to keep up a double life to make your mom happy. You still let yourself get beat up by that asshole Bakugo. You still force yourself to stay awake until 4am to plan out your next day. It's a very tiring job. One that makes us worry, that makes me worry. You have already went through so much to make us happy, said Toga, pushing Izuku onto her bed. So please, let us help you be happy too. Izuku's heart was beating, as he saw Toga's crying face. I'll make you happy, exclaimed Toga, because you're my partner and I love you. Looking back, Izuku still couldn't believe that this was the same girl who wanted to drink his blood only a few months back. However, this also made his heart jump, as he came to a sudden realization. Did she just confess to me? Thought Izuku, blushing. Well, Izuku joked, and I thought I was the crybaby. Ha ha ha. Hearing him laugh, Toga, despite still in tears, also started to laugh. I know. What's with that? Ha ha ha. Toga laughed. As the laughter died down, the two found themselves staring at each other longingly in the eyes, one on top another. As Toga slowly leaned down on Izuku, her lips quivered nervously. Seeing this, Izuku trembled a tad bit as well, as their lips were slowly about to meet. I can plan a knife into you no problem but I get this anxious just trying to kiss you. Laughed Toga nervously. What's with that? Hey, I'm nervous too if it makes you feel any better. Izuku laughed back. As the two got even closer, the golden beam of the sunset shone through the window, showering them in a heavenly gold curtain. A spark of light formed in the space between their lips, as that spark grew smaller and smaller. Izuku looked at Toga one last time before noticing that she closed her eyes. His closed shortly after, as the spark disappeared, and their lips connected. The kiss was brief, but to the two, it felt like an eternity, and they were okay with that. If they could spend the rest of their lives like that, they would be more than happy to. Just then, their lips disconnected. 
and the eternity ended too, as a small string of saliva formed between their mouths reflected the warm glow of the sun. Toga moved lower, trying to get a little more comfortable, only to feel something hard in between her crotch. Looking down, she gave a lustful smile at Izuku, who soon also realized it was up. The blondie undid her haid, as the buns rolled down to her shoulders, as her delicate hands slipped under Izuku's shirt, rubbing his chest. The boy let out a light moan, as his blushing indicated pleasure. Toga, pleased by what she saw, leaning in for a second, much more passionate kiss. Izuku took it, as their tongues became entangled like snakes, while Toga slowly took off Izuku's shirt. Deep in the young teen's mind, all he could think of was, the boy becomes a man. Then came a ringing from his phone. It was all for one. The speech got moved forward and was now in an hour. Manhood would have to wait. As Izuku got up, he quickly apologized to Toga for not being able to continue. Maybe we can finish this tomorrow. Asked Izuku, it's a Friday. Sure, replied Toga in a slightly disappointed tone. Feeling a bit guilty, Izuku saw the portal open next to him. However, before he could enter, Toga stopped him. Izuku, said Toga with an encouraging smile. Give them a speech worthy of Martin Luther King. Izuku smiled back, giving her a thumbs up. Got it. A group of middle schoolers were seen leaving Sumi Academy, a private school for some of society's top students. Hey, Agumo, you're serious about this? exclaimed one of the middle schoolers. I guess he must have some real dirt with his dad, replied Agumo. I mean, why else would Shoto Todoroki, the son of the second greatest hero himself, possibly need out help for? I guess he must not have many friends since he's homeschooled most of the time replied another. I mean, usually, when you call someone to help you run away from home, you call a close friend, not the sons of your dad's housemates. Well, at least he's paying us a good amount, replied Agumo. Still, I pray for him if he's this gung-ho about running away from his dad. Hey look, there he is now, exclaimed one of them. In front of them, they found a young boy with half red and half white hair. A burn scar patched over his left eye, as his overall composed demeanor hit a boy in panic. Yo, Todoroki, over here, cried out one of the middle schooler. Reiki, Asechechech, you want to give away his position, said Agumo. Yeah, Asechechech, said the third. However, that call out seemed to have worked, as Todoroki turned to them, running their direction. Uh, hi Todoroki-sama, said the tallest teen names Yuke. I'm friends with your housemaid's son. Skip the introductions, remember the plan, said Todoroki. Right, said Agumo, we disguise you, I lend you the electric bike, while we throw off the inevitable search party. You run to the docks and escape on a boat. Pretty much it, now do it, said Todoroki, and hurry up. All right, all right, said Agumo. Look, just because my quirk can change the color of anything I touch doesn't mean it works instantly. Now what color do you want your hair? Anything will do, replied Todoroki pink it is, replied Agumo, as a pinkish collot washed over the young boy's hair. This color change will last about three hours, said Agumo, so you better get moving. Now's my turn. Called out Reiki. My liquid latex quirk will cover up that scar nicely. With Todoroki fully disguised, he grabbed Yuke's bike, paid the three their money, and dashed off right as the chauffeur for the Endeavor agency pulled up. Oi kids, have any of you seen where a kid with red and white hair with a scar in his left eye? Asked the chauffeur. Oh yeah, we did, replied the three, pointing at the opposite direction where Todoroki dashed off. He went that way. Thanks kids, the chauffeur replied, picking up his speaker, all search units, West Yomi Street. As Todoroki, still disguised, pedaled as fast as he physically could. He had enough. Enough of Endeavor's abuse and enough of the Todoroki name. He was done with it all. He visited his mother that day one last time to say his goodbyes. And was planning to rid himself of Endeavor for good. Making his way to the docks, his plan was to hop on a fishing boat and sail off to some of the islands surrounding Japan. Having lived in a traditional Japanese house for most of his life, he figured living in a rural region wouldn't be so different. However, as he approached the docks, he noticed something off. There was a huge gathering of people at one of the warehouses. Curiosity getting the better of him, he slipped in, wanting to know what was going on. Inside, he found dozens of people, some armed, others with piercing and tattoos. A large gathering of crooks. So many, Todoroki muttered, staring at them from a distance. Boy, who's the pink head over here? Asked one of the villains, noticing him. Fearing that using his quirk might give away his position, Todoroki stiffened up, turning around facing two thugs. Are you here for the villain gathering? Asked one of the thugs. Villain. Gathering? Asked Todoroki. Yeah. The gathering of all new recruits to the League of Villain? Duh. Said the other. Uh. Yeah. Totally. I am. Totally League of Villains material. Todoroki improvised. Oh really? What's your villain name? Asked the thug. Villain. Name? Asked Todoroki. Don't tell me you don't have one. All villains need a name if they want to make it big, said the thug, like us. The Distract Destroy Brothers. One of us distracts, 
one of the thugs said, as his fingers flashed colorful lights, while the other destroys. Finished the other thug, revealing a cannon arm. Before Todoroki could fake another answer, some more of the crooks called them. They come on. The boss is about to deliver his speech. As the two thugs left, saving Todoroki from answering with something weird like Sakura Head, the boy was dragged along with the crowd, as he found himself in an abandoned warehouse full of criminals. As he was panicking inside, trying to make sense of all this, a figure was seen looking over them. Looking at this crowd, Todoroki expected the boss to be this 15 feet tall terror with 36 pack abs or something. But to his and many others' surprise, the boss was about his age. Back with Izuku, mask on and with a newly redesigned outfit, rocking a formal black and white suit and tie as a display of professionalism and formality, he gathered all he had learned from his own group. Reminiscing everything he's been through, he spoke from the bottom of his heart. Good evening, my fellow associates, he said with a booming voice full of confidence. Before we start, for all of those who came here just because they want to cause a ruckus and riot on the streets, this is no place for you. The League of Villains is not created to back up reckless actions. Every crime we commit, every hero we kill is done to send a message. A message on the behalf of all those who have been exploited and taken advantage of by this wretched society we live in. And that message is, we've had enough. The crowd cheered, some raising their weapons. I may not know every single one of your backstories, but I am sure that if I picked any one of you, you will tell me of the times before you were labeled villain and how you once wanted to also do what you thought was right. Villain, we must think to ourselves, what is that word? Officially speaking, it refers to the bad guy, the antagonist of a story, the one who does only wrong. Mightless continued, and I am sure that it was for that reason why heroes have chased us down. Suddenly, the lights which were dimmed earlier slowly lit up, as his face became for visible. I will not lie. I once wished I could become a hero, one that would make even All Might proud, said Izuku. But for every All Might in this world, there's one, no, five endeavors. For every one legitimate hero, there are five who will abuse their power to gain status, ones who want villains to remain so they have a butt to kick. Because without us, they can't be famous. Because there cannot be heroes, unless there are villains too. I now see, that to truly achieve a peaceful world that so many heroes strive to, one must get rid of the heroes first. Yeah, screw those heroes, ranted some of the crooks. This world has become blind towards us villains. They have forgotten that we are still human. So many just assume that there's a you. A equivalent academy that just pumps out villains. That were just there for the heroes to defeat and for them to admire at. Just then, Izuku started to point at them at random. You there, why did you choose to be a villain? Asked Mightless. I didn't. I was born to a poor family and had to make ends meet somehow. But due to my quirk of having teeth for hair, people were too scared to employ me. So what you're saying is that you didn't choose to be a villain? No, of course not. I just want to live a normal life. Is that so hard? Asked the crook. Sadly, my kind sir, it is in this world. Why should only some of us be born happy? Why should some of us be born with a predestined fate? Why is it that so many can be born with the means to obtain something others have to work years to just to get? This world is plagued by injustice, and at the root of it all are the heroes who think they can let our quirks decide out status, our quirks to decide out fates, said Mightless. They believe that they have us held in chains, that we are but the gladiators in their coliseum, ready to be eaten by their lions. All lights now point towards Mightless, his voice more passionate than ever. Well today, we break our chains. Today, we work towards our own future. Today, we have our second chance. Today, we will take our first step into the tomorrow we wish for. Mightless called out. Looking down, he could hear that he has completely won the crowd over. Now, for the finishing blow. To be chained by our predetermined destiny. To be forced into a role we never wanted to play. To be born the stepping stone of someone else. To yearn for a tomorrow where all might could have come from anywhere. Said Mightless, that is my pain. That is why I fight. Todoroki just got chills from his speech. Soon, he found himself so entranced, so moved, that a single tear rolled down his eye. Just then, he could have sworn that the boss was looking directly at him. And you may be wondering, why am I telling you all this? He continued. Just then, Todoroki felt his heart skip a beat. Because you're my friend, he said, and I have faith in you. As the speech was done, everyone in the warehouse cheered for the villain boss. Looking down at the crowd, Izuku felt a burning sense of pride, as, thanks to early preparations, he managed not to cry. As for now, the time is still young. So retreat to your abodes for now, for when the time is right, we will strike, and the world will know our name. Izuku called out. As the villains left the warehouse, satisfied with what they heard, they all chatted amongst themselves. As the warehouse slowly cleared out, however, Todoroki stayed behind. He thought about the words behind said, the way he said it, and how passionate he was about all of it. It was, inspiring. His curiosity was at its peak, he needed to know more. Who was he? 
From what he heard from other crooks, they call him Mightless, but that's about all he knows. He quickly ran to the back of the warehouse and up the stairs to the level where Mightless was at, hoping to find him. No luck, he was already gone. Just then, he remembered those last words coming from the boss, because you're my friend, and I have faith in you. Perhaps there was a savior for him after all. The young Todoroki cupped his hands together and prayed. He prayed that whoever this Mightless was, that he would one day meet him again. Just then, he heard the shutters open. As heroes from he Endeavor Agency pulled up. There he is. They called out, Endeavor Sama. We found him. Normally, the boy would start running. However, he took Mightless's words to heart. As for now, the time is still young. So retreat to your abodes for now. For when the time is right, we will strike, and the world will know our name. Thinking back, he thought of the message. From it he gathered that it was too early for him to run away. Become stronger. And when the day is right, defeat your father and break free. I'm glad I met you Mightless, he said to himself, as Endeavor's car showed up soon after, and I hope we meet again soon. The following day, after the speech, five consecutive crimes were committed almost at the exact same time. The news reporters were running short on men as they tried to cover each event that was happening. At one of these events, the area getting attacked was right near Tom's ramen shop. As the store owner looked out the window, he saw a group causing mass destruction and panic. As an expensive car was flipped over, a man crawled out, only to get pinned down by a grasshopper quirk user. You, I worked under your black company for over 20 years. You milked me for my effort until I was a broken shell of a man. No more. I'll kill you, yelled one of the villains. Hey 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 now, are you forgetting I am a very important figure in the marketing business for heroes? Asked the supposed boss as his wig fell off, revealing a balding head. If you so much as lay a finger on me, the heroes will. The heroes don't mean shit to us anymore. Replied another one of the villains, we had our eyes opened. They are a bunch of leeches profiting off this illusion we call peace, and you are just a parasite on said leech. Eek, I'll fire you. I get my lawyers and ruin all of your worthless lives, yelled the boss in panic. Suddenly, a blast of flames knocked over most of the villains, as a man covered in flames entered the scene. E Endeavor, thank God you're here. Now, show these low lives their place, exclaimed the black company boss. As the hero approached the down villains, they aimed another fire blast at them, attempting to make sure they stay down for good. Yeah, go Endeavor, kick these villains' asses, cheered the crowd. The villains, struggling to get up, eyed down the hero with hatred in their eyes. Figures you'd be on their side, Endeavor, uttered the grasshopper villain, you absolute hypocrite. In response, the hero doused them in flames, with an indifferent look on his face as he gestured his psychics to put out the fire before they burned to death. As the flames were extinguished, the hero stoically walked off, with a cheering crowd behind him. Endeavor, Endeavor, you have done it again. This is the fourth crime you've stopped today, you are on fire, exclaimed a new reporter, running up to interview the hero. Get lost, Endeavor replied, as the reporter squealed at his attitude. He's so cool. However, as the hero was about to leave, he was stopped by a familiar face. As brutal as ever, Hanji, asked Tom, leaving his rum and shop. What the hell are you doing here? Asked Endeavor back. Shouldn't you be in prison? I served my time, replied Tom. Not that it matters to you, does it? Since you don't believe in forgiveness nor kindness. What do you want? Yelled Endeavor. Tom let out a sigh. Your son stopped at my ramen shop yesterday, said Tom, again. I always wonder where he runs off to when he wants to make a scene, grunted Endeavor. Endeavor, for the last time, you have to stop this nonsense. Todoroki isn't you, nor does he want to be you. If you want him to love you, then support what he wants to be, said Tom. Why should I let a villain tell me how to parent? Asked Endeavor in a threatening tone. Because I'm sick and tired of your son's silent wails. Do you want to see a kitten with a missing leg every single day? I know I sure don't, said Tom. Don't you dare compare Shoto to a kitten. Endeavor grunted, he's my pride and masterpiece. If you don't want him in your shop, then just kick him out. Tom let out a sigh of frustration. Listen, NG, buddy, I know we had some dirt in the past, said Tom. By dirt, you mean nearly killing me and all might nearly once every week. Endeavor cut off. But I just want to ask you, as a friend, a person who really just wants to do the right thing, please, for the love of God, show your kid some love, please. Tom asked sternly, and why should I listen to you? Asked Endeavor. Just then, Tom cracked his knuckles. Because if I see that miserable kitten one more time in my shop, I'm gonna have to put him down. Replied Tom menacingly. And we both know he'll inevitably come back. A drop of sweat fell down Endeavor's head. You know I can arrest you for making such a threat, right? Asked Endeavor. I'm well aware. Replied Tom. So go ahead, arrest me. Endeavor gritted his teeth as he shot a glare at the former villain. Back at the Todoroki residence, Fayumi, the elder sister and only daughter of the Todoroki household came back from her round of shopping. As she entered the main entrance, she was greeted by Natsuo, studying for one of his college exams. Hey lil bro, Fayumi greeted. 
However, Natsuo remained quiet, not even acknowledging her presence. Still mad, she asked, Listen, I know Shoto. Natsuo turned around, glaring at her. I mean he got beat by dad, again, for running away. She continued, But you have to understand that Shoto's a strong kid, he can take it. And once he becomes a hero, he'll finally be happy. However, Natsuo didn't share her sense of optimism. I don't know how you do it, said Natsuo. How you somehow managed to come up with such ludicrous lies and still manage to fool yourself. Natsuo, open your eyes sis. Dad doesn't view him like a son. He doesn't even let us address him by his name. What do you think is gonna become of someone that isolated, that sheltered from the world? Someone who's known nothing but hatred. We are watching our poor innocent little brother being slowly turned into some monster and all you can do is smile and pretend everything is okay. Natsuo yelled, smacking the groceries out of Fayumi's hands. Natsuo, Fayumi muttered out, her eyes hidden by her hair's shadow. I am sure it'll all be fine one day. Well that day hasn't come now has it? Natsuo yelled back. We are invisible to dad and watching him torture our little brother and you talk like he'll burst in through the door and take him to Disneyland or something. Grab your stuff Shoto, Endeavor said bursting through the door. We're going to Disneyland. Fuck off, Natsuo exclaimed. Somewhere, hidden in the Kamino ward of Yokohama, lies a dark lair, decorated in an assortment of iron pipes. This was the lair of a living legend in the criminal underworld, a mastermind who has his handprint embedded in almost every major crime ever committed in the world's history since the start of the Dark Ages. With such a reputation, one shudders to imagine what heinous plot such a devious tyrant could be plotting. God damn it, exclaimed the villain boss, I pulled a common again. Reroll, damn gacha games. Just then, a ringing was heard, catching the boss's attention. Looking at himself, he panicked, as he was still in his pajamas and hadn't even gotten dressed yet. Quickly putting on his suit, he dashed to his wall of monitors, grabbing a cup of tea to clear his voice, then spitting it out after drinking it too quickly and burning himself, before finally answering the call. Yes, what is it? Asked all for one, acting all serious. Hey boss, said Toga, as her and the rest of the league, besides Izuku, was seen. I know you probably weren't expecting us, but we would like to ask a favor of you. A favor. Has Izuku gone into some trouble? Asked all for one. Trouble? Though, no, you misunderstand, sir. Said Sachai. Rather, with all the success Izuku has brought so far, I feel as though a reward for him is in order. I mean, he works real hard for the league. And I mean, he's just a young 14-year-old who's been through a lot recently. Get to the point. Said all for one. We'd like a day off. Irina said bluntly. A day we can take where we aren't stealing heroes info or assassinating someone. All for one shook his head. Absolutely not replied the villain boss. It is impartial that we remain active at all times to stay ahead of the heroes. Why call for a day off anyways? Should I tell him? Ask Spinner. And kill any chance we'd have at this thing. No way, replied Dabai. What thing? Asked all for one. What's going on here? Just then, Kurajiri picked up an envelope and read it. Congratulations, Shuichi Aguchi. You have won a super family size coupon for Disneyland Japan. Bring as many guests as you like to come enjoy these amazing events before it's too late. Now featuring a Mass Kawaii Classic Partnership event. All inclusive. Read Kurajiri. Shit shit shit. Exclaimed Magni and Spinner. Don't read it out loud. All for one froze. You just wanted to spend your day at this place, right? Asked all for one. Why yes. Everyone in the room sighed in disappointment. Almost certain he was gonna say no. I told you guys this was never gonna work, said Shigaraki, the most bummed out of them all. We were really sorry for bothering. Wait, where'd he go? Apologized Arena, before realizing All for One was missing from the screen. Back on All for One's side, he shut off his video settings, as he ruffled his bald head. I really wanna go too. He was a huge Kawaii Classic fan. I can't believe they're actually doing this partnership event. Oh my god. And here I thought all I had left of them was the spin-off gacha games. But now this, I have to go I have to go I have to. Slapping himself in the face however, he hardened his resolve. No, I am all for one. These people look up to me as a role model. I can't let my love for this franchise to cloud my judgment. I'll have to deny them, even if I miss my once in a lifetime chance. Thought all for one, as he turned his video back, crying internally, so long, Mo-chan. Sorry about that. Technical difficulties on my side. Said all for one, as for your answer, absolutely Anonii chan Are you still there? Asked a high-pitched girl voice in the background. My phone. I forgot to turn off my phone. Thought all for one. Wait. That voice. Said Spinner. Boss, are you playing Kawaii Classic? Doki Doki Clash. By any chance. What? No. Don't be ridiculous. All for one replied in a panicky voice as he got up, running to the other side of the room to turn off his phone. But in doing so, he forgot to turn off his video as everyone saw his bottom half still in eggplant pajamas. Should we tell him? Asked twice, trying his hardest to not laugh. No, this is way too fun. 
replied Dabai, his face red from holding and laughter. As all for one then realized his video wasn't off, he came dashing back, trying to turn it off, only to trip on one of the numerous pipes littered in his hideout, as he knocked over a shelf full of Funko Pops of anime girls and doujins. Oh my god it gets so much better, chuckled Toga. Is that trap yai? asked Magni, getting a closer look. They are for, uh, anatomy research. I had an assistant that was really into this stuff. I swear it's not all for one state. Trying to put his hidden collection back in place, only for his PJS to slip, revealing a Hegao boxers. Leader, you absolute degenerate. Kirajiri uttered in disbelief, and I thought I was the only one. As he finally got everything sorted in place, all for one, breathing heavily, sat back down to face his subordinates, who stood there with a smug look on them, letting out a sigh of defeat. All for one had only one thing to say. So, who's down for Disneyland? Asked All for One. Ready when you are, weep. Laughed Shigaraki. Real funny, Shigaraki. Real funny. Said All for One, hanging up the call, before crying into his own arms, despite not having eyes. A day off at Disneyland. Asked Izuku. Yeah, all included, we all show up, have a merry time, and leave. Explained Toga, how's that sound? I think that sounds lovely. Replied Inko. By the way, Toga, my mom, mom, Toga. Izuku introduced. I see, said Inko, so you must be the girl I heard Izuku talk about. I'm so glad my baby boy has a girlfriend now. They grow up so fast don't they? Mom, please. Izuku muttered in embarrassment. Yeah, they do, replied Toga. It's a pleasure to meet you, Miss Midoriya. Oh, would you like to see Izuku's baby pictures? Asked Inko. Mom, Izuku ran in, tackling her before she could embarrass him even more. However, instead of knocking her out like he had hoped, it instead felt like he ran face first into a wall. What is she a boulder? Kaya. He's so adorable. Toga squealed, seeing his baby pictures. I can still remember the little kicks he'd do when I first bathed him. He was clutching on to be like a koala. Inko described in graphic detail, as Izuku lied on the floor, watching his dignity fall apart. Later that day, Inko drove the two to the location, as they immediately ran off to meet up with the rest of the group, while making sure that they didn't make it seem like they were together, as the rest of the team didn't really look friendly. Took you too long enough, said Dabai, wearing a Mickey Mouse hat. Sorry, mom just wouldn't shut up, said Izuku, and Toga was too entranced by my embarrassing childhood stories. Did you know he used to run in a small All Might costume and yell I am here? Every time his mom called him, said Toga. Toga, please, I've suffered enough embarrassment for one day, cried Izuku. Oh, I doubt you're taking that prize, Izubro, said Sachai. Why do you mean? Asked Izuku. Sachai leaned in, whispering to Izuku about what happened with them and all for one early on in the morning, as Izuku's saddened face turned to hysterical laughter. No way, you're joking with me, exclaimed Izuku. I'm serious. In fact, he came here just five minutes ago. He has a fake face to camouflage himself, but I swear to God he's here, said Sachai. Well, that's not what matters, buddy, said Spinner. Come on, let's have some fun. The young Shoto was expecting the worst out of his dad after what happened yesterday. Sure, he's run off before, but this time in particular, he did so before his dad could give him any training and even left a letter claiming he wasn't coming back. To make matters worse, his dad was also heavily disgusted in his choice of disguise, and with most of the clothes he packed being All Might themed, the kid was fully expecting the beatings he got to continue the following day. So this father and son trip was the last thing he was expecting. Was his dad trying to apologize, to get him to stop running off? If so, then it would be too good to be true. But at the same time, from his manner of speech to his almost reluctant smiles made him believe this was forced. But who could have forced Endeavor, the strongest hero second only to All Might, to do something against their will? Some sort of blackmail perhaps. All this was all he could think of, as he and Inji descended from Splash Mountain, as the looks on their faces when the picture was snapped looked so artificial that people thought they did it ironically as a joke. However, seeing his father's forced smile and hearing his passive-aggressive words for the whole day was way more uncomfortable to him than getting the belt, so, the first chance he got, he asked his dad if he could buy him a drink while he used the bathroom, and, while the hero waited in the unnecessarily long line, he ran off to spend the day alone. That was, however, a horrible mistake. Looking around, he saw many kids around his age, some younger, some older, but almost all of them came in groups. Seeing this, Shoto felt that crippling loneliness within him get stronger. Deep down, he felt like this was planned all along, a way to show him that even if he got out, the world wouldn't welcome him. It was the ultimate way of keeping him in. Whether it was intentional or not, his dad taking him here was the ultimate punishment he could have had. Hey, you lost or something? Asked a voice behind him. Or so he thought. Don't mind him Izuku. I'm sure he's just waiting for someone. Replied a female voice. Turning around, he saw a small group of people, of varying ages at that. 
The one that talked to him, a young, green-haired boy around his age, walked up to him, holding two cones of Mickey-shaped ice cream cones, passing him one. The guy at the counter messed up our order and gave us one too many. We'd eat it and call ourselves lucky but we took too long and now it's on the verge of melting, so here, my treat, said the boy, passing him a cone. Oh, there's no need, replied Shoto, using his ice side to freeze up the melting ice cream. Wow, a nice quirk. Those must really come in handy, especially in a scorching day like this, laughed the boy. Oh, uh, the name's Izuku, Izuku Midoriya. I'm Himiko Toga. The girl next to him cut in, and the guys that are getting kicked out of the present mic experience singing booth are Sachai and Arena. As she said that, the singing booth behind the group had two people, a guy and a girl, both around their earliest 20 seconds, getting tossed out by an angry mob with bloody ears. Hey, they stayed inside for a full minute, new record, laughed the group's lizard man. Oh, uh, Shuichi Agachi. H. Hi. Todoroki greeted nervously. I am a S.H. Shoto. Sorry, I don't really do social interactions. Oh, oh, that's no problem, replied Izuku. Recognizing who he was talking to, Shoto, right. It's nice to meet you. I assume you're waiting for someone. No, replied Shoto in a depressed tone. Honestly, I didn't even want to come here. But dad all of a sudden dragged me for family bonding or something of that nature. But honestly, I just want to go home. On the happiest place on earth, exclaimed Toga, grabbing him by the sleeves. No way, sir. Turn that frown upside down. You're coming with us. Toga, we can't just randomly grab someone we barely know, said Izuku. Well, we'll get to know him by the end of this. Now come on. Space Mountain is just up ahead exclaimed Toga. Last one there's a dead endeavor. Wait for us damn it, exclaimed Spinner in twice as they ran after her, knowing how long the line is. Welp, guess he's coming along then, said Izuku. At the ride, where Izuku arrived last, he caught up to the rest of the group as he saw Shoto awkwardly trying to socialize with his group and failing miserably at it. Letting out a sigh, he walked towards them, slowly chiming in on their conversation. But that's when she said just five more. Finished Spinner, as everyone laughed. Anyways, that's how my parents got banned from the Endangered Insects Expo. Dang, she ate five species of larvae to extinction. Put that on her next resume. Sachai replied. Anyways, what about you, Shoto? Got any funny stories you got to share with us? Asked Toga. Uh, well I. Shoto muttered nervously, slightly intimidated by their aggressive friendliness. I, uh, don't really have one. Oh, don't be shy, kid. Magni said, patting him on the back. I'm sure you have at least something worth talking about. It's just that I don't feel comfortable sharing my personal stories with you guys, said Todoroki, still not sure how he got roped into all this. Just then, Magni took Todoroki and separated him slightly from the group, whispering to him, If you don't have anything to say, then here's a trick, make stuff up. She suggested, Make stuff up, asked Todoroki. Yeah, everyone does it. No story is complete without at least some form of exaggeration. In fact, when Shuichi told that story to me the first time, his parents were at an insectorium and only ate two species of larvae into extinction. The funnest part about sharing stories is the fact that no one will question it. I mean, I guess I could try it, said Todoroki. Yeah, now that's the spirit. Now come on, I'll even give you a prompt to build off of. A what? Just then, Magni turned to the rest of the group, now including Izuku, talking to them out loud. Hey, Shoto, tell the rest of the group about the time your dad pantsed Endeavor, exclaimed Magni. When he did what? Shoto exclaimed. No way. He did that. Was he arrested afterwards? Replied twice. Your dad's still alive, right? Asked Mr. Compress, also intrigued. Shoto was far past the denying phase, as everyone seemed to have bought the story. Well, so he decided to improvise, while imagining the scene himself, only with him being the pantser. My dad was a huge Endeavor fan. Todoroki lied, so when he saw Endeavor take out a villain with ease, he came running to him asking for an autograph. However, just then, he tripped, as he pulled down the hero's pants in the process. What happened next? Asked Spinner. How'd your dad make it out there? Well, since the surrounding area around him were on fire, Endeavor's pants ended up catching fire causing him to hobble around in his undies in a panic, trying frantically to put out the flames. Todoroki chuckled, just imagining the scenario. But I thought Endeavor's costume was fireproof, asked Spinner. The inside isn't, explained Todoroki, unintentionally giving away a flaw in the hero's armor design. The rest of the league chuckled at the imagery, even Izuku smirked thinking about it. Anyways, amidst his panic, the villain he was fighting fires a rocket at him, and while trying to dodge, the rocket snagged his down pants, dragging him in his red speedo halfway across the streets from everyone to see. Todoroki continued, trying not to laugh. Man, what a riot, laughed the League, to think Endeavor would make such a fool of himself. I know right, Todoroki laughed. Hey jackasses, move it, a voice yelled from behind. Looking ahead, the line has already moved on and none of them noticed. 
Wow, I never thought the line would move this quickly, said Todoroki, sorry. Time moves quicker when you're having fun, explained Sachai. Now let's go. Hope there's room for all of us to ride in one go. Sadly however, the seats were one short. Looking at each other, they debated on who to leave behind. It's fine guys, said Todoroki, go ahead. Knowing that it was the most logical decision, seeing how he was just a tag along, they were about to leave him behind. Until, man, I've wanted to ride this for so long, it's so exciting, exclaimed Sachai. By the way, I have a tendency to sing whenever I'm riding a very exciting ride. Hope you don't mind. I was kidding, cried Sachai, as the group departed without him. The ride itself was short, exciting, and satisfying. However, to Todoroki it was so much more. For once in his life, he knew what it was like to be part of a friend group. As they reached the end of the ride, heading for the exit, Izuku decided to talk to Todoroki, curious to what his life was actually like under Endeavor, as all stories he's heard came from Dabai's assumptions. So, where is your dad anyways? Asked Izuku. Wouldn't he be worried by now? I hope he's worried, replied Shoto. Honestly, having him around ruins the whole experience. Knowing they were gonna get to that eventually, Izuku decided to address in the elephant in the room. So, that scar of yours, family incident, replied Todoroki. My dad was abusive to me and mom, and she ended up snapping mentally. I got caught in the crossfire. Izuku expected many things from the son of the number two hero, such bluntness was not one of them. Having him answer such a heavy topic so casually was shocking enough for the kid to stagger a little bit, tripping on his own leg and nearly falling over. Are you okay? asked Todoroki, creating an ice platform below Izuku to catch him. Why yeah? replied Izuku, still shocked, it's just, wow, d did I do something wrong? asked Todoroki, concerned and even scared. What? No, of course not, said Izuku, I just, I didn't expect such bluntness. I mean, no one would address abuse of this magnitude so casually. I guess I was just caught off guard, haha. Ha. Hearing this, Todoroki's face shifted slightly, giving off a more depressed tone. I'm sorry I'm a failure at basic communication. He replied, Shoto, don't say that. Izuku exclaimed, just because you don't talk like most people doesn't make you a failure, it just makes you. You, makes me, me, asked Todoroki, Izuku, you're not making sense. Well, how do I put it? Izuku said to himself, it just means you have a trait more people can recognize you by. It means you're more, unique, exotic, that you stand out more than the rest, that you can be differentiated in more ways than just your quirk. Unique, Todoroki said, looking at his hands, trembling, I wish could be unique. But it's all just lies. My quirk, it serves as a reminder that I'm just like my dad if I ever use it. But deep down, I know that as long as I have it, I'm just my father in another man's mask. Hearing this, Izuku grabbed the back of Todoroki's head, turning it towards Spinner. My friend here's a literal lizard, said Izuku. Now look around you, and tell me how many lizard quirk users you see. Looking around, Todoroki immediately spotted an iguana user, followed by a salamander user, then a chameleon user. Because of how much they stand out from the rest. They were surprisingly easy to spot. A lot of them, replied Todoroki. Exactly, replied Izuku. Now tell me, since they are all lizards, it would be logical that they are all related, right? That's absurd. Why would they, replied Todoroki. Exactly, so why should your quirk tell you who you are? Asked Izuku. I don't care what your dad did to you with fire, but you gotta remember. That power you wield, that's yours and yours only. So don't let your dad win by having him convince you your fate belongs to him. Todoroki's eyes brightened, hearing that. Who was this kid? And why was he going so far to help him? Initially, he just viewed this group as a group of very nice people that took pity on him. But now, he was more intrigued than ever. Who were they, really? This train of thoughts derailed however, as he noticed someone running in. Hey, is that? Dabai, asked Toga, as she saw him running in. Guys, exclaimed Dabai, with one of Izuku's support gear to help hide his scars. Where the hell were you? I told you it will only take a minute in the poof. You were all gone. Haha, <laughs> sorry, we got tired waiting. Chuckled the group. However, Dabai smirked back. Well joke's on you. When you were gone, I won this jumbo-sized Totoro plush doll and I'm keeping it. He exclaimed, pulling a giant plush toy out of seemingly thin air. Amazing practically everyone. Why does this guy seem so familiar? Thought Todoroki. Just then, Sachai, who just came off Space Mountain, came running in. Ha ha guys. Real funny. Just because I planned to sing, you bring Shoto along instead of me. Ranted Sachai. Shoto. Dabai muttered in shock. Noticing his little brother. Just then, he grabbed Izuku and Toga, pulling them away from Shoto. All right, which one of you invited him into the group? Whispered Dabai in a pissed off manner. Woe there Dabai. Why the long face? I thought you'd be glad to be reunited with your little brother. Replied Izuku. Wait, Shoto's your little brother? Asked Toga. Well of course I'm glad, but if he recognizes me, then it's all over for me in the league. He'll inform dad or dad will somehow find out. Then the cover of our entire organization will be blown. 
exclaimed Dabai. We'll just recruit him then, said Toga, the more the merrier. We are not involving my little brother in this. I'm doing all this so he will never get hurt again. So if any of you ever try to corrupt his pure innocence, I'll fucking murder you. Dabai whispered back, now, play it cool, don't reveal shit about me to him and we'll turn around in three, two, one, ehahaha. <laughs> Dabai fake laughed, man, you guys are so funny. What was the joke Dabai? Asked Spinner, your mom. Dabai replied, pointing finger guns at him. How dare you? I will end you like how my mom ended seven species of bugs. Spinner yelled in rage as everyone went in to deal with him. Seeing this, Todoroki decided to help out too by freezing Spinner in place. There, I got him, said Todoroki. Great job, kid. Complimented Sachai, really helped us out there. Ah really? Todoroki uttered out. Yeah, that ice quirk of yours. That was awesome, said Mr. Compress, giving him a thumbs up. It was so awful I nearly threw up, said twice, giving him a thumbs up as well. Hearing twice, tears came out of Todoroki's eyes, as he didn't know about twice's condition. Wait no, twice didn't mean it let us explain. Everyone else frantically tried explaining. After that chain of events, they spent the rest of the day touring the whole park, enjoying the rides, snapping pictures of each other and chatting about stories they may or may not have made up. As it was getting late, the group noticed that they were talking for so long, they worked up an appetite. Don't worry guys, my coupon came with included meals, said Spinner. Now, we have a choice of three bento boxes, which we can fetch at, or we can just grab a grub here, said Todoroki, pointing at a sign that said Sapphire Steaks. Sapphire Steaks. That steakhouse makes almost every top three list for the most expensive restaurants in all of Japan. Are you sure about this? The group exclaimed. Don't worry, said Todoroki, it's on me, or should I say, on my dad. Back with Endeavor. Fucking finally. I can't believe the lines to get a simple drink would be this long, said Endeavor, finally making it. I'll have a panda shake that'll be 15 yen said the cashier. Sure, let me just. Endeavor replied, checking his wallet. Where the fuck's my credit card? Back with the group, they stood there, jaw agape. Why you sure about this? Asked Toga, taken aback. With all of us together, this whole meal might cost you well over 100 zero yen. Hey, you've been treating for the whole day, said Todoroki, flashing an evil grin as he imagined what his dad must be going through. I think it's time to repay the favor. Dabai, figuring out Shoto's ulterior motives, could do nothing but try to hide his tears of pride. I'm so proud of you little bro, thought Dabai. We love you Shadowu. Everyone else cried, leaping onto him with tears of joy. Fast forward to them at the restaurant. They picked a balcony view with enough shade to not bake alive in the hot sun of late May. Looking down the balcony, the Kawaii Classic Convention can be visibly seen. Hey, isn't this the place our boss is at? Asked Spinner, chowing down on a T-bone steak. Boss? Asked Shoto. We work part-time at a small business. Dabai improvised. Apparently, our boss is attending the convention down there. Hey, wanna see who finds him first? Asked Toga. You're going down sucka. Replied Izuku, as the two searched the crowd for their boss. Wow, there are a lot of cosplayers down there. Said Mr. Compress. You'd fit right in, Magni. Bold of you to assume I haven't cosplayed before, replied Magni. So what is this whole kawaii classic thing even supposed to be? Asked Todoroki. From what I gather, this old magical girl anime, where five girls would become kawaii cuties at night, magical warriors each representing a different attribute, including love, courage, kindness, murderous violence and peace, explained Izuku. Together they would battle the forces of Saivalaga and stop her from robbing the world of kindness, stealing dreams and violently raping all little boys in the world to awaken an evil eldritch abomination to cause Jewish genocide. Overall, pretty kitty stuff. What the hell? Todoroki uttered. And now, ladies and gentlemen, the Galaxia Stars, said the announcer. Suddenly, a group of idols came on stage at the center of the convention, singing a remix of show's main theme song, which starts off all whimsical and twinkly, until it one of the girls busts out an electric guitar, as the song shifts into hard rock for 30 seconds, before shifting back. Hey look, I found him. Over there, exclaimed Toga. No way, Izuku replied. No really, right there, lip syncing with the singers and doing this girly ass dance. That's him, said Toga. Holy shit you're right, exclaimed Izuku. Oh my god this is priceless, laughed Spinner as he took his phone out to record. Back with all for one, still dancing to the tune of his favorite song, he suddenly got chills down his spine. Why does it feel like I'm being watched? Thought all for one. After lunch, the group left the restaurant, stuffed and satisfied. Man, I ate like a king, said Sachai, letting out a satisfied sigh. Yeah, that really hit the spot, replied Toga. I'm starving at that that meal. Said twice. Excuse me. Asked Todoroki. Oh wait, no, I get it. Looking at the sky, they noticed that it was almost sunset. Wow, we stayed for that long. Asked Toga. Here I thought we were there for an hour at most. Well, we were about to leave. Until you guys started ordering alcohol. 
said Todoroki. RB, said every one member at legal drinking age in the league. Looking up however, Todoroki felt warm, fulfilled and satisfied. Have days always been this short? Thought Todoroki. Hey, what are you spacing out for, Shoto? We still have one last event to catch, said Spinner. You mean the light show? That's always one of my favorite events at the park, exclaimed Izuku. Well, let's go see it then, said Arena. Todoroki, on the other hand, was hesitant. Was it really okay for him to be gone for that long? Would it really change anything if he didn't come? It was just one day. Heck, he doubted he was ever even gonna meet these guys anymore. So, will it be okay to be gone for so long? Just then, he remembered what Izuku said. You are you Todoroki, don't let your father decide what you're gonna become. He was right. Why should he listen to his dad? This was his life, it was his choice. So, Shoto, said Izuku, breaking him out of his trance, you coming. Todoroki looked at Izuku, giving him a warm and genuine smile, one of gratitude. Of course, S-H-O-T-O. A voice suddenly called out. Crap, it's my dad, exclaimed Todoroki. Wait, him, exclaimed Arena, pointing at the tall, Burly red hair barreling through the crowd, that's Endeavor. Endeavor's your father. Everyone who didn't know shouted. Why yeah, said Todoroki, as he came crashing back down to reality. Of course they would abandon him once they found out. No one would dare oppose his dad. In the end, he was forever to be his father's prisoner. But, deep down, he really didn't want to go. All he wanted was just to leap into their arms. To stay for just a minute, no, a moment longer. But in the end, they were just normal people, nothing special. Just then, a voice called out. Hey, is that Endeavor I see? Yelled Izuku, pointing to him. Suddenly, the crowd went wild, as, like a tidal wave, crowds of people flooded Endeavor. The hero, being overwhelmed, was unable to see even four feet in front of him, as it was covered by fans asking for an autograph. Amidst this confusion, the league took off the opposite way, trying to fight the crowd of people. What the? What's? Todoroki uttered out, confused. Todoroki, come on. Izuku called out. You wanted to spend more time with us, right? Tears ran down Todoroki's eyes. These were not just normal people, these were true friends. With an even brighter smile, he called back. Yes, however, the flood was too overwhelming. As he slowly got cut off from the rest of the group, he could use his ice quirk, but that would just give away his spot. Just then, he saw a hand, reaching for him. Reaching out, he grabbed hold. Then another, he grabbed that one too. As he tried to fight the stream of people, they eventually were thin and gout. Then, with one more push, he lunged forward, falling into Izuku and Toga who were revealing to be the ones reaching out for him. Got you. Izuku smiled. As Todoroki got up, he saw everyone else, as he tried to choke out as many ways to thank them as possible. But the joy was just too overwhelming, as he stuttered on every line. Just then, multicolored light decorated the background. As everyone turned their eyes to their destination, the light show. With his heart finally calm, Todoroki finally talked. Thanks you, he said, for this amazing day you all gave me. Everyone looked at each other, before turning to him, smiling back. No problem. As Todoroki sat by a nearby bench to get himself comfortable, he was accompanied by Izuku, who sat on his left side, then Toga, who sat on his right. Her presence, cramping up the space, forced the three to really press up against one another. But Todoroki didn't care. He was happy, truly happy. Hey, Todoroki said to the group, I know I just met you guys, but perhaps we could share our contact info. Just then, Todoroki heard a ring in his phone. Picking it up, he found a new notification, the first one in over nine years, as he blocked any and all notifications involving his dad. You have been added to, LOV group chat. The boy smiled, not even questioning what LOV stood for, as he gazed at the beauty displayed in front of him, slowly leaning into the person on his left, not even caring who it was. By the way, said Sachai, I wonder where Shigaraki went. Meanwhile, in the kids' section, Shigaraki can be seen riding the Choo Choo train ride, his 25th time. All the other kids were too scared to even approach the attraction, as the employees asked for him to leave. Instead, with childlike innocence sprinkled onto his face, he continued. This is fun, he thought. But the light show over, Todoroki finally parted ways, which was real hard, as he became so attached to the group that Magni needed to use her quirk to pry him free from the Izuku when he was told they were leaving. No, please, just a few more minutes, just one more story to share. I don't want to leave, Todoroki cried. You have us in your contacts, Shoto. Now please, before your dad destroys the whole park in an attempt to find you, said Sachai. W will need again right? Todoroki asked, tears still streaming down his face. Of course, Toga smiled. All right then, Shoto said, as the two groups finally split off, goodbye. Bye. As Izuku and Toga got back to Inko, she immediately begun to ask questions again. Oh my, look at our lovebirds returning. How'd your date go? How was it? Did you go through the tunnel of love? Tell me everything. Inko exclaimed, hugging both of them. 
Oh ho, do we have a story for you, said Izuku, smiling with Toga. Meanwhile, as Endeavor and Shoto being driven home by their chauffeur, the hero started yelling at his son, hitting him with every possible insult he'd used before. However, this wasn't enough to kill his mood. Geez, what's gotten into him? Thought Endeavor. Back at Tom's, the shop owner soon received a message on his phone, one from the group chat he was a part of. There, he saw his favorite batch of customer. Only this time, they were with another familiar face. The photo was a selfie of them at Splash Mountain, taken the very moment they were about to get soaked. And at the very center, Todoroki was present, along with the caption picked up this stray kitten at the park. He hasn't meowed yet, we think it's bilingual. Seeing this, Tom smiled. Looks like you finally found friends, Hashoto. Laughed Tom, how cute he is, like the son I never had, or ever will have. Looking around, his shop was empty once again. Just me, all alone. He continued, his voice sounding more and more sad, so alone. W-A-A-A-H-H-H. He had to close shop for four days and paid 5 yen for water damage. 